Thank you all for coming. This is a fantastic, one of my favorite events for the entire year. Um, it's a special day on the calendar here at Penn because it brings together two organizations about which I care deeply. Uh, one is the, the Journal of Law and Innovation. This is our annual symposium. It is a very novel pro, uh, 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 organization we have here in the sense that it is not a traditional student-run journal. Uh, and for those of you who know how law faculties, how law schools typically work, it is taught as a class for the first semester, so they've been studying all the work of the esteemed authors here in the room and the topic, and we culminate that semester with this conference. And they will spend the rest of the spring semester editing in the terms of the full year experience. I think it's been an exceptional way for students to engage in depth in particular topics that vary across the year, over the years. But what the most, one of the most important things to me is that it has become a focal point for students to come together who are interested in these subject matters and uh, build a sense of community here of, of like-minded and shared interest students that has become, I think, one of the pillars of the Law and Technology Program. Um, we also, it's co-sponsored by the Center for Technology Innovation and Competition, which is the primary research center here, which does not just research, but also student programming and other levels of support. And it's been, uh, to me, a, a great confluence of how those different things come together. And so I think that this is a great time. Uh, Bill Kovacic was very nice enough to pay me a compliment about the program based on it. And I, I thank you for that because it's, um, it's, as you know, these things take their labors of love, if you will. I mean, and I'm deeply committed to it, but it's so nice to see when they all come together at an event like this. And I wanted to thank all the speakers, the authors, the commentators, and, and the moderators today because uh, we could not pick a more timely topic and we could not have picked a more um, distinguished group of people. Um, every, you've all organized conferences. You have people who you hope you can come. It's like, what's the chance of getting all of them? Um, I'm just so grateful and delighted that everything worked out so beautifully and that everyone basically that we asked was able to come. So we're extremely, um, uh, I think we were having set for a wonderful day. Uh, you have you've seen the papers and the, the presentations, and it's going to be a fantastic discussion. And I just wanted to be the first of all of us to welcome all of you here. Great. With that, I will turn over the podium to the editors in chief uh, of the Journal of Law Innovation, Mel Melanie and Shashank. Hello, all. Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to explore this topic a little bit deeper with you. I'd like to start by thanking our symposium chairs, Adam and Jasmine, for helping coordinate this. So thank you, Adam and Jasmine, and thank you all for attending. I think this is going to be an incredible experience. Um, we're delighted to have you join us here. Uh, this has been a work in progress for several months now, and this topic, as Professor Yu has mentioned, is something that has been on the minds of many students here at Penn Law. So we're absolutely excited to delve into the topic a bit more. Uh, as we embark on this sort of conversation together, uh, we encourage you to active, actively engage in these discussions, share your thoughts, and of course, forge connections with your fellow attendees. Um, I think the diverse perspectives in this room are invaluable, and we're excited to dive in. So we also wanted to extend our deepest gratitude to, of course, all the speakers and participants, as Professor Yu mentioned, the Center of Technology Innovation, the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition, TTIC, Professor Christopher Yu, uh, Caroline Miller, Caroline Olson, our, our sponsors, Paul Weiss and Axon, for making this event possible, and uh, thank you. This is going to be an incredible time, and we're excited to uh, start this journey with you today. I also want to briefly uh, to introduce, for a few uh, additional welcoming remarks, Giovanna Masaroto, who has been a fellow uh, here at CTIC uh, for the last uh, few years. I don't know, it's two and change. And uh, what I would say in, uh, has been the co organizer and the person who has joined me in conceiving this event. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, an immense pleasure and an honor to be with uh, so many leaders of the antitrust community. I look forward to what I believe uh, will be an insightful and thoughtful discussion. Uh, I believe that the insights that will be shared today will pave the way for a new way of thinking of antitrust in the digital economy. And I couldn't be more grateful and honored to be part of this event and part of this initiative. And uh, I really, yeah, look forward and uh, enjoy the conference, uh, uh, engage uh, in the discussion, and most importantly, have fun. So, thank you.
before we get going, uh, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first, just so everyone knows, the, uh, there is a remote audience uh, of at least 50 people, the last I checked, that will be here. So we will get questions from the floor, but be aware what you share is being heard by people aside from this, the people you can see in the room. Second is it, it, the proceedings are being recorded. Uh, and uh, all the speakers have you seen the release forms, and if you got, I don't know, if you got them all, if you haven't, um, our, our, our conference chairs will come get you. And it is our plan, we do post them online on the channel that we have online, so that will become available. Uh, third, for uh, those people who are receiving CLE, uh, uh, there will be a word stated at the beginning of every session, at the end of every session, uh, that will help uh, make sure that all that happens and that we'll be able to do that. And uh, we will get questions from online. Uh, lastly, if you need to use the restroom, if you go out the door here and turn right, and down the stairs, you'll see a pair of double doors in front of you through a breezeway, through another set of double doors, down another half flight of shared stairs, they're on the right-hand side. So basically, turn right and keep going down, you'll see them on the right-hand side. That being an important thing to know for everybody. All right? Okay. I'm told, though, uh, because of the CLE issues, I am absolutely forbidden from starting before 9.15 because there's an audience there. So I'm... Um, so um, we'll have to vamp a little bit, but before I get into the substantive presentation, one thing I, I should explain uh, that's probably made clear by the slide is that uh, Dan Crane is unable to be here today due to a family emergency. Uh, I was about to say that um, they often say that the moderator has the privilege of asking the first question. It's very rare for the moderator to hijack the entire presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that could be this, but it's not. And so we have, but, uh, Dan suggested and wanted feedback on his paper, and he invited someone else to present it. And because John had done such, a, uh, is going to give comments, um, I have agreed that I'll be presenting his paper as faithfully as possible uh, to what he wrote. And I will th throw up a slide at the end of my own comments to get a conversation going. Uh, you know, the standard disclaimer we always make with co-authored stuff is that you know none of the mistakes belong. You know all. Any all help, you know, you could say it doesn't belong. It's not, well, I guess if you're a co-author, you're supposed to say everything good here is mine, everything bad here is my co-authors. <laughs> In this case, we'll have a, after this, we'll have a conversation about the paper because, um, and I can definitely say any misrepresentations about the nature of the paper are definitely my responsibility. So, um, as the non-author, but um, I figured with a, a fantastic set of, uh, of, of uh, a draft that he has done to get a very important issue about market definition, which is fascinating. I thought uh, the conference would be better. For, uh, for having it in it with even a stand-in uh, uh, such as me, instead of Dan, as I wish we could have been. All right? We're at 9.15? I'm told we can go. All right. So, um, Carla, we all set? Okay. And you will get used to, those of you who aren't used to CLE, you'll get used to this. The first word uh, for CLE is technology. All right? So, um, <laughs> So I should say, hello, my name is Dan Crane, I'm from the University of Michigan, and we're here to talk about market definition. But now, actually, no, oh, one other thing. Uh, you should know that the microphones in this room are very sensitive. So first, you know, rustling the paper and all that, that happens, but more importantly for all of us, side conversations that you think are whispered between you and them, may, you and your partner, may not be. Uh, you're, all, you're forewarned, be, you know, behave accordingly. All right, so um, Dan wrote a fantastic paper really thinking about digital markets. And he is suggesting that, um, that, that, in fact, that there are three types of economic rivalry that is not adequately captured by the current appro conventional approaches to market definition. And he really uh, focused on three things, which we'll talk about. And they are, number one is, if you have a two-sided market, circumstances in which there's rivalry only on one side of the market, but not the other. The second is what he calls ecosystem uh, competition, which he's written about briefly and is an issue that you hear constantly and it's in the new merger guidelines. And the third is what he calls capacity competition. And here we don't mean manufacturing capacity, which we often talk about, but in, um, in and trust up a technological capacity, where people, the nature of rivalry is looking at technological rivalry. And, not to, and Dan, to his credit, doesn't just identify three forms of market definition that aren't uh, adequately taken into account. He suggests some, at a very initial preliminary level some, uh, some heuristics or ways we might think about taking them into account that follow directly from his analysis. And so we'll talk about these directly. 
Uh, the first one being single side competition and two sided markets. And so, what he he, um, he in his paper <coughs> starts the two sided analysis as we any good any any trust scholar would with Amex. And his conclusion is that um, at, coming out of Amex, the nature of market definition is not entirely clear. Is that he sees two certainly two two possibilities. One is that, in fact, you consider both sides of the market as a single market and take them into account at one time. The second possibility is that you look and you find each of them separately, as a, each side of the market is a separate antitrust market, but in fact, you place the, the burden on the plaintiff to show effects in both markets. That, in fact, that you're not, <coughs> not having anti competitive effects in both markets, it would excuse it in, account, in that way. It's another way of conceiving this to take into account the two-sidedness and what we often call the waterbed effect or the seesaw effect into account, that you'd have to look and see that there's harm on both sides, and this leaves open the possibility that it would be benefits on one side, the harms on the other side. And unlike the first approach where you net them out, here you actually require them to show harm on both sides once you find no elements. Now, that's ways how he saw the annexing construed. What he found interesting is in the, in the merger guidelines context particularly, but in, in the discourse generally, Enforcement officials are leveraging a Amex to be more than the sort of narrow approach and to be more about complex interactions between these complementary markets. And that he said that, in fact, that uh, the merger guidelines pick this up by, <coughs> in, by identifying three different types of ways of competition. <coughs> There's competition between platforms, which is very conventional in antitrust terms. He also sees two other versions, or the guidelines do, competition on a platform and a competition, if you will, for the market to displace a platform. And all these are forms of rivalry that the guidelines suggest we need to take to it. So what he does is <clears throat> he really was interested in an example that what happens when you have a two-sided market, but a rivalry only happens on one side. And in each of the cases of he, uh, the models he presents, he lays out a, a motivating example. And for him, the motivating example is the rivalry between Google and Facebook. Now, Google is a search engine company. Facebook is a social media company. In terms of the user-facing side, there's not really rivalry, although uh, it's not for lack of trying. As we all know, Google has done its, taken its run at the social networking market. We've all seen whatever Google Plus and Google this, and there's a number of failed attempts to do this. Uh, one of the things, just parenthetically, I've always been curious about is if you look at the equivalent companies in China, they seem much more successful at moving into each other's territory and doing a whole suite of services instead of just doing one. Uh, I've never fully understood why that environment, or those companies have been more successful at doing that than American companies have, uh, but that remains to be seen. And uh, Facebook is having its own trials and tribulations, but really they're saying that they don't really compete directly on the user-facing side. Where they do compete directly is for advertisers. And in fact, uh, they've been consistently the number one and the number two advertiser in the, in, on the online space. At this point, online has, uh, was about two years ago, eclipsed offline advertising as the primary venue, so it's become more and more important, and they're the two most important actors. And so what's interesting is you have a world in which you see the rivalry existing, some potentially exaggerating price discipline on the advertising side, because advertisers see them as alternatives, as substitutes, but the consumers don't necessarily do so. So what's interesting is um, one of the things you can do is you can look at the advertising side and treat this as a competitive market and try to uh, make that focus. We can also look at the platform side and see them as non-competitors. Those seem incomplete. And so what uh, Dan is arguing for is to really think of them both as rivals for ads and user retention and, in fact, understand that, um, that uh, there may be a difference in the importance of competition between the two sides. And, and he would invite us to start to think about uh, this way that the fact that, um, that, that in the, the nature of two-sided markets, though, though the, comp the nature of competition on one side of the market will have an effect on the other side of the market. But we all know often in a very unexpected ways, which is you know, things that increase the profitability on one side, interestingly, reduce the prices on the other side of the market, which is the deep link between them, which I think is very interesting and complicated. So this is, uh, he lays this out, and he's trying to think of, we need to think of Google and Facebook not just by looking at the user side, but thinking about this more generally. One of, speaking for myself, not for Dan, I actually think one of the flaws in many of the cases that we see brought by enforcement officials is they tend to focus almost entirely on the user-facing side. And there are the ad tech separate cases, which are out there and they're brewing, but we don't really see someone understanding the fact that there may be a relationship between the two. And that's single side competition for two-sided markets. Ecosystem. Um, it is an involvement, you know, and this is a very hot term you see in a lot of circles, is that 
In fact, you, these companies don't necessarily send substitutable goods or services, but they compete in other ways. And in fact, if you will, um, you think about it that they are uh, trying to make their own nodes the uh, key intermediary point for, a vert for an ecosystem. And, and you can think of this in a way, um, I always think of vertical chains of distribution. Everyone has a goal, which is you want to differentiate your, pro your, chain, your level of the chain to maximize your economic power, but then commoditize every other link in the chain so that they have, uh, they have no ability to exert any market power against you, and that's the blissful part of the world. Here, it's more a form of horizontal rivalry between differentiation and commoditization. The goal is that if you see uh, different aspects, uh, different, act, uh, different uh, ecosystems competing with each other, they would like to be the key differentiated platform, which is actually delivering higher value services to users. They would like to see everyone else sort of be commoditization and the like. And his definition of what an ecosystem is, and this is, I think, is important because I hear this term thrown around a lot without a lot of, without many definitions. He says it's a dynamic space that has multiple complementary products. And in fact, the complementary products means that uh, they have an interest in how each of the products do across the board, and there's an interaction among them. But dynamism means there's an opportunity for rivalry to shape it on the technological side, not just through pricing and through different actions. And the example he gives is an interesting one. He's talking about Apple and Amazon and the battle over ebooks. Now, it's kind of funny. Amazon, as we know, is the dominant ebook seller. And uh, they have this little Kindle business. They have a tablet business, but it's not very important. Apple is a major tablet manufacturer. They have an ebooks business, but it's not very important. And the point that he's making is, in fact, they really care about one market, but participate in the other on a complementary side. Kindle is sold as a lost leader. It's not actually making them money. And then the Apple side, they actually have a, a store that they've launched. And it's interesting. They're saying um, Amazon is actually participating in the, in the tablet market, not for any serious attempt to, to gain any advantages there, but is part of an ecosystem competition where they're really interested in their ebooks positioning. And they're taking advantage of the complementarity between the two to have an interest in the other market, but their primary uh, source of profits is going to come out of the ebooks market. Apple, exactly the flip side. They're, they're a device company. They've tried and dabbled in a bunch of other things, but largely the vast majority of their profits come from devices. They do ebooks on the sale as a complementary service, not because it's the primary way they're going to attack a market, but in a way to actually take into fact that they're related the two together and they're doing it on a vertically integrated basis and competing as an integrated ecosystem against Amazon on this basis, but emphasizing a different part of the market. The other example that he gave is, um, and, and by the way, the, the interesting thing here is uh, when the book publishers ex exercise concern, they deal more directly with Amazon as the ebook seller. And so you would think that the vast majority of their ire would be focused that way because of the complementarities uh, and because Apple's a small ebook seller, but they think it's beyond, and uh, his suggestion is beyond that, the uh, publishers were actually deeply concerned about them as well. And so uh, about Apple as well, even though that they're not actually a significant presence in the ebook world as of yet. The other example he gives is the classic Microsoft case, and in fact, it's the question of defensive leveraging for the operating system. The concern is could middleware essentially displace uh, uh, the operating system, and as we know, the browser was a complement to the operating system, but has the possibility with different forms of Java as displacing it. And in fact, what they saw is that we, in, the, in the Microsoft world, there is a shift in, in the moving off of that to other platforms you see a shift in value over time from operating systems to programs. And in fact, what we see in the online world, um, sorry, in the mobile world, is the example he gives, is we see a, a much more greater emphasis in the apps we're seeing and a much smaller emphasis in the operating system. And in fact, this is another example to him of ecosystems where you have complementary products which interact with each other, but different companies are having forms of rivalry that focus on different parts of the complementarity in ways that aren't immediately apparent in every case. The last thing is about technological capacity. Uh, there's a rivalry over sort of uncertain app, uh, future applications. So I mean, how is this different? The traditional way we think about this is in product markets. You tie to specific products, and we have an understanding of you know, how, that, uh, how those markets are going to play out. For him, technological rivalry is um, something that has a great deal of potential, but we don't actually know what products it's going to yield. And sort of to jump down to the example he gives, think about generative AI right now. It's very clear that this is doing things and it's going to do a lot of things, but that we cannot, uh, his, his claim would be, 
we don't really know exactly at the product market level basis what those things are going to be yet. We have high confidence it's going to be something. But in terms of breaking down an analysis right now, that's going to be pretty hard to do. And how is this form of rivalry exhibit itself? It's informed, you try to adopt, it's this uncertain, if you will, general purpose technology that's going to enable a lot of products. People can, there can be a form of rivalry which is trying to be technologically advanced your capabilities, your capacity in those different dimensions to make sure that whatever those products have to, happen to be, you're in a position to dominate. And in fact, um, the fact that it's not tied for an identical product, it's not in a market or for a market. This is for a capacity for markets that we expect to exist but don't, that do not yet exist and we can't yet anticipate exactly what they're going to be. And so um, he differentiates it from innovation markets and nascent competition and that in those, both of those things actually do require, under the current approaches to them, that they be tied to identifiable products. This is something much farther out on the horizon than that but can be a form of technological rivalry that's really important. And then, in fact, he does a, uh, an analysis in terms of actual uh, law, which is he looks at the statutes and says, is this a market? No, there's no products. And under um, the FTC, uh, under the other provisions that govern, is it in a line of commerce, which it technically isn't? And he thinks that, in fact, as a statutory matter, there's some stretching we have to do. Uh, obviously, Section 5 other things set out there and that kind of work. So those are the three forms of rivalry that uh, uh, Professor Crane that Dan suggests are not adequately taken into account. So what do we do about it? He actually suggests a series of toolkit, a toolkit of ideas that uh, can build on this. And in fact, you'll see on the toolkit, they all follow very naturally from the discussion. And in, I would think he, if he were here, these are very speculative, forward-looking, and, and he's not pretending that these are ready to be turned into doctrine, but he's just saying, here are some things that he finds interesting. So he wants to look at, uh, to capture each of these you, know, you try, look at competition and try to identify where you might need the tools is when you see a two-sided market when there only is competition on one side of the market. Also, you look for competition to define the value, to commoditize other nodes. Um, you know, and speaking for myself and my experience, you know, one of the most interesting ways that happens is through law. Is that, in fact, uh, the regulatory relief is often about commoditizing through interoperability requirements and the like is a, way, is a nice way to commoditize the other side. Also happening through regulation in the DMA in Europe and other places. Um, you try to look for the other, uh, so these are markers though, of when you might need a toolkit. Tool kit. One is an, one sided competition, the other is uh, trying to commoditize other nodes. Third is if you're offering complementary products offered both for success, uh, is something he thinks is a marker. Competition for labor or talent related to technical capacity. Um, overlapping technology for IP portfolios, especially if there's a lot of litigation. Um, identification of other firms as the greatest competitive threat. Uh, this is very interesting because you hear you know, people talk about uh, different uh, actors. One of the things is, I do know that Google and Facebook did regard themselves as competitors you know, because on the advertising side. What's fascinating, a lot of the discourse around Amazon, they regard their, their biggest competitor as Walmart. And in fact, uh, it's framing this up is a little bit differently. And then uh, rivalrous lobbying for advantage, they think is very interesting as ways to do this. You know, I do find myself uh, wondering, looking at this, you know, they, uh, many of these things are ambiguous, speaking for myself. You know, often complementary products seems to be something very well accommodated by existing law and existing things. Competition for labor and talent is, is you know, is being held up as a marker of potential anti-competitive effects. Uh, the reality is it can also have immense pro-competitive stuff, uh, benefits, and right now in the AI world, if you look, if you believe the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, apparently we are several multiples behind in producing data scientists. Uh, the supply is just not there to meet the demand and that we should see naturally some very big asymmetries here that's going to cause a lot of extreme rivalry and money and I know from talking to my friends at the enforcement agencies they all said we need, um, I was at a conference actually on Wednesday where we, I found out for the first time on the social media side the FTC is actually hiring psychologists, a team of psychologists for the first time which I think is fantastic. Uh, they've been saying for years they want to hire a data scientist. The reality is they can't afford them. I mean, and uh, one of the thing, labors of love I'm involved in, uh, uh, Gus Hurwitz is involved in, is the Public Interest Technology University Network, which is a belief where, that there is a cadre of technologists who are interested in public service. I think every economist who works for the agencies probably could be making more money doing something else. They're doing that because they care, and that's the way they want to plug in. And this is a, an ethic that we haven't really tapped into on the technology side that we really hope to. All right. So that's... <clears throat> My uh, presentation of Dan with my own editorial comments thrown in, this is my pure editorial comments. Okay, first. Um, what I find myself really fascinated by is this notion of a single-sided market, two-sided market with single-sided competition. 
And um, I start to feel my age when I think about this, is that I'm, I've seen this movie before. We call it broadcast television. And in fact, my, first, uh, very, my very first serious paper was about uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the media ownership rules back in the day when television and newspapers meant something. So I mean, um, but what's interesting is we saw antitrust cases back there. You know, we had two-sided markets in advertising where you see groups of program suppliers and, and uh, who want to, uh, are producing programs. We see advertisers, but primarily advertisers, who uh, class the two-sided market. They don't care about the size of the market. They care about how many viewers they can reach. The viewers uh, probably have negative things on the aspects so there isn't a classic two-sided market. We had antitrust cases. You know, we had, uh, we had uh, monopsony cases actually on the content production side, which is another multi-sidedness of this market. We had antitrust cases on the advertising side. We had you know, repeated inquiries here. And in fact, when we ha we, there was no rivalry for viewers because they were free. And so what strikes me is that I think that um, there's a great deal to learn from these old cases and to try to understand how they work. The other thing that comes straight from my work on telecom is there is a, a classic notion we call the terminating access monopoly, which uh, many people think that, um, that, uh, that there's a problem. It's say if you're in a remote area, say in the, middle, in the middle of a very rural area, there's only one provider, and they have an access monopoly. And what you discover about this is that <coughs> um, they, there's, if you make a, a classic telephone call using you know, old technologies, you have a local phone service used to connect to a long distance service. The long distance service carries you to the terminating local service, and whoever the calling, the receiving call gets that, their service to go down. And the concern was there's not enough rivalry on the back end. But what we learned over the years, that's entirely an artifact of the fact the, that the calling party pays for the entire call. That is, if I were to call you wherever you live, I would pay the, my direct payment would go to my local provider, and they make a side payment to the long distance provider, and they make a side distance, a side payment to the last provider. You don't worry about the first provider overcharging me. Why? I have, I chose that person, and I had options. So in fact, there's a price discipline there. And in fact, I chose the long distance provider, that's fine, although in the modern cell phone world, that's not, that's not vertically integrated into your first link. I cannot choose the back end. And in fact, what you saw people doing is uh, opportunistically, uh, for example, setting up services that in rural areas that received lots of calls, like conference calling, and never made calls, so they never had to pay anything, and made out a lot of money. The interesting thing in the cell phone world, that's not the same model. When I call you, I pay for my minutes to the local tower, I pay for the long distance, you pay for your terminating minutes. And so your choice, the, receipt, the terminating monopolist, the terminating person, there is a form of rivalry depending on which payment, they can be depending on how you structure the pricing. And so what you learn is the terminating access monopoly is deeply dependent on the business relationships that line up the vertical chain. And that there are ways you can arrange this to enhance rivalry on that end, but it does, in this case, involve end users actually paying for stuff, which they really don't like to do. And so we were talking about changes to the architecture. And I know that they're resisted by a lot of consumers, but there are actually some real potential economic benefits. Uh, the inconsistent competition to me strikes, uh, really focuses on complementarity. You know, I mentioned this before. Complementarity among goods and related markets is not new. On some level, all of our vertical literature, and I know we're very grateful to have Aviv here, and he's suggesting that we need to move beyond the vertical horizontal uh, discourse, and I, I understand that. We're going to have that conversation as we go. But complementarities, even if they're not vertically related markets, even though we're talking about comp basically often even complementaries on, on the demand side, can be really, really interesting. And the question I have is, are they really uh, possible to do? And the other thing I keep thinking about in terms of ecosystems and the Microsoft case is um, how hard it is to anticipate the complementarities and to speculate about what the future is. So if you think about what the Microsoft prediction was in terms of how this is going to play out, they thought that the rivalry was going to happen from what we would call Chrome, what they sell as Chromebooks, now what we call Netbooks which is your PC no longer has storage or very much computing power. It just has enough there to be what we call a thin client to run a browser and to have a network connection. And everything else is stored and done in the cloud. Um, I don't know how your world is. My wor that revolution has not come to my eyes. And so being able to predict these sorts of things and uh, future developments and ne negotiate around how different markets should intervene becomes very difficult. But the other thing that's interesting that is not in this discussion yet is um, when you talk about commoditization and creating platforms, when you commoditize a platform, there's a wonderful literature 
that it goes back to, I think, uh, Tim Bresnahan and Mark Trachtenberg's original work on, on general purpose technologies. Ge uh, general purpose technologies transfer value from the platform and the GPT to the complementers. And that it creates a very interesting set of dynamics. And actually, their core recommendation was, if you have a positive externality that's going to the complementers, we should allow them to vertically integrate into the complementary technology so they internalize more which is exactly the opposite of some of the discourse we're doing, but it opens up a question we need to think about. And to me, a real example of this is slightly different coming from the business school literature is the war between, um, I, uh, I'm talking about the 1980s war, when the PCs first came out, between uh, the IBM PC and the Apples. You know, we had the Apple II and all these other things going on up there. And because of the open APIs and the Microsoft interface, it became really easy and a, a commoditized platform. And IBM made out like crazy and became the dominant PC platform. Look to today, IBM no longer makes computers. Apple does. And if you read the business school literature, you say that, in fact, it's not about commoditizing and opening everything. It's about understanding where the long-term value proposition is in any chain and making sure you retain control over that and, in fact, commoditize the rest. And so it's about a selective commoditization. I always think about the fact that Tesla just consigned a bunch of patents to the public domain well, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. It's the patents related to the, the uh, what will become electric gas stations, the you know, places to refuel, because that's a complementary technology that need dispersed in a lot of different places, and they're actually making a bet of how to do this. And in fact, there's an optimal amount of revelation. Then lastly, um, uh, I would say is, one of the things that's looking here that um, they talk about is the differ he's differentiating his model from innovation markets and from uh, nascent, uh, nascent comp competitors by saying it's about markets that don't exist. If you go back to this, um, th one of the reasons that innovation, Gilbert and Sunshine put the restriction on about defining specific markets is that if you don't define it in terms of specific products, all R&D competes with each other. And then you end up having no uh, concentration effects, but also it's just not correct that it's all R&D competes with each other. That's just not possible. And so the discipline we need to define markets is there. If you move away from that, you lose that. But the bigger problem is if you're trying to get products People would say potential competition gets products that are imminent. These have to be products that they're not so imminent, that they're even farther out. But the farther out you get, the more uncertain it becomes, and the more non-evidence-based it becomes. And you'll end up having theories about harm, and then it's about positing plausible theories, which are, which are very easy to do. And then, but as opposed to finding likely theories, or things that are likely to lead to effects. And so I find the moves he's making by moving to uh, uncertainty, by moving away from the discipline of individual products, um, actually is going to make a very, very difficult analytical problems that may cause intervention where it may not otherwise be going. All right. That's my attempt to do justice to Dan Perry. So, yeah. uh, with that, um, I will uh, uh, relinquish the floor. We have been privileged to have John Baker, who is one of the world's experts on market definition, having literally wrote the book on market definition. Well, wrote a great book, I guess, a lot of it. And, I'll offer his views. I don't think there was a book about Mark. I wrote an article. You wrote an article. <laughs> I think probably the definitive article. Well, thank you. Thank you, Guy. And uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you uh, to the journal for inviting me. Um, I want to uh, you know, talk about Dan's paper, which is about competition issues involving online platforms. And it's stimulating and thoughtful, just as is everything Dan writes, including his novels. I know he, he's written, but they're available online. Um, and uh, uh, Dan, let me just get off the screen and leave it to you. Thank you. Um, so Dan says that in three settings he identifies, as we heard from her, that uh, conventional market definition doesn't capture important competitive dynamics uh, that antitrust law should care about. And basically, in my, I'm going to explain what I think in, about the first two settings differently than, than Dan does, and why I don't have any better idea than he does about what to do about the third, or Christopher even. So the first two settings are the, the ones that he called single-sided side competition and ecosystem competition. And, and I want to frame my discussion of them both by uh, asking a question. Assume Dan's right that uh, market definition doesn't capture important competitive dynamics. Why should we care? Um, market definition never captures all important competitive dynamics. It only captures the implications of one economic force, uh, buyer substitution, 
there are other relevant economic forces to competitive analysis, and they're, they're captured elsewhere when you do reasonableness analysis. Uh, uh, so just to give examples, supply substitution is captured in when you turn to think about entry, uh, uh, importantly there. Capacity constraints or the significance of vertical integration are captured in, you know, generally in evaluating rivalry. Um, uh, and I think Dan's paper goes down the road of supposing that all economic forces should be captured in market definition. Now, th there's nothing inherently wrong with that. You know, in theory, you could get to the right answer by doing the entire competitive effects analysis in market definition in the first step of, the, of what would now be the first step, but it's a bad idea. It, it, it can be confusing. There's no reason to expect the analysis to be improved. And why should you do the whole case in the market definition step? Um, and in addressing uh, competition issues in the settings that Dan highlights, single side competition and ecosystem competition, um, I don't think it's necessary or helpful to change how we think about markets. So let me start with the single side uh, uh, competition. So in Amex, the Supreme Court defi defined a two-sided market, uh, you know, when evaluating the competitive effects of conduct involving online platforms. Um, and I think uh, Amex's holding on market definition is more narrow than Dan implies. He, he points out that it's limited to platforms that match users on uh, both sides in a single simultaneous transaction, which is true. Um, but I think it's also reasonable to read the decision as limiting transaction platforms even further um, uh, to settings where network effects are so strong as to make it impossible for firms to, uh, other than transaction platforms, to compete on either side. So that, you, know, you don't have single-sided. Uh, if, you, you know, if you read it that way, then his problem disappears. Uh, the, the, the presence of single-sided uh, rivals would mean it would be necessary to define a single-sided market on at least one side of the platform and not, and not define a two-sided market. Now, if you don't read uh, Amex that way, the way I, the way I would, um, you get peculiar decisions like the uh, Sabre merger decision, which is, that was a, there was a district court there that said it was required by Amex to conclude as a matter of law that the acquiring firm, which, you know, which was a, uh, a transaction platform, did not compete with the firm it was, it was acquiring which competed only on one side of the, uh, of the market. It requires a matter of law to conclude that there was no, that, 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 uh, they couldn't put them in the same market because the acquired firm didn't offer services on both sides. And in doing that, the court had to disregard its own factual finding that the two firms viewed each other as competitors. Now, in Dan's example, he, has, he supposes that Google and Facebook compete in advertising, but not for users. Google wants uh, us Google users want to search the internet. Facebook users want to want social media interactions. And Dan says, well, that's not consistent with uh, uh, economic reality. Um, it's not consistent with economic reality to find separate markets on each side of those two platforms. Um, in other words, he rejects defining separate markets on the user side where the two firms don't compete. You know, uh, one market for search, one for social media, and he rejects defining a market for uh, advertising where they do compete. But I don't see the problem here with that, with doing any of that, those separate markets. To evaluate Dan's assertion, you have to know what the competitive concern would be, because markets don't exist in a vacuum. We're, we're defining them to, to evaluate uh, specific uh, anti-competitive allegations. So, so I need to come up with the story. So let's suppose that. We're concerned about hypothetical collusion between Google and Bing. Uh, 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 and I don't see a, a problem in defining a market for search to evaluate that you know, allegation. Dan's claim seems to be that when you define a market to evaluate a hypothetical Google-Bing collusion, we would need to think about the possibility that Google would not want to annoy its users uh, by making Google less attractive to advertisers. And I think that's what he means when he says Google and Facebook's direct rivalry over advertising constrains their behavior on the user side of the platform. Uh, and I agree that's an appropriate issue to think about when you evaluate hypothetical Google being collusion. 
But I don't think it's either necessary or helpful to consider it when you're defining markets. The court ought to think about it instead when evaluating whether Google and Bing have the incentive and ability to collude. Right, so, and I, I see a similar issue uh, in Dan's discussion of ecosystem competition. Um, and it ought to be obvious, and it's not a new observation, that a dominant firm, or, or really any firm, uh, doesn't want its suppliers or uh, distributors to exercise market power. And it doesn't want other comp firms selling complementary products who happen not to be suppliers or distributors to do that either. Um, that all of that, if, the, if those other firms, the suppliers, the distributors, the complementors, um, exercise market power, that would take away some of the rents that the dominant firm uh, uh, wants, and it would potentially reduce the overall producer's surplus that's shared by all the vertically related firms as a group. In other words, firms have strong incentives to create competition in markets for complementary products, you know, including through the way they innovate. And that was the idea behind the remedy it, that the Justice Department proposed in the uh, Microsoft case that Dan Rubenfeld worked on and that Dan Crane talks about in the, in the paper. The Justice Department wanted to uh, create more operating system competition by spinning off Microsoft Office, you know, that's like uh, Word and Excel, I think, and, uh, and other applications into a separate firm. The remedial proposal would have counted on the new apps company to find ways to boost competition at the, uh, but for, with Google at the, in the operating system market, to, to boost Google's operating system rivals. Um, and uh, uh, so, but nothing I've said um, detracts from the fundamental point that the exercise of market power is about reducing horizontal rivalry. Firms don't want horizontal rivalry for themselves. But they want it for the suppliers that they buy from and for the distributors they sell to and for the firms they don't transact with who that, uh, sell complements on demand. And we appeal to this idea you know, in antitrust uh, in other places where we talk about the possibility of sophisticated buyers or disruptive buyers preventing a seller, seller collusion you know, by maybe by uh, threatening to shift their purchases to a non-colluding rival or an entrant. Uh, now, the role of complements in helping create comp competition is particularly important when you don't have many good substitutes. And so it's not surprising when we're talking, when we're talking about this, uh, it's in markets where, uh, with dominant firms. You know, the, uh, uh, prob my guess is we'd, I'd rather have one good substitute than one good complementor if I wanted to foster competition in, in a market. Um, Dan's ecosystem perspective emphasizes that online platforms often have important complements. Now, uh, a quarter century ago, uh, oh, I get to reference Tim Bresnahan too for a different paper. Tim Bresnahan and Shane Greenstein pointed out uh, that some uh, information technology ecosystems have divided technical leadership. So at the time of the Microsoft case, you know, for example, there were lots of complements for Microsoft's uh, Windows operating system, like printers and disk drives, for example. Uh, but the most important was Intel's microprocessor. <clears throat> and many people talked about the Wintel standard for that reason. Uh, there was the, the, the divided technical leadership in that uh, ecosystem. So I agree with Dan that firms operating in what he calls digital ecosystems would want to limit the market power of other firms selling complementary products. But to see where we disagree, let's look at Dan's example about the ebook uh, market around the time of the government's price fixing case against Apple and the book publishers. Uh, uh, the book publishers wanted to undermine Amazon's dominance in ebook retailing. And Apple wanted to do the same thing because uh, its iPad could be used to read ebooks. Uh, Amazon uh, had, its, had the Kindle reader and it wanted to. Uh, promote its Kindle reader to prevent any other firms from getting market power in ebook readers. So we have this, you know, the, the, they're interested in getting competition at the other, among the sellers of compliments, all these firms. And I don't see why this divergence of interest among firms selling complementary products creates a challenge for market definition. Competition still requires horizontal rivalry. 
meaning rivalry between sellers of, uh, of substitutes. And that's what market definition is concerned with. And that's why it makes sense to define uh, separate markets for ebook retailing, ebook readers, and ebook publishing. And the, the ebooks case involved a, a hub and spoke uh, conspiracy orchestrated by Apple with the, with the book publishers to allow the publishers rather than Apple to sell, set retail prices. The court found that uh, the agreement harmed competition in ebook retailing because it reduced horizontal rivalry and led to higher ebook prices. It's reasonable to ask whether Apple and the book publishers were implementing their incentive to create more competition for Amazon uh, in ebook distribution. And if that's what was going on, it would mean ebook prices would fall. But the court found otherwise, at least in the short run. And Apple's argument that uh, ebook prices would be lower in the long run was considered when the court evaluated uh, the reasonableness of the conduct in an ebook retailing market. There was no need to define markets differently to get to the court to account for Apple and the publisher's incentives to uh, as sellers of compliments to promote ebook distribution. Now Dan might have in mind a different kind of case, uh, one where a dominant firm like Microsoft in the late 1990s takes steps to stop uh, the seller of a complementary product from fostering horizontal competition with a dominant firm. That would be an exclusionary conduct case and it can readily be addressed using the standard analytical tools at, of antitrust law as the Microsoft case itself uh, shows. So I agree with Dan that rivalry among firms selling compliments over how they share the rents that they create jointly can benefit competition. And it can benefit competition in conventionally defined markets um, that collect demand substitutes. And I don't think it's either necessary or useful to address the role of compliments when defining those markets. So let me turn, by the way, I lost track of time. Do I have a few minutes left? Okay. Uh, to the capacity competition uh, uh, part of uh, Dan's paper. Um, the market definition issue there is different from the first two settings. It's really about antitrust under radical uncertainty. Um, it's about whether it's possible to do anything sensible in analyzing the likely effects of firm conduct when we don't even know what the firm, who the firms are or, or, uh, or how or will you know, what, how they'll be competing. So let me frame up the topic by um, distinguishing three types of markets that might come up in innovative industries. We might have markets for the current products, the ones that the firms are currently uh, producing and selling. We might have markets for future products like next generation goods and services. And we might have markets for innovation, you know, where the firms are competing to innovate but the characteristics of the products that would result from their R&D investments are less certain. When we're thinking about current products, we usually know a lot about buyer substitution, and that's what we need to undertake market definition. When we're thinking about markets for future products, uh, we, we often know something about what the products will be and understand enough about market definition to define markets. But the farther the products are from introduction, uh, the more uncertainty we have and the, and the harder it becomes to define, to do market definition. When we're thinking about innovation markets, we may know even less about buyer substitution. The R&D might be directed toward a particular goal, like a new or better product or products that would be close substitutes. And even if the uh, R&D isn't directed toward that goal, it may be clear that the firm's R&D assets could be used, potentially at least, to reach that goal. You know, under those circumstances, market Definition might be difficult, but it isn't necessarily impossible. And you know, that's what the innovation markets uh, literature is about. That we understand, in, at least in a general way, what the innovation would do, and we might be able to think about identifying the demand substitutes and defining, and defining markets. And we could potentially think about identifying the market participants, which would be the firms with the capabilities to develop those substitutes. Now, in Dan's example in his paper about uh, firms working to develop uh, artificial intelligence driven atomically precise manufacturing systems. Um, Dan's supposing even more radical uncertainty. He's supposing we have little idea what the innovations uh, would or even could do, and little idea which firms would uh, attempt to develop them. Under those conditions, it's hard to be confident about anything we would say or, or could say about, about the effects of firm conduct on future horizontal rivalry in any market and whether those effects would be anti-competitive or pro-competitive. And with, with that kind of radical uncertainty, it's probably not possible to prove an antitrust case in court 
or even understand whether there's an antitrust problem. The issue here for, market, for antitrust isn't market definition per se. It's our radical uncertainty about the direction of scientific and engineering uh, progress. Once the emerging industry gets to the point where we can reasonably define innovation markets or future product markets, you know, antitrust can play a role in protecting competition. But it's hard to see what uh, role antitrust could play now in, 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 those, in those markets. So just to briefly conclude, um, with a, uh, I have a, one more comment about the first two settings. In thinking about them, you know, I found it helpful to, to focus on the specific antitrust cases, like the hypothetical Google Bing collusion or the eBooks case involving Apple. Um, and I don't think that conventional market definition led or would lead the courts astray for in, in any of those cases uh, in general. So I'm a, 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 a skeptical that we need to, uh, to change how we think about market definition in the kind of markets that We have time for about until 10 15 for questions and answers. Um, all the hard ones get to go to John. Dan. I see you twitching your hand. Yeah. So I, I was actually just going to tell a quick story uh, to see whether Aviv was awake. So. Uh, <laughs> I'll get there. The answer is no. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm following John's comments. I'm, I'm someone who believes that we have to be careful about, about the, claiming the necessity of doing market definition. And so my, my example is uh, now many, many years ago, I testified against the state of New York and when they attempted to block the act, uh, uh, merger between <coughs> two companies selling uh, ready to eat cereals. And uh, judge Kimba Wood is a very able judge. Decided that she was going to follow the, the, the then merger guidelines and, and do market definition, market power, competitive effects. <clears throat> and uh, the debate between myself and the opposing expert on market definition went so far with the questions from the court appointed expert and the judge that by the time that debate was, was won uh, by my side of the case, the case was over because we'd already evaluated everything down the road. We forgot John's point, which is we should limit market definition narrowly and focus on substitutes. Instead, the, the case is over. We had six weeks on market definition and very few time, very little time afterward. We got to the right result, but it was all very convoluted because there was a lack of clarity as to what the role was for market definition. I mentioned Aviv because Aviv became one of Aviv's well-known articles is all about the, about the serial uh, market generally and followed, I think, consistent with what I, was, what I said. Anyway, if you're awake, I'll leave you. Feel free to comment. So I actually have a question. <laughs> the one, but the, the thing that strikes me about this is um, if you look at the, one of the surprises in the 2010, the now defunct 2010 merger guidelines, it says if you've got direct evidence of effects, don't bother defining them. I mean, you don't have to. And we forget that the whole Structural is an inference because we didn't have direct evidence of effects. And when there are tools now, we get better and better. I totally agree with that. And that goes to John's point. So, Aviv, you're kind of jumping the queue, but without entree, I don't see why I can call on anyone but you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have a lot to say on market definition later, but we can talk about that. But um, so, going back to this third example, um, and I actually like the way you characterize it, John. Uh, so let's take a, a case where there's a lot of uncertainty, but a little bit less than that extreme. So suppose, you know, there is a you know, situation where we think there's going to be competition in, let's say, one of 10, or there's going to be 10 possible markets where they compete, right? So you can go and so let's take each of these apps and say, there's work and whether they'll actually materialize and be competition, we don't know. Uh, but suppose that there is a, we can assess, and you'll see in a second why I choose this number, there's a 7% probability uh, of um, actually having a substantial listing of competition in one of these 10 markets down the road. Um, the reason I choose 10, because then if you ask, well, what's the probability that we have a substantial, at least one of them, it ends up, you can do the math, if they're independent, it's 52%. Okay, so it gets you above, you know, more likely than not um, standard. Uh, how do you think about that as a way to evaluate? And again, here the market definition is there'll be 10 different markets. 
and you'll say there was going to, you know, we know that there's going to be harm in at least one of these 10 well-defined markets. We can't tell your honor which one of them, but we can tell you that more likely than not, they'll be in one of them. Uh, what's your thoughts of that? Would that, uh, I mean, to me as an economist, that makes sense, but kind of legally, is that something that uh, you could take off the ground or it's a non-starter? I don't know. I think it's a good question. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, I mean, like, I think it's a better question under the Clayton Act with the incipiency standard than under the Sherman Act. Uh, uh, you know, better chance of it flying. But I th and it's a hard question. I think I just don't, I don't know. And when I try to, it, it also shows up in remedies. You know, how would you fix this, you know? Um, this is huge. I mean, the problem with also these earlier technologies is um, it's not just you're creating hypos on the cost side. The benefit side are also really tough here because by definition, these are going to be pioneer technologies. They're going to create a lot of different things and create potentially collateral benefits in other markets. And so the flip side, this is uh, X percent chance of harm. But how about do we factor in the potential more greater positive well, consumer benefits, whether pro competitive or pro, you know, just new product oriented? Uh, we'd have to supposedly take those into account too, but the uncertainties attached to them. Suppose uh, what I said is a net. There's a seven percent after we net everything out. Also, the other part, you also want to know what the stakes are in the sense of are these going to be huge markets if they succeed? You know, it's. I think I think you know I'd be tempted to bring the case then uh, if I were in the government, but but it'd be hard. I don't know whether how whether it prevails. I do know that litigants, when they do these cases, theoretically, we're not supposed to take out of market effects, and so you could define things being out of market or in market. They desperately try to keep it within a single market. And so, as a matter of proof, they're extremely reluctant <laughs> to aggregate markets in this way. Um, I saw someone else. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, at the risk of agreeing, um, I this is regarding. John's comment, why do we care? Um, when I read John's paper, which I think is very interesting and wonderful that he brought up these issues, but I did wonder why he didn't cite Lewis Kaplow and why ever define markets. And maybe why ever define markets is too broad, but the message is, um, as, it, as you said, John, um, if you focus on what is the harm, things fall into place. Sometimes you don't have to define the market. And I think in all three of the situations that Dan gave, um, there is a way of thinking what is the harm, and defining the market is not a problem. For example, in the Microsoft case with um, middleware, it sort of doesn't matter if middleware is in the market because you look at where is the market power in the operating system. Is it going to be aggrandized? Yes. And so, obviously, Microsoft wanted to keep extending the market, but it kind of didn't matter. And so for the examples, even on radical uncertainty, I don't think it's out of the question for enforcement. You can imagine situations in which, for example, Microsoft and Google agree that they are going to define the parameters of the research on AI and boycott anybody who doesn't follow it. Um, you can get to say, yeah, it's per se, so we don't need to define the market, but that's not the point. Um, you can look at what the conduct is, even radical uncertainty. There's some things you don't want to happen. If Microsoft and Google's um, AI research again decide on a partnership, a serious question to consider, even though it's radical uncertainty. So I go back to why ever define the market. And I think, I mean, 2010 guidelines are backing into saying market definition is not, or may not be necessary, certainly not in unilateral. And the 2023 guidelines go fur much further in the direction of it's not market definition that's going to get you the answer to the case. So Harry? So I want to both agree and disagree with my esteemed colleagues oh. from New York <laughs> University. Just to put in a plug. <laughs> um, so um, 
First point is the irony of antitrust. As Eleanor points out, here's Lewis Kaplan writing forever and a bazillion articles about how it's the stupidest thing in the world uh, to define a market. And here we have the um, 2023 merger guidelines uh, for which market definition is going to be pretty critical still, and we're talking about it. So, plus the irony, um, Dan, I can't resist, Dan mentioned the cereals case, one of our favorite cases. Um, and um, I, I hesitate to say this, but it may have turned out differently if the current guidelines had been in force because the concentration that HHI mm -hmm. shown was out of range of the guidelines at that time. It was like moderate. Now it'd be like, oh my God, a firestorm. So Kimball Wood, good antitrust lawyer and judge that she was, I might have said, oh no, now we really have a problem and the burden is on uh, Kraft to show that this is a great merger, that we've got to have less competition in cereals. Okay, so um, uh, the irony of uh, market definition. Um, the second thing, Eleanor's point is, is it always so hard? And it, as I was listening to your exposition of Dan's paper and so forth, I kept asking the question I think we all ask as students. So why are we defining the markets? I mean, how does it help us analytically? So when the, the main publishers sit around in a private dining room at Pichelin Restaurant in New York City, figuring out how they're going to go along with Eddie Q from Apple and the, and the agreements, we ain't got much problem about thinking about an e-books market. Now, what Steve Jobs had in his mind, well, one of the things was to raise the price of e-books, but, um, you know, and what Jeff Bezos' ultimate idea was, this is interesting from a business point of view, from an economics point of view, but from an antitrust point of view, there's a good argument they should have all gone from Pichelin to jail. Um, so, uh, I'm about my clients, Harry, because uh, well, yes. that's why it's always I always love having my colleagues here. Uh, so sometimes, you know, this exercise, which is very expensive, um, and this this has been, I think, a big problem for antitrust. You know, oh, do we have any doubt that there's going to be found the search market in the future? Do we have any doubt but that a lot of money's been spent to prove it? So, um, and my third point, and this is for Dan. Hello, Dan, sorry you couldn't be here. Illumina Grail um, has to be in the paper because this is a case that actually sort of mid-litigation, the FTC switched its focus. It involves um, uh, Grail, which was looking for literally the holy grail of cancer testing, multiple cancer, early detection, you know, one draw and you could test for 50 cancers. It's a test that's not, that hasn't been approved by the FDA. The competitors are not yet really there. It's a market that's yet developing, maybe five, six, ten years, who knows, um, and acquired by uh, Illumina. And the commission shifted its view from when the case was tried to product market definition to innovation market. And the Fifth Circuit said, yes, you're right. These, these firms, and there were documents to show it, were in an innovation race, not over, you know, what technology should we, you know, pick. They were over this technology. And so, you know, you can find these things out. You can look for rivalry. Um, and, you know, obviously it depends on the question you're asking, but if it's a merger and what the firms are predicting for the future, we, can, we have to deal with because these are really the challenges for interest. So I think, Dan, I, I think you've got to conjure with this case, very strong opinion from the Fifth Circuit, and, um, you know, I think maybe this the paper comes out a little too cautious on this. Well, if I were, if I were to channel Dan, um, in some ways, the case you're talking about is a classic innovation markets case. And it's not what he's talking about. Because you have a defined product. And you know, the, the motherland, the only vital part of innovation markets now is in healthcare. And that's because of the FDA process on top of everything else. We have a pretty good, you know, we have a pretty good bead on where things are going. Uh, what he would say is more like what Aviz, the kind of standards that he's talking about, which is 
there's going to be a class of cases which can't be tied to products in the way that would allow the Fifth Circuit to analyze the way it did, but might still have a high enough probability of creating harm in some market as yet not pinned down. And if I were to try to do justice to Dan's work, he says, do we need tools for that situation? I would move outside a little bit. Uh, your comment about serials and the, the current guidelines, the one thing I have to say, this is a different set of guidelines than anything we said before. It does not, it's attempting to change law, not restate law. And so any, uh, I would say a judge looking at benchmarks in the guidelines would have to take a different approach to them because they're not, uh, there's not the same kind of synthetic quality there was in others, which is part of the purpose and is a perfect good use of the guidelines. It's just not, it's less appropriate as a benchmark for judicial decision making based on what is actually law. So a Eve's hypothetical had, we kind of knew that what the 10 markets were. Dan's setting, we know there are probably going to be 100 markets, but we have no idea what they are. You know, and Christopher's a little bit in between, but, but uh, there, there's different kinds of uncertainty here in the, and, uh, and uh, uh, different degrees of uh, you know, where, what we're going to can get our arms around. Even Eleanor's example of, um, uh, I suppose there are two firms who are really uh, the, the only two that are seriously working on artificial intelligence, and I think it might have been Microsoft and Google in your example, it doesn't matter who they are. And then they get together to have an agreement. You know, uh, Eleanor says, well, it's obvious this is going to be a problem. And what's obvious is there could be a problem, but, you know, I mean, in, principle, maybe there's something in that agreement about, you know, all it really does is uh, um, uh, help them uh, speed up getting to someplace good because they each have skills in one area that the other needs, you know, and, and, uh, and you, know, you really got to get into the details of it and you just can't assume it's, you know, necessarily on, uh, on balance bad, and, and you know, there may be a less restrictive alternative. There's a lot we would look at in, in that. It's certainly on its face something that needs to be investigated, but whether it's obviously a problem, I'm not sure. But, uh, so if you, I do find myself thinking, you're, it's a sure. Well, sure. Oh. I, I just said, it, I didn't say it oh, was okay. obviously illegal. I said it was obviously for serious concern. Okay, then we do agree. Okay. So just riffing off you know, where I mean, you're encouraging us to go and some of you just said John triggered, I think about risk management literature. The one that it ha the scenario we have the hardest time dealing with is extremely low probability catastrophic events. And uh, if you do the straight math, <laughs> you could actually see you know, these things and try to do the expected values. But what I find myself thinking is one, how do we accommodate that particularly because the collateral, potential collateral damage of restricting all these other things in that circumstance is also much larger. And so even if you net out all the numbers, I mean, it's, it could, the distributions of them, which is what John said earlier, matter a lot. But, but, but also, what also matters is your degree of risk aversion, your Absolutely. judgment about the relative importance of errors on both sides, you know, uh, the error cost balance has changed. How we think about uh, antitrust over time, you know, that, that kind of thing. I mean, too. just the mere fact that you said that we take the expectation and look at that, there's a statement in there about what our yeah. welfare function yeah, is. Absolutely. That, because that could be that you're, you're actually willing to say, you know, on average, I'm willing to take maybe slightly higher prices just to prevent against that catastrophe of, <clears throat> you know, I really don't have an essential product that, you know, I can't supply water to my citizens. That's the risk aversion point that said, it said, said yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, turning to insurance. All right, um, we have, is this, any other questions? Because I want to make sure we've been up there. Bill, you get the last one. Uh, uh, John was suggesting before the usefulness of looking at a specific example to develop the concept. Uh, uh, to me, the best uh, sector that uh, fits the last category is uh, defense and aerospace acquisition, where there's radical uncertainty often about the nature of the problem to be solved in the future. There's radical uncertainty about the range of technologies that would serve to address the problem. And in some respects, what the Department of Defense and the other national security agencies seem to focus on is preserving an array of companies that have good problem-solving abilities. 
and year by year, they give them funding to maintain capability in specific technologies. It might be what we call stealth, low observable technologies. It might be uh, small, uh, unpiloted aircraft that we call drones. Uh, it might be the use of cyber attacks to disable a rival's uh, infrastructure that's essential to deliver military services. Uh, uh, enormous uncertainties in all these respects, but what it seems the uh, purchaser has in mind is that there are firms that have demonstrated an ability to solve problems, and we want to keep them in a position to be able to address those problems over time. They seek to identify the competencies that are relevant to doing that, the technical competencies. They seek to identify a history of uh, ability to convert an idea into something that works and, and works effectively. Um, and in that instance, the, uh, the objective uh, uh, seems to be to preserve an environment in which uh, a, a, a certain number of centers of inventive activity are present, diversified, to try and address the problem in question. And it seems as though looking at those uh, examples of past transactions where this has been an enormously important consideration uh, is a way of thinking about how to give uh, some specific content to the, to the third category. And it happens to be one that's uh, enormously important. If you make the wrong judgments, uh, you, have a, you have a desperate problem of national security. Uh, but it seems uh, to me that that's a, a, a great arena in which to look at uh, category three. Uh, I don't disagree. I just have one comment on that, which is that when there's a lot of uncertainty, we might not feel comfortable we know enough to do something useful, to, to, to know what to do in antitrust policy. But we might know enough to, to uh, as a society, as a, you know, uh, to uh, uh, implement other types of regulatory policies. So, what I, for example, what I could imagine is a government agency evaluating in, you know, Dan's AI example, um, whether different types of R and D are likely to be productive in the long run, and uh, supporting. You know the most promising avenues for R and D financially. That's sort of the sort of thing that the National Science Foundation does uh, uh, routinely. Uh, I think, or the you know, various uh, other government agencies in, in giving out grants. It's not quite antitrust, but it's it's uh, you know thinking about competition in a, in a in a broader regulatory or industrial policy kind of way. Yeah, the the antitrust connection is that it, it is posed in in mergers, in mergers, yeah, uh, that's right, and in joint ventures. But I, I think you're exactly right that it raises the interesting question in this area and others is where, where are shrewd government investments, uh, prototyping, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, where is that a, uh, a valuable element of a broader competition policy that puts you in a position to have the choices that you want uh, for the future? My reaction was almost exactly the same. It's, it's, this is industrial policy. You, know, you see this, and I think about in terms of Substitute supply chain security right now for these you know, capabilities as opposed to technological capabilities. And you end up with something very similar, you know, which is, uh, but we're not doing it because of prices or consumer welfare. It's, it's a different conception. Of this is all quality. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's uh, yeah. an implication is that you'd want the people or the government decision makers to be doing this kind of competition policy assessment uh, using some of these tools make their judgments about how to invest. Well, and on that note, please join me in thanking Dan for a great paper and John for <laughs> but quick in terms of housekeeping, the end word for CLE in this session is antitrust. We will reconvene here at 1030. Promptly. Promptly. <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you all for uh, joining us again. Um, Delighted to come out off to a great start. And I say in a completely self-serving way, having done the person who spoke the last time. Uh, my my uh, world of housekeeping is the first CLE word for the second session is February. Uh, we have a paper on digital competition and, regulatory, and regulation across regulators, moderated by Eleanor Fox. I turn it over to Eleanor. Bobby, Bobby Joe is here. Where are you? Oh, wait. So, um, happy to welcome you all to this next session. Very happy to welcome you, Bobby. Um, Bobby is a professor of, um, in the business school.
at the University of Maryland. You've been doing great research on strategy and pricing. Very interesting speaking at your presentation on a very important subject of antitrust regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, what a great honor and a privilege to be presenting here. My name is Bobby Joe. I'm an applied game theorist working in a marketing department, presenting at a prestigious law conference. So this is great. Before I start my brief talk, uh, I'm going to uh, mention two points. Number one, uh, if you like some of the main takeaways of my talk, all credits should go to my co-author, Danny Sokol, who is just absolutely a great joy to work with. And uh, number two, uh, my talk is going to be slightly different from probably uh, some of the other presentations in today's conference. It's structured in two components. In the first component, I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the conceptual framework that we have been thinking about. And probably more importantly, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to share uh, some of my recent research on a specific case to illustrate why we are making uh, the arguments that we are making in, in this piece. Okay, without further ado, let me get started. <clears throat> the first part of the talk touches upon why do we regulate? What are some of the objectives? And I will also be talking a little bit about market's definition. <clears throat> and the central theme of our paper and our talk is that uh, there has been this historical shift in antitrust regulation. Specifically, since 110 years ago, right, uh, ex post enforcement has been uh, the primary uh, tool, the primary instrument. But since the introduction of European Union's uh, Digital Markets Act, DMA, I know we have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues from Europe, but uh, I just wanted to say that I probably cannot help but say a few nasty things about DMA throughout my talk. <laughs> uh, I'll get to that later. But DMA introduced uh, this ex-ante regulation, right, paradigm, and other jurisdictions, uh, like for example in China, are also in the process of moving towards ex-ante ex regulation from this post. And uh, the central point I wanted to make here today is that if we were to follow this route, there are potentially really negative consequences. Okay? So before we go all, all the way in and moving to the ex-ante regulation, there are a lot of context-dependent factors, especially in the online platform uh, ecosystem that we need to account for. Now, very briefly, given that most of our audience are uh, know more about law and the legal aspects better than I do. I'm just going to briefly uh, flash through some of the uh, building blocks. So in terms of regulation types, three types. We have purely governmental regulation. We have hybrid regulation, which is a collaboration between the government and private sectors. And lastly, we have purely private regulation. And when I mention uh, uh, purely private regulation, uh, you can think about uh, industry standard setting. You can even think about self-regulation in the online marketplaces and so on and so forth. Now, we feel that the current push uh, towards ex-ante antitrust regulation has been pretty hasty, lacking a proper economic, rigorous economic assessment. And on top of that, uh, there has been insufficient consideration of alternative institutional approaches better suited to specific problems. And uh, the, the consequence is that uh, there will be unintended consequences on privacy, AI policy, intellectual property, and sec sector regulation. Okay, before I move further, I wanted to remind uh, a lot of our audience why, what are the main objectives behind regulation. 
some of the uh, primary objectives behind regulation is to protect public interest, uh, including areas of consumer protection, environmental protection, public health, and so on and so forth. And this has a much broader range than the traditionally defined antitrust, which primarily focusing on consumer welfare. And this is to ensure fair competition and to create competitive markets. Another objective behind regulation is to ensure the stability and security of financial market, right? Financial system integrity, so that we can protect uh, investors. Thirdly, you might think about promotion of social and ethical goals, such as the efforts at promoting diversity and or inclusion. Now, when it comes to uh, the environmental protection, I want, I want you to think about, for example, uh, setting standards for emissions or uh, waste disposal. And when we're thinking about uh, financial stability, I want us to think about ensuring compliance and accountability, right? We establish a framework for compliance by creating the rules and expectations for individuals and organizations. And another aspect of behind regulation is we want to promote innovation and research. We want to encourage innovation and do not pose undue risks to the public. AI has been very hot recently. You see this word everywhere you go. And uh, in terms of AI regulation, we wanted to highlight that we need to balance the rewards of AI-based innovation with potential risks. And uh, the competition community across many dimensions, including accessing to data, storage, and cloud computing, intersection between AI and IP and competitive effects, licensing and pricing, and so on and so forth. And we also wanted to highlight the issue of attribution, right? You used OpenAI's product, right? How do you uh, give credit to uh, the initial data provider uh, whose data has been utilized to train the, train the model, right? And finally, uh, one of the main objectives behind regulation is to increase public confidence and trust. Without this, it's very hard to move forward. Okay, uh, Chris and John have talked extensively and very nicely about market definition. So I'm not gonna uh, repeat some of those excellent points that they have already made. I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, very specific points in the domain of online platforms, online uh, marketplaces. I wanted to highlight that it is actually very, very difficult to define markets in the digital context. Uh, some of those uh, shortcuts that have been taken uh, include, for example, using size to uh, measure, to, to reflect market power, right? especially uh, in, the, in the context of EU. We wanted to highlight that uh, it can be very dangerous to simply utilize size to capture a firm's market power. Okay? Uh, coming from China, I wanted to use this really nice example to illustrate why uh, size should not be used exclusively to measure market power. I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with Alibaba, who has been the most dominant online platform in China and adjacent markets for the last 15, 20 years. Right? However, some of you might not know that by December 2023, the market capitalization of Alibaba has been exceeded by another startup, another new entrant in China. And this firm is called PDD, Pinduoduo, right? Many of us might not be familiar with this, uh, with this firm. Essentially, this is a new online marketplace that penetrated market with extremely low priced consumer products. Okay, I'm using this example to showcase that if you believe Alibaba has tremendous right, unparalleled market power in the Chinese online e-commerce space, then that viewpoint is potentially wrong because there is still space for new entrants and potentially uh, for successful entrants to dethrone 
the market position of a giant such as Alibaba. Okay. I don't claim to know all the factors uh, behind the motivation, for example, of uh, you, uh, European Union's uh, Digital Market Act. Our, uh, our conjecture is that there might be political economy reasons, right? Europe's inclination, Europe has greater inclination towards regulation as compared to the United States. And uh, they, uh, they have uh, a Digital Service Act, GDPR, AI Act, right? And, uh, and, and some, of those, uh, some of those regulatory policies have been uh, pushed into the marketplace without really thoroughly analyzing the costs and the benefits. And he, previously, there has been uh, really nice economic I.O. theory papers on platforms and 80s, 90s. And one of those uh, alarming theoretical results is that whenever it comes to the platform, if network effects is prominent, then it's possible that markets might tip. And then we're going to end up in a really monopolized uh, platform situation. But, but if you look at what happened in the marketplace, and if you look at some of the recent empirical work, that actually turns out not to be true, right? And <coughs> I just mentioned the example of PDD uh, in, in China, okay? And uh, I wanted to mention uh, some of the other strategies the new entrant has been has been utilizing. Some of us might be familiar with another online com, uh, online e-commerce uh, platform called JD.com. Different from uh, eBay or Alibaba, JD owns all the fleet. Okay, JD owns all the trucks. JD pays the truck drivers to deliver the product and services to your door. Okay. By contrast, Alibaba and some of the other uh, online platforms utilize third-party services like UPS, FedEx, and so on and so forth, right? And why are we mentioning this? We are mentioning this because we want to highlight that there are still ways for platform uh, managers to uh, uh, provide differentiated services, okay? And given the nature of heterogeneous consumer preferences, those uh, heterogeneous, those horizontally uh, differentiated services actually do add values. Okay. Why is it important to know more about the specifics in the online space? Different from the offline setting. In the online setting, multi-homing, and this goes back to the point, earlier point I wanted to make, I wanted to highlight. It's very, very, very challenging to define markets in a digital context. Let me do a very quick survey, since I'm from the marketing department, right? The marketing research is on essence. How many of you have subscribed to multiple streaming services? Can you raise your hands? Great, terrific, right? So multi-homing is so prominent, okay? Multi-homing is so prominent. So some of those traditional uh, wisdom and knowledge in terms of the antitrust regulation might not be readily applicable, okay? Because the firm's ability, right, and the online content distributor's ability to exercise its market power is limited, okay, given that consumers are more likely to, uh, to multi-home. And if you think about the, the examples, uh, smartphone, uh, Android and iOS, right, uh, Uber and Lyft, all of those examples, we see consumers multi-homing in addition to the video streaming markets. And I also talked about uh, product slash service differentiation. JD owns all of its fleet, right? JD controls the door-to-door -door delivery services as compared to Alibaba. Okay, here, uh, I also wanted to highlight the importance of heterogeneous consumer preferences. 
the more heterogeneous consumers' preferences in the focal product categories uh, they are, the more important it is to incorporate that when we are trying to determine a platform's market power. Okay. And the more problematic it is to simply utilize market size as a proxy for market power. Okay, now let me move to a specific example I think a lot of us can relate to. Uh, let's say Aviv uh, <clears throat> opens up his Amazon app on his phone and he types in, so he doesn't use the Amazon app, okay. Uh, let's say Nick opens up his Amazon app on his iPhone, he types in scissors. And this is the first entry Nick sees, okay. I just wanted to highlight that this is a, an Amazon basics product. So think about this as a uh, first party product, right? So Amazon is both a platform as well as a first party seller. So Amazon has preferentially placed its own product in the most prominent space <coughs> on your smartphone. And we all know that, I know the sizes of the smartphone have been growing, but it's still relatively small. If this entry occupies half of the screen real estate, okay, it's very likely for for Nick to start searching from the first entry, right? Now, if Nick has a larger iPhone, let's say 14 or 15 Pro Max, he might be able to see some of the other entries, okay? Specifically, I want you to uh, uh, take a look at the, the top entry, which is by a firm called iBuyM, okay? Which is lower priced Brands, which is lower priced than Amazon's first party products. Quality wise, both of them enjoy 4.8 stars out of 5. And the third party product has over 70 uh, reviews, 70,000 reviews, while the Amazon first party uh, scissors has uh, less than 50 uh, ratings, right? Consumer reviews. Now, Empirically, a bunch of economists from Harvard and BU have identified that Amazon's first party products are ranked three to four positions higher compared to observably similar competing third party products. Okay? On top of that, a pretty recent survey shows that only 17% of Amazon users explicitly realize Amazon's self preference in its search rankings, okay? I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, really hone in on this example. Why? Because Europeans are freaking out, right? They're saying, oh, this cannot happen. Okay, Self-preferencing is bad, uncategorically. As a result, in the DMA Act, I've highlighted this entry. Treat services and products offered by the gatekeeper. Oh, by the way, so so the entry reads as gatekeeper platforms may no longer treat services and products offered by the gatekeeper itself, first party product, more favorably in ranking than similar services or products offered by third parties on the gatekeeper's platform, right? So DMA has explicitly banned this. Amazon, you cannot rank your products ahead of your competitors' products. Okay, self preferencing is bad. And similarly in ICOA, we have something uh, similar here in, in the States. Right? I'm, I'm going to quote one of your favorite senators, John Kennedy from Louisiana. The American Innovation and Choice Online Act would help offer consumers more options at competitive prices from business online. I'll show you that this guy can be really, really wrong. Why is that? If you think about this example that I just showed you all, there are two really unique features that we need to incorporate and model before we move on to any uh, type of platform specific regulation. The first unique aspect is that whenever Nick and Adam types in Caesars in the search box, the two consumers might see very different search ranking outcomes. 
Okay. In other words, search rankings are completely personalized based on individual consumers' data. Now, by contrast, if Harry and Bill and I were to walk into the same Whole Foods, right, then in the most prominent aisle, in the most prominent shelf space, all of us are going to see the same products there. That's not necessarily the case uh, in the online setting. Secondly, a unique feature in this aspect, in this domain, is that consumers see the price first before they click in the link to search the products in, in depth, right? Now, it turns out that once you incorporate both of those features into an analytical piece, what you are going to find out is that enforcing search neutrality, which means that banning Amazon from engaging self-preferential treatment is sometimes hurting consumers. Why? Very simple intuition. If I'm Amazon, I write my products first, and Nick is a competing third-party seller placed in the second place. What will Nick do? He's going to slash prices to invite him to invite consumers to search more. Okay? And this potentially increases consumer welfare. If we were to adopt DMA, right, and completely ban self-preferencing, what happens is that I'm going to place my product most prominently to consumers who are liking my products more. And Nick knows that his product is placed more prominently to consumers who are likely to like his products more. What's going to happen? Strategically, both him and I, we're going to jack up our prices to, ex to, exploit, to extract more surplus from the consumers, right? So given that uh, I'm running out of time, let me just conclude with one main takeaway, right? So the main takeaway is that the digital markets are extremely, extremely important. And last year, the projected online revenue uh, reached over uh, $53 trillion, okay? $53 trillion. And this represents more than half of the global nominal GDP. And the key to regulate uh, is to distinguish between the digital and the traditional markets. What we wanted to argue is that before we regulate the digital market, we really need to incorporate some of those context-specific factors. Okay? We need to conduct rigorous, detailed economic analysis in the uh, uh, before we implement uh, any type of regulation. Specifically, one more time, I'm repeating myself, uh, we caution against this approach of blindly moving from ex post enforcement to ex anti regulation. Okay. Thank you. I will stop here. Thank you very much, Bobby. That was really interesting. And I'm going to welcome Marina Lau now. Um, Marina, Professor Marina Lau from Seton Hall, as you all know, is a very prominent scholar across the field in competition law and has had much experience in government as well, including recently was a director of the Office of uh, Policy. Policy Planning at the FTC Center of Welcome Media Response. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to first uh, thank the uh, journal editors for organizing this symposium, and to Christopher for inviting me, Professor Yu for inviting me. I very much enjoyed uh, reading uh, Bobby and uh, uh, Danny Sokol's paper on antitrust uh, regulation. Um, I am not, uh, I, I I am commenting a few things uh, regarding Bobby's paper. I did not focus so much on the self preference part. Um, so Bobby is correct. Historically, antitrust policy uh, has, in the U.S., is enforcement-based. And until recently, most discussions of competition policy has focused on antitrust enforcement, on how uh, ex post enforcement could be improved to better protect and foster uh, competition. And in particular, how to guard against antitrust, uh, anti competitive um, exclusionary conduct by dominant firms and potentially anti competitive mergers. In fact, uh, colleagues in this room have written quite a bit on these very issues. Uh, John is sitting right there. John Baker has written an excellent book on, uh, on this. Uh, however, in the last uh, dozen years or so, last half dozen years or so, um, 
as digital markets have become increasingly important in our economy, and as the largest online platforms impact so much of our lives, that conversation has expanded to include the question of whether early intervention uh, through regulation uh, would be helpful. And as Bobby pointed out, and as we all know, the EU has already acted uh, with the adoption of the DMA. Uh, given the complexity of analyzing digital platforms, the dynamic nature of these markets, and the speed at which they evolve, the question of whether antitrust enforcers should intervene earlier is a very logical one. Uh, the attention to uh, digital platforms is probably fueled by, also fueled by scholarship, suggesting that antitrust enforcement alone uh, may not be up to the task of policing uh, digital platforms whose dominance in their respective core areas is staggering and their ecosystems keep expanding. So, uh, as I understand it, uh, Danny and, and Bo's paper, Bobby's paper, does not uh, take the position that regulation of digital platforms uh, is not needed, but it warns against making decisions to regulate without doing more systematic studies and careful cost-benefit analysis. Uh, to be sure that regulation uh, will not end up imposing costs that outweigh its benefits. And the paper wants policymakers to think about the questions, why regulate in the first place? Why regulate? Why regulate in the digital space? Uh, is dominance in digital markets so different from dominance in non-digital markets that uh, would warrant uh, regulation uh, alone. I'm trying to get away the background behind you. I'm interrupting. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, so, uh, is the, are the differences, are the two types of markets so different uh, that would warrant a regulation of online uh, digital markets alone? Uh, the paper also asks, uh, what are the competitive harms that antitrust regulation of digital platforms is expected to address? And I think it suggests, or maybe even concludes, that uh, there isn't yet sufficient evidence of uh, harms to justify antitrust regulation. I agree basically uh, with uh, the understanding, uh, with, with the paper, that understanding when and how to regulate is important. If you re uh, regulate wisely, you can promote competition and improve welfare. If we regulate poorly, uh, then the cost imposed, whether it be efficiency, innovation, uh, or other losses, may leave society worse off. But I have a question, and maybe uh, I differ from uh, Bobby and Danny in this regard, and that's how much certainty must we have before taking any action? I don't think we can ever have exhaustive studies uh, that can assure us of the ultimate impact of any regulation. We can never know 100% what the impact of the rule requiring gatekeepers to provide interoperability or data portability uh, would be. Uh, but in action, uh, waiting for definitive studies also carries a cost, and the cost can be substantial. So ultimately, I think it may come down to a policy or value choice. Is it better to take a risk of a small reduction in efficiency, in efficiency benefits in return for a greater opportunity for others to compete? Or is it better to wait, possibly indefinitely, for de definitive studies that will show that the benefits of regulation outweigh the costs? Right? I think that's a personal choice. I personally would prefer to err in favor of incurring the risk of slight loss from regulation in return for allowing fringe rivals or potential rivals or nascent rivals to a greater chance to compete. But perhaps 10 years ago, I would not have said that about the platforms. 10 years ago, they were still perhaps uh, kind of not exactly scrappy upstarts, but they're not in the position that they are in now. Now, on uh, Bobby and Danny's discussion of why specifically regulate digital platforms uh, markets, and the suggestion that digital platform markets are not that different from other markets that would justify a different treatment for them, um, I would say this. It's true, as the paper says, and as Bobby pointed out, uh, that antitrust focuses 
uh, not on size, uh, but on market power. But we also cannot ignore the role of the platforms in information dissemination, in advertising, in social discourse, and e-commerce. And that raises fears that a handful of large platforms will have control over communication and retail e-commerce. And that can have political and social effects in addition to economic effects. Now, perhaps because I'm not an economist, I can't help but also think about some of these effects uh, as well. Uh, although I do understand and I do agree that antitrust is not the primary source for trying to deal with uh, these effects. But aggravating uh, the concerns is the fear that antitrust enforcement alone may not be up to the task of protecting and promoting competition in these markets for a number of reasons. Uh, quite a lot has been written, uh, in fact, by some people right in this room, on the economic characteristics of digital platforms that make the exclusionary conduct particularly uh, hard to reach under Section 2 enforcement. And John Baker, you're getting a lot of uh, call, uh, recommendations of your book, right? Your fantastic book, The Antitrust Paradigm, uh, ex among other works, explains network effects, uh, scale economies, uh, the role of data, and so forth, and how these characteristics tend to tip uh, platform markets to a winner-take-all. And these characteristics also act as barriers to entry, uh, which make the dominant platform's power more durable. Now, it's, tr it's true, it's absolutely correct, as Bobby points out, that not all platform markets tip, and a dominant platform does not necessarily emerge from these uh, all platform markets. We can just see it from our daily observations, right? In the ride share platform markets, for example, uh, Lyft is obviously a viable ride share uh, platform, uh, though Uber is more important, uh, more dominant, I should say. Uh, the ability and the willingness of both riders to, and drivers to multiple makes that possible. And probably the same is true of video, video streaming. Uh, multiple platforms can also coexist uh, because of product differentiation, and that may explain uh, the uh, coexistence of Alibaba and uh, the other uh, company that I can't remember, PDD, I think. Uh, and in some markets, network effects may be smaller, which allows the market to support more than one platform. And so it's true that not all platform markets are winner take all. But the paper doesn't dispute the core theory that digital mark platform markets do tend to tip based on network effects, uh, scale economies of supply, uh, high switching costs, uh, control over data, high volumes of data, and so forth. So that being the case, uh, I wonder if the paper could engage a little bit more with the arguments that are often made that are based on that core theory. So if network <coughs> effects and so forth often do allow an early entry to quickly lock up the market, then might that warrant regulation of digital platforms as a supplement to enforcement? If ex post enforcement cannot do the job, uh, would that justify dealing differently with major online platforms acquiring nascent competitors as has been done in the new merge guidelines? I, I tend to think of the merge guidelines as semi-regulatory. And if uh, competition in online platform markets is difficult, if multi-homing is not allowed, or if there's no interoperability, might that justify appropriate regulation to solve these problems? Now, the thing is, Section 2 is not a no-fault statute. Enforcement requires proof of monopoly power and exclusionary conduct with anti-competitive effects on consumers, suppliers, or workers. And though some of that conduct, in theory, can be reached by antitrust law, in practice, uh, proving liability is extremely difficult and in this audience, I don't think I have to go into any detail as to why it is so important. It's so, so difficult. Proving liability is so difficult. You've got to demonstrate market power, and which usually requires defining the market. And we know how difficult that is, uh, in digital, especially for digital platform markets. Uh, we have to demonstrate that conduct harms competition. And that has become very difficult because of narrow uh, interpretations of various doctrines. And then, of course, there's the infamous Amex case, which has created even more hurdles. Market definition now probably encompasses both sides of the platform, 
proving effect also requires considering the effects on both sides. And when the target of the exclusionary conduct is a nascent entry, there's the added difficulty of having to show anti-competitive harm when the excluded nascent firm doesn't have a track record of what it can do. So these are some of the points uh, that are often made to explain uh, to why antitrust law enforcement is not sufficient to address competition problems in online digital markets. So I wonder if it might be useful for the paper to engage with a few of these arguments in addition to saying that the theory does not necessarily apply in all cases. So in the latter part of the paper, um, Danny and Bobby questioned the bad effects that antitrust uh, regulation of online platforms is supposed to prevent and suggest that they don't hold up uh, for various reasons. So one theory of harm the paper identifies is the ecosystem theory of harm, uh, which the paper describes as the entire ecosystem not providing sufficient economic value or innovation to end users. Uh, the paper then counters that ecosystems can generate uh, cross-market efficiencies and create value and therefore breaking up or disrupting uh, the ecosystem could mean a loss of that value and a loss of economies. And it particularly cites Alibaba and the impact of regulation on Alibaba in support. So as Bobby explained in great detail, Alibaba is not just China's giant e-commerce platform, but it's also a huge ecosystem. And the paper notes that uh, venture capital investment in China's tech companies uh, has gone down since the uh, country implemented its antitrust uh, its, uh, regulation, antitrust regulation against Alibaba. And the suggestion of the paper is that uh, regulation of uh, the ecosystem deprived Alibaba of value created which chilled uh, venture capital investment. Now, I, I, I think a bit more uh, may be needed on this point. Uh, did that regulation contribute to the robustness of the competition that Alibaba recently faced from the two other uh, competitors that you mentioned? Uh, if so, then it did make a contribution. And even if it did not, and the drop in investment in tech firms was uh, general overall, I can think of many other factors that may have contributed to it, uh, such as China's rather arbitrary and draconian reaction to COVID, um, the, uh, its lack of transparency uh, on a lot of things, uh, the seeming lack of process in some things, and uh, I don't even know if I should mention this, but the disappearance of various high-level ministers without explanation in the last couple of years, none of which probably inspires uh, investor confidence. So I think it might be more persuasive if uh, there were just a little bit more to show maybe causality or whether uh, the uh, regulation maybe helped the competitors of Alibaba. Uh, my second point is a little bit broader. I think the concerns of many people about major digital platforms and ecosystems are not limited to whether the entire ecosystem generated sufficient value to end users. The concern is that uh, dominant digital platforms, the uh, dominant digital platforms' goal seems to be to capture the ecosystem through buying up startups, buying up nascent platform competitors, sellers of complementary services, or sellers of vertically related services. Now, when that happens, then more and more businesses will need to interact with a small number of digital type giants in order to compete. And these large uh, ecosystems would then be in a position to exploit uh, their advantage to stifle innovation and entrench their positions. But even aside from these competition-related harms, having a small number of digital platforms, uh, each controlling a huge ecosystem, may be undesirable from a political and social perspective. And Harry has written a bit about uh, the democratic objectives of antitrust law and so forth. Do we want a few humongous firms to have control over an ever-widening swath of our rights, including commerce and uh, communication? So I'm not suggesting that antitrust regulation should be used as a primary tool to address standalone non-competition problems. But perhaps in close cases, 
where we are less certain of the net effect, perhaps the value of not having <coughs> two large digital platforms controlling extensive ecosystems that touch on many aspects of our lives uh, should be considered an added benefit that cuts in favor of uh, regulation. So I know I'm sort of running out of time. Um, I'll just mention one last thing. Uh, a secondary theme in the paper is that many concerns about digital platforms are not competition related concerns and should be addressed elsewhere. Uh, one example the paper raises is the role of social media in disseminating uh, fake news, if you will, in the elections. I agree, this is a huge problem for the country and for our democracy that has to be gotten uh, under control. But I also totally agree with Bobby that uh, this is not an antitrust problem that breaking up uh, Facebook will somehow solve, uh, nor is introducing competition the answer to that problem. I don't think social media companies compete with users by promising to disseminate accurate news. So I'm uh, just going to uh, uh, end here uh, to say that I enjoy the paper. I agree with the important point that the government should be careful in regulating uh, so as uh, not to harm innovation. And this is particularly important when a truly new innovation emerges that few people uh, truly understand or fully understand, such as uh, AI which could potentially transform industries uh, and jobs across the economy. And poor regulation might not allow the new technology to develop to its full potential. But at the same time, uh, not doing anything, or at least not considering the possibility of not allowing a few major firms to control the bottleneck or whatever, uh, could be a problem. So thank you very much, Bobby, for the opportunity to review your paper. We'd like to have you have a little bit of chance for comments, perhaps rebuttal before 11.30. So let's figure, if you like, uh, so let's figure towards the end. We won't call on you again, if you like. Um, and meanwhile, let me just make a quick comment and then see who would like to make remarks from, from all of you. Okay, so I do have four comments. Um, the first is on what is regulation I thought it would be useful, because you break it down into private, public, private, and public. Uh, I thought it would be useful also for you and Danny um, to break it down otherwise. Uh, for example, thin and thick. Uh, for example, um, those jurisdictions who have a list of do not do's for the big tech firms, and those jurisdictions like EU and UK, uh, which would have a whole system of surveillance, so um, like sector regulation uh, has very different consequences. Um, secondly, I thought, I think when you're doing your final paper, it, and you're probably gonna do this, to recognize all of the research that has been done on the cost-benefit analysis, um, the, the research that usually addresses some of the points Marina made, about particular behaviors. Um, this is especially you know, the big tech gatekeepers, particular behaviors um, that seem um, very abundant and hard to catch under the antitrust laws and the costs and benefits of having uh, more standards and telling them what they cannot do and maybe what they should do. Um, thirdly, um, <coughs> I thought that even on the antitrust side alone, and Marina brought in, and you did too, possibility that there could be regulation that's more than antitrust. On the antitrust side alone, I thought it would be useful if you and Danny face the best case for regulation um, and then tear it down. I think it's always useful for scholars to do that uh, because there have been kind of volumes put together on the best case, which includes not centrally your point about how some subtle self-preferencing um, should take place because it's pro-competitive, um, but also the point 
of abusive conduct that is widely um, discovered by certain of the firms who we call gatekeepers that are preventing interoperability and data portability. So, so taking you know, the, the case that's most clear for antitrust. Then the last point is what's not antitrust. As a matter of fact, the DMA is not antitrust. It doesn't, this is EU regulation now. It purports to be not antitrust, but akin to antitrust. And its observation is, um, that we may or may not agree, but its observation is that there are behaviors of the dominant gatekeepers that are abusive, um, but they may not meet the standards for competition law. And here, if you put it in a US context, because this does meet EU standards for competition law, the Google shopping case, where Google so far demoted the um, offerings in shopping comparison that were clearly much better than it and put people out of business um, might not be an antitrust case in the United States because separate preferencing is a, a hard case to make in the United States because of our strong right to deal or refuse to deal. Uh, so that would, it could fall into a line of, it's akin to antitrust, it's terribly unfair. I say, I shouldn't editorialize, as some people say, unfair. Um, and EU is taking on this possibility, it's sort of akin to abuse of superior bargaining position, abuse of dependency. Uh, so, so this is a question that Marina raised, which I think it would be very useful for you to focus on, on the, the heading of is, is antitrust enough? What are the weaknesses of antitrust? And this would be both what we've discovered to be the unusual length of these cases, uh, maybe not just discovered, we know, uh, cases take eight to 10 years and the conduct's over with then. Um, so the long length of the cases plus the difficulty of litigating and relitigating questions like does Google have monopoly power, does Google have dominance power, uh, which gets relitigated again in the cases which regulation could avoid. Um, so those are my thoughts for what you might do as you go into the next phase and who would like to join the conversation. Well, so I, I think you hit on a theme that I wanted to invite Bo to, to, um, to elaborate on. It sounded like toward the end of your talk, um, well, you said that, that in, in reference to the self-preferencing, you know, anti-self-preferencing laws like the DMA, that the combination of neutrality, enforced neutrality plus personalization systems could wind up with consumer harm. And so you had the, you know, you were building out the specific case with the Amazon scissors, um, but maybe taking the same, or asking the same question of Google's, um, uh, Google's shopping results. I, I guess I need to understand a little bit more about the intuition or the how that would work why the combination of neutrality plus personalization leads to uh, worse consumer outcome uh, i think this is a fantastic question uh, before i answer this question head on uh, i also wanted to mention another case which a lot of our audience are very familiar with which is the dropbox uh, lawsuit against apple right a few years back when you type in dropbox in your ios uh, store the first entry, right, the first search outcome would be Apple's Files app, right? And then Dropbox was very upset. Dropbox was saying that, look, if consumers knowingly are searching for us, why does Apple, you know, put your own first party app, potentially a competitor's app uh, ahead of us, right, in a more prominent position? So the intuition is that by enforcing neutrality, uh, the platforms have to put what's the most relevant product in the most prominent position for every individual consumer, right? And here, relevance itself implies a stronger preference. So if, you know, uh, if the third party product is displayed prominent in the most prominent position to, to Nick, then 
the third party seller knows that I'm going to be able to extract more surplus from this consumer because now the, the algorithm is such that I'm you know, in the front line, right? I'm displayed in the front line. And that's the reason why the price competition might be attenuated. That's sort of the key intuition, why eventually consumers might be worse off. Now, one thing we didn't really talk about is, uh, should we also care about the small seller's welfare on big platforms, on top of consumer's welfare, right? If so, then maybe we should incorporate some weighted uh, function, the objective function, right? That accounts for both consumer surplus as well as especially smaller third party sellers profitability and evaluate this thing holistically. Thank you. Other, other thing you want to say? So um, I love the topic about trying to understand you know, the regulatory movement. And I love it so much that Giovanna and I are editing a book on this. <laughs> um, you know, being, uh, originally coming out from the regulatory side, one of my personal frustrations is we understand that we're going into a different world and the entire European discourse actually ignores the fact that there is literature on regulation. And particularly the remedies they're doing that have studied them that, are, that need to be practically implemented. But in that, you know, I really wanted to, to focus in on something that you said, Eleanor, which was, and to put it to you, Bobby, which is we have frameworks of when regulation might be the right move. You know, um, every, any trust scholar will know when we prefer the form of the rule to be per se legality instead of rule of reason, familiarity, general inferences we can draw about the benefits of the topic. And I have a short piece coming out um, on a blogish kind of thing. I'll also look at rules versus standards. Like on a persistent basis, we do that. And try to understand you know, when the circumstances would be right for this. And you have more than just that. You have a lot of institutional considerations. But also, at the bottom of the paper, there's an assumption that this is an either or choice. And in the US, we do regard regulation and competition law as substitutes. In Europe, they regard them as complements. And so they wouldn't actually sort of pose the question the way you do. They would think of them as overlapping regimes with multiple potential sources of liability. And I'm wondering how you might think about it differently or write about it differently if you were to open up the possibility of having both regimes apply at the same time. It's a great question, and Bobby, go ahead and answer. And in fact, if you want to take the moment to answer other comments made on the paper, too. Uh, Chris, I think that's a fantastic question. It really is. I don't think I have a really good answer right now. Uh, but I would surely bring this up to Danny, and maybe, maybe he will have a. Maybe that, I'm sure he will have a, a, a reasonable response to that. But I agree with you. This is critical. Very, very important question. Yeah, I mean, let's go back to the scissors example. The scissors is a physical product. There's lots of problems measuring market power, as we learned this morning. But within the range of problems, the scissors is, does not present a big one, right? Uh, it's critically important in these kinds of cases know what Amazon's market share is in the market for that pair of scissors. I don't know what it is. I know that for small appliances and kitchenware, it tends to be around 20%. Walmart sells as many of those as, as and so then the question becomes, should self-preferencing ever be a defense for a product? And this, is, this is the problem I have with both the DMA and the ASCOA, which is they don't pay any attention they don't pay enough attention to products. They look too much at firms because a customer has choices. In general, search costs are lower on the internet than they are in physical space, right? If I don't yeah. like the choice of scissors at Amazon, I can walk to an, or drive to another store. If I don't like Amazon's uh, choices of scissors, <coughs> I can click my mouse over to uh, Target or some other internet site and do it. So you always need to think of these things in relation to the particular uh, product. And I think that is a deficiency of some of the, uh, of the regulation. And then just one other final comment, and that is in the US, this is not a choice between self-preferencing and absence of self-preferencing. We have lots of anti-self-preferencing provisions. 
in U.S. antitrust law, tying, exclusive dealing, in patent law, we've got patent exhaustion, uh, the repair reconstruction distinction, uh, and so on. The question is whether we need more self-preferencing rules that go beyond the mere display of, uh, of, rank, of ranked alternatives. Thank you. Really interesting, Herb. In interest of time, how are you of your hand up? Could you just say your question and then over to you, Bobby, for both? Uh, so first is a question to the authors of the paper. Uh, maybe rhetorical? Is antitrust regulation? That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to read a paper about regulation, as Christopher would say. And instead, it's a paper about antitrust done in somewhat different ways. and. The DMA, although not antitrust, is based on antitrust cases. So that's the first question. Uh, the second is a little disagreement with Christopher. I think we've had sort of a hybrid system in the United States since 1890, uh, where we rely on both antitrust and regulation. So competition isn't completely excluded in regulated industries. Um, and industries that are subject to competition get regulated as well. And we've going along this way. And I, I think it's a little, I don't think we should separate it quite as much. Um, I'm not sure what to do about, the, about digital competition, how, what the best institutional way is. Um, but I do agree, um, I think Marina said this, we should probably start out by saying not what regulation is supposed to do, because that's what markets are supposed to do. Everything's supposed to come out great. But why we don't use markets, where are the market failures? and are there failures in digital competition? Great question, and too much to answer in a minute, so answer what you like, and then we'll Sure, given the amount of time, <clears throat> 40 seconds left, uh, let me just say that I, I love the comment on, uh, you know, uh, focusing more on specific product categories and probably less on just firms or big platforms. Uh, one potential counter argument against that, and uh, which will make Aviv and other agencies happy, is that if we were to look at individual product categories, uh, that, that might just take a, a lot of time and efforts. And efficiency-wise, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. But as a as a theorist, uh, I completely agree that we should go that route. Uh, we should go with that route. If costs are not a significant factor. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. We have plenty of time in the corridor for more conversation. Um, thanks all of you and thank you Bobby and Danny very much for a very interesting thing. Thank you. Thank you. Well thank you very much. Uh, housekeeping, the second CLE word for the second session is university. And we shall reconvene here at 11.45 for our next, our next paper. Can I do that? Welcome back for our third session. The CLE word for this session is crossroads. And our moderator is Giovanna Masaro. Thank, thank you. Tech words. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, OK, my job here is so easy because uh, they don't really need uh, an introduction. But please uh, let me say a few words because it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce first uh, our presenter, who is uh, the Dean of Antitrust Law, and Herbert Hovenkamp. His knowledge and contribution in the field uh, of antitrust law is unparalleled. And today, we will benefit from his latest insights uh, into the structural remedies, uh, uh, structural antitrust remedies against the digital platforms. So, Professor Hovenkamp, uh, always uh, with uh, his uh, scholarship, uh, really guide the uh, courts, policymakers, and also make uh, all of us uh, uh, scholars, students, uh, practitioners, passionate about antitrust law. So, thank you so much. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Herbert Hovenkamp. Thanks. Uh, so I've got a complicated topic today, and we won't be able to talk about everything in the paper, but 
I'll hit a few high points. Uh, the issue is structural relief against digital platforms. Uh, and as an opening pr proposition, uh, more is not always better. Uh, I think we are living in kind of a reactionary period right now. Uh, and the reaction was very largely produced by Robert Bork in the 1970s and 80s because he was a reactionary. He always thought less antitrust was better. Uh, and so today there's a mindset, uh, particularly on the progressive end of the spectrum, that thinks more is always better. But I think there's a strong case for thinking that that is not true. In fact, if you plot uh, antitrust enforcement, enforcement's effectiveness in terms of output or price effects on a graph, you'll get an inverted U. It will present as an inverted U, which means basically too little enforcement leaves too much monopoly on the table. You get lower output and higher prices. However, overly aggressive antitrust uh, does a version of the same thing. You maybe get smaller firms, but you still get lower output and, uh, and higher prices. And that shows up particularly strongly in remedies. Because as bad as we have been at deciding the merits of antitrust cases, we have been even worse at designing remedies, particularly for single firm uh, conduct. Uh, structural remedies went through a period, an early period, in which they were preferred. Many of them, most of them, had disappointing results. Uh, and today, overall, the track record uh, of structural remedies against monopolization or dominant firms has been uh, has been uh, pretty pretty miserable. Uh, my second point is that I think the focus on big tech is unwarranted. I'm not telling you antitrust that big tech doesn't do anti-competitive things. They do plenty of those, but for us to aim our enforcement resources as concentrated as we are, speaking of the agencies, on big tech, I think is a mistake, particularly when there are other areas, and now particularly merger policy, that desperately, if we follow through on the merger guidelines and do as much additional enforcement as they appear to contemplate, uh, that's going to be a big, big money drain. And unless Congress is ready to triple budgets, and I don't think it is, uh, some choices are going to have to be made. And then I think uh, spending all of this money on big tech is a, is, a bad, is a bad idea. Big tech overall, you know, when you, when you look for places to spend enforcement dollars, you look for problem areas, right? You do your drug enforcement in airports, borders, and other places where you think the drugs are coming in. When you enforce an antitrust, you look for markets that are characterized by stagnation, poor performance, rigid market shares, uh, conduciveness to price fixing, lack of innovation. None of those uh, is a very good descriptor of big tech. Uh, overall, the economic growth rate in big tech runs three to four times as high as it does in the overall economy. Uh, they have a fairly well-educated and well-paid workforce. Overall, consumers are relatively happy uh, with what they get. Uh, they do a lot of innovation. Uh, by patent counts, they are all in the top dozen or so. Now, they're big firms, so you have to weigh that, uh, that accordingly. They have proportionately very high research budgets. None of that rings an alarm bell and say, we really ought to go get big tech. Uh, further, as was pointed out in the previous panel, a lot of the things that they do do that are wrong are best not addressed through antitrust, but rather through some other uh, body of law. Uh, the one case that in my mind most resembles the current war on big tech is U.S. versus IBM in 1969. That was the third major antitrust case filed by the Justice Department at, International, uh, at IBM. Uh, it was a case that there's a wide consensus today uh, that it was improperly brought. 
Uh, in fact, the theory of the case, boy, it was a complicated case, but boiled to a nutshell, it was really that IBM was innovating too fast, that it would introduce series after series. That is, we didn't get from those uh, airplane hangar sized computers like you see in 1950s movies to the PC overnight. There was actually a lengthy series of computers uh, uh, in the, uh, that IBM made, each one of which was smaller and more powerful than the last. And principally, the claims against IBM was that it would innovate in a predatory manner by innovating too quickly after a previous innovation had been put on the market uh, and leaving uh, competitors in the gulch. By the way, it had very, very uh, top-notch economists working on it, people like Bobby Willig and Janusz Ordover. Uh, and uh, the case went to a lengthy trial. It dragged on and on and on until it was finally voluntarily dismissed in 1982. And today, you know, we look back on it and think of it as, as kind of an ill-conceived onslaught on uh, innovation. That's not to say IBM did not do some anti-competitive things, but that uh, they were targeted for very largely uh, the, wrong, the wrong reason. Now, that brings me to this point of why so many Section 2 cases? Look at the cases against Facebook, Amazon, Google. Uh, all, what they all share in common is that Section 2 dominates, and in fact, in many of them, the only complaint that's filed, the only count that appears in those complaints is either under Section 2 of the Sherman Act in a DOJ case or the Section 2 lookalike uh, under the federal Section 45 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Uh, but then you start looking at the practices, and practically every one of them, practically every one of them is either an agreement or an acquisition. For example, Facebook was alleged to be engaged in a number of licensing and purchasing practices, and also for illegally acquiring uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. However, the acquisitions were not challenged under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. They were challenged under Section under Section 2 standards. Amazon is being challenged entirely under Section 2, even though practically every one, practically every one of the mentioned practices is some kind of contractual practice like tying. Uh, and the same thing is very largely true of Google. The Google trial, just three months or so ago, centered on very large payments that uh, Google is making to firms like Apple to make Google search the default search engine, but it's being challenged under section, under section two standards. Why? Well, probably because the agencies think that's a better ticket to structural relief, uh, although that is certainly not clear from the statutes. Statutes do not distinguish, be, uh, relate any type, they don't mention structural relief at all, but they don't relate any type of equity relief to which statute is uh, being violated. The downside is that if you file under Section 2, you've got to meet Section 2's power requirements. Well, that's going to be met in Google, the case of Google Search, I'm pretty sure. I'm not at all sure it's going to be met in a case like Facebook or Amazon, where market power tends to reside in products rather than uh, platforms. Facebook, the fact is, Facebook has a lot of rivals. and. Uh, and so, and then finally, of course, is the fact that the federal rules of civil procedure encourage bringing multiple counts if you have them, and race judicata might very well bar those that you haven't brought uh, if too late in the day you start losing under Section 2 standards. So I think this whole idea that these things should have been brought as structural cases needs to go back and have another look. Okay, then the next problem is, suppose we do want structural relief. What does it look like? Well, in the case of recent, uh, in the case of acquisitions, that's not very complicated. Uh, the preferred remedy is to undo an acquisition. 
Section 7 of the Clayton Act makes it unlawful to acquire, and so the preferred remedy would be to reverse, uh, reverse the acquisition. However, the case was brought under Section 2, uh, under, under, under Section 2 standards. Uh, in general, a characteristic of digital, two characteristics of digital uh, divestiture stand out. One is that divestiture of, di of digital networks is more difficult overall than divestiture of tactile manufacturing and, uh, and, and products. I mean, how are you going to break up Facebook? Well, you, you can reverse the, the mergers. You can spin off uh, Instagram and, and WhatsApp. But what else could you do? What else could you do? How would you break up Facebook as a network? Would you, would you give one side to girls and one side to boys? That's not going to work. Would you divide Facebook by hemispheres, a northern hemisphere Facebook and a southern hemisphere Facebook? Would you break off some individual products? Break off, you can no longer post videos or photos on Facebook. You can use it for text messaging and things like that. No, there's really no non-disastrous way of breaking up Facebook uh, other than uh, spinning off uh, recently, uh, recently acquired assets. Uh, same thing pretty much applies to Google search, although the verdict is still out on that. There's a debate going on about whether Google search algorithms, uh, uh, everybody agrees that there's very significant economies of scale. The real question is, are the economies that increase continuously all the way to the point that the entire uh, market is exhausted, that is, it's a winner-take-all or natural monopoly market, or do they level off at a certain point, leaving room for multiple efficient search engines? And there was a lot of debate on that topic during the, uh, dur during the Google search trial. I think the answer is that Judge Maida is going to have to decide something uh, without really knowing what the, the, without really having the final answer to that question, because we'll probably end up debating it uh, for a long time. The other factor about digital assets, however, is that while breaking them up is more difficult, sharing them is easier. That is to say, it's very hard to come up with a uh, remedy that forces a production facility to share its physical plant. As soon as we move to non-rivalrous goods, however, like patents, patents can be shared, copyrights can be shared, digital access can often be shared uh, through, uh, through interoperability requirements. That gives us an alternative set of remedies. Now, we might want to debate about whether they are structural or not. I'd like to call them quasi-structural. But an interoperability remedy is one that would uh, force data sharing for example, Facebook could be forced to package its uh, consumer history, its user history, into a transferable package that could be uh, carried to a different social networking site if a user chose to do so, sort of the equivalent of number portability after the AT&T uh, breakup. These are issues that we really need to think about a lot more uh, than we have. And by the way, the paper, uh, first paper this morning on the measurement of market power, which I thought was excellent, realizes, just brings home how much more cautious we need to be about diving into this water uh, and thinking about breakups without really knowing uh, what it is we are getting into. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ovenkamp. So, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, our uh, estimate commentator, Professor Daniel Rubinthal. He's uh, really the economist uh, that inspired many antitrust uh, scholars, uh, including myself. Uh, his uh, knowledge uh, about uh, is uh, profound understanding of market dynamics uh, has uh, set the tone uh, for a new understanding of antitrust economics. Uh, and uh, we are all uh, 
pleased to have you here today. And so please join me in thanking Professor, in welcoming Professor Daniel Rubin. Uh, thank you, Giovanna. I'd, I'd like to have you introduce me all the time, anytime I speak. <laughs> that would be great. So, uh, uh, Herb, Herb and I, I've known each other a long time, and I and I find myself almost always agreeing with his uh, wonderful insights over the years. But today, actually, we have some. We may have a significant disagreement, uh, and that has to do with the fact that I, I actually think that uh, he's being a little too quick to. Uh, to defend the big platforms. I think he's probably right to be concerned about major structural relief, but as, as Herb notes and as alluded to, there are other forms of relief that may well be re relevant in some of these cases. Having said that, I have to uh, uh, just make clear, just for the record, that I, that I have an important call. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually, it's funny, I'm trying to sell it, sell my New York apartment at the moment. I'm waiting for the buyer to close the deal, so <laughs> we can wait 15 minutes. So uh, uh, we're, I'll explain where we disagree, but I have to make uh, just clear for everyone that um, I have a prior record of having done work for Microsoft, for Google, against Microsoft, one reason Bill Gates got irritated at me because he I consulted for five years from Microsoft and then sued them when I went to government. Uh, but uh, and I've also done work for some of the other folks as well. But uh, currently I am working uh, on the plaintiff side on several platform cases, but I can't say what they are. I'll just have to modify my comments and not be too specific about some of the current cases. So. Uh, uh, Herb's paper covers a lot of ground because uh, it's primarily a, a paper about about uh, remedies, and where Herb I think does an excellent <coughs> job of of talking about the whole range of possible remedies. Uh, and in the current world of of, uh, of, of digital content and digital uh, digital technology, we do need to think about a lot of these remedies, uh, particularly those I think that that do involve. Uh, issues of interoperability and so on, and if I have time, I'll get back to that. But because her spent a fair amount of time talking about breakup as a remedy, I, I feel almost obligated uh, to, to remind some of us, actually most of you were not alive at the time, to remind you that when we, when we brought the case, uh, when I was at DOJ and we brought the US v. Microsoft case, we spent a year uh, thinking about uh, possible breakup as a remedy. And I want to come, come to that in just a second. Uh, but um, in, in Herb's paper, when I was thinking about it, there's so many different ways you can break up the remedy issue. There's so many possible taxonomies. Uh, digital, uh, digital is one breakup. Another another has to do with the type of remedy. Another has to do whether they're big, big platforms. Another has to do whether something flows out of Section 2 or Section 1 of the Sherman Act or whether we should focus on the Clayton Act. And another has to do with whether we ought to go in the, in the way of Europe, where we were, have, were heavily reg regulatory uh, with the DNA and other regulatory structures. Um, and all of those raise different issues. So I just want to, st I'll start on some of these issues, but I'm sure we're running out of time. With respect to breakup, again, for those of you who weren't alive at the time, uh, when, when we in the government uh, sued Microsoft, first of all, we, we thought the case was all about innovation. I'm speaking for myself, but I think it generalizes to a lot of the staff. Uh, we thought the case was about innovation. Uh, and when you think about innovation versus uh, just other practices that might, might, not be innovate, might not affect innovation, you're thinking very differently about possible remedies. That case is unusual because we intentionally did not specify a remedy when we sued Microsoft. Uh, we actually didn't know what the remedy would be because we weren't sure how successful we would be uh, with, with bringing a uh, major Section 2 case. When it came time to think about remedies, and we, we planned way ahead with respect to remedies. And I was, I can say, I was one of the folks actually thought a breakup made sense between, a, between a, 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 an apps company and an operating system company. Uh, but that wasn't just based on a hunch. Uh, it was based on a lot of hard thinking and difficult issues. 
Uh, but we actually were lined up in that case to have two economists testify uh, about the case. We, they didn't testify because the judge said he didn't need to hear from them. Uh, and we mistakenly, in my view, decided to agree with the judge and say, here's what our remedy is. All that went away when there was a change of administration. We never got to hear the testimony of the two economists we hired, but but their testimony has been published, at least a version of it, and, and it's worth um, it's worth thinking about because the remedy we were talking about was a remedy that we thought would actually in, would encourage innovation and restore competition. And I'll just I'll read just a little bit of what our first expert, Paul Romer, had to say. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul wrote a piece basically explaining why it's better to have two, two companies competing rather than one if you're looking for innovation. And I'll just read a little bit because I don't waste a lot of time. He says, uh, the government's proposed remedy will prevent harms from recurring. The most important element of the remedy is a reorganization that creates independent applications and operating system companies. It will deprive the operating system company of some of the tools that Microsoft used to limit competition. It will create an applications company with the incentive and the ability to lower the applications barrier to entry in the operating system market. I could go on and on and on. I have a long quote here. Uh, I like to I like to ask my students. I can ask all of you if you had a choice. If there was a breakup and you had a choice to own the operating system company or the apps company, which would you want? I know the answer Bill Gates would give, but I uh, because uh, we've had comments from them, but I'll leave that out. Um, I won't take a poll, but I'll tell you that the, the answer I would have given, uh, I would expect Bill Gates to give would be the apps company because there are actually other operating system products in the market. He figured he could buy one of them. After all, he essentially acquired one from Apple to start his company in the first place, so he would just find another application, another another operating system uh, market and, and develop his apps, which are still incredibly successful. I actually believe, although Bait, that those two companies competing would have generated more innovation. After all, Microsoft really was not a very innovative company in terms of technology. It was just innovative from a business strategy point of view. It was brilliant uh, in acquiring the technologies it needed to be so successful. Uh, there was also, by the way, testimony from uh, MIT economist Rebecca Henderson <coughs> saying that the uh, use of the power of the market to correct the problems created by Microsoft conduct uh, is very significant and, and separation would support that. Rather than rely on an extensive set of permanent prohibitions, it may be difficult to enforce, which may, which, which, which may have undesirable side effects. The remedy will quickly put in place market-based incentives which rely on the firm's profit maximizing motive to promote competition and so on. So, uh, what does that mean for, for, for the debate with, um, about what to do about the current companies? I, I'm, I'm not someone who thinks we should start breaking up all of these companies because, as her suggests, there's not, not a natural way to do that. But I do think we have to keep on the table uh, uh, possible breakups of companies like uh, uh, breaking up Instagram off of Facebook because that's a natural, that was done by acquisition and, and it's still feasible to imagine that trying to otherwise pull apart these companies is probably a mistake. Uh, so what do we learn, uh, what do we learn about, about where the innovation is coming from? Uh, Herb points out that, uh, that there's a lot, a lot of companies now own, uh, uh, have their own, have, a, have IP uh, with the suggestion that that ownership of IP is, is a correlative variable that explains who's likely to innovate. But that's a little bit, that can be a little bit misleading because some of the companies acquire IP either through their own R&D or acquisition because the, the, uh, the IP, if it's particularly uh, um, patents, is, is essential to their operation. But that's not true for all companies. Google acquired a lot of IP. I had a lot to do with helping them acquire that IP. But Google was doing it purely for defensive purposes. Google really wasn't. Uh, Doing much innovation in terms of in terms of producing uh, patents, it was innovative in other ways. So we have to be a little careful to just talk about the volume of IP that's controlled 
not necessarily a predictive predictive of what's a good remedy or what or how to how innovative some of these will be. And we also have to think about remedies, as her understands and talks about this paper, as to whether they're really trying to uh, to really encourage innovation specifically or whether they're just trying to correct uh, other market failures and, and that would that would also affect how you would look at now what's a proper proper remedy. <clears throat> uh, I haven't talked about, but I think one of the great parts of her paper is in reference back to some of our history, particularly with the uh, breakup of AT&T, because there, there is a lot we can learn from history. Um, but some of that changes now when we start talking about the digital side of the story. And there, uh, there, we, there we start to, as her correctly points out, have to think, think about what to do about data portability and interoperability, because interoperability may well be uh, the right remedy in certain cases. And there, unlike you, un, in, in US v. Microsoft, one of the reasons that the government case turned out to be so powerful is uh, had it gone to a balancing test, which is in the DC Circuit has suggested, uh, there, there wouldn't have been very good defenses, in my view, uh, on Microsoft's side. Their story about what the what the pro-competitive benefits were of some of their uh, some of their treatment of, of middleware would not have been very powerful. But when we start talking about the digital world with some of these platforms, there are clearly pro-competitive benefits or efficiencies to some of the arrangements. And so we're we're inevitably going to be drawn into a difficult world of, of doing balancing tests. And even though economists like myself love balancing tests because we get hired all the time to try to figure out <laughs> the pros and cons, the fact of the matter is we've had very few cases brought where, where we've had, we've gone all the way down to full balancing analysis. And it's very difficult and very costly. Uh, so there, I agree with her. Uh, we've got to be very careful about how the agency have to be careful about how they process some of these cases because if it turns out that that they can't win some of these cases, uh, either just on the power of Section 2 or perhaps uh, perhaps not having to go through a rule of reason. It's going to be very costly and very difficult. And uh, I've done some writing, which I'll pass on to Herb, where I point out that, uh, that there are problems to worry about with portability and interoperability because they can increase market power and be a source of inefficiency. Uh, they could innovate. They could impede innovation within markets, reduce spillovers to other markets. Uh, but interoperability can also encourage innovation and uh, be encouraging to competition. So we've got just a lot of hard work to try to sort all that out. And the final set of the comments I have relating to that is, uh, and Herb alluded to this, uh, the EU and the U.S. so far have really gone about dealing with. Uh, world very differently. Uh, the EU is, uh, has focused much more on regulation than we have in the U.S., so that could change, you never know. Uh, and uh, I, I've written an article uh, about that, those differences. My own view is that one of the reasons we've, we've got where we are between the EU and the U.S. has to do with uh, the underlying federal structures that are built to really support uh, the, the competition work that we do. Uh, I won't bore you with hours about talking about those differences. But the fact, of, the fact of the matter is the US has a much more effective working federal system where, uh, although it's not looking great now, but it's, it's working reasonably well. Uh, as compared to the European Union, they're, they're much further away from an ideal federal system. And that creates a lot of comp complications that would make it was made it very hard for the US, for the EU to operate anything like the way we have, the way we do under our common law system. So if I had another hour, I could uh, I could elaborate in great detail. But it's, my reaction is it's natural for the EU to go the way it did. Unfortunately, it's it's been a little too quick to, to move with the DMA and some related uh, regulations, which have serious problems. And ultimately, I think the US may get to a good point. We're just slow moving. I'll stop there. All right. So thank you so much uh, to both of you. Uh, what to say? 
fascinating paper. I don't have uh, so many comments uh, or the wisdom to offer because, yeah, Owenkamp, uh, uh, with, uh, I feel uh, with immense clarity and thoughtfulness uh, has uh, lead us uh, through the complex uh, of breaking up uh, uh, injunction, quasi structural relief, uh, and uh, offering a nuanced uh, perspective uh, in how to fake competition in a digital economy. So I would say fully agree with uh, his uh, perspective about uh, the structural antitrust relief. Uh, I don't know why, and I would be interested in your thoughts, uh, uh, why people, when they think of antitrust, uh, think about uh, breaking up uh, companies uh, as uh, it's not really a remedy that uh, we have uh, used uh, so much uh, in the field of antitrust. So why do you think uh, people, when they think of antitrust, uh, think of breaking up companies? I think in the US it's mainly historical, and it's because the early trusts, like Standard Oil, were made up out of uh, trust agreements involving a whole bunch of separate corporations. It was the union. So, for example, when Standard Oil was broken up, it was broken up right back into the original 33 companies from which the Standard Oil Trust was formed. But when somebody around 1910 or so saw, looked at a trust, they saw an aggregation of different companies, uh, some because they were chartered in different states, some because they were chartered for different purposes, brought together. And the remedy for that was to uh, was to dissolve it. Okay, so it's mainly related to the famous standard oil case. You think the heavily that driven that by standard yeah. oil, yeah. Okay. I was just saying that uh, the, these platforms have done probably hundreds of acquisitions. So, uh, right. So it wouldn't be that hard to think about breaking them up by just saying we're going to pull back on some of the acquisitions you made. Because now that we've done more analysis, we know more, we realize it was a mistake. So, so I, I don't see why you should be so quick to throw out the structural relief just by looking at all the acquisitions. I got a few that may, maybe turned out to be problematic. We didn't know it. We may not have known it at the time, so we couldn't process under, under claim it, initially, but a, now we can. It's a very fact-specific query. It's easy to do with... Facebook and Instagram because Zuckerberg never did a very good job of integrating them into a single network. They, they do share some data, but no more than they could share by contract. You know, it still has a separate membership structure and everything else. But think of Google's acquisition of Wordle. You probably don't know what Wordle is. Wordle was a uh, an image searching technology that Google folded into Google Search, became part of the search algorithm. I don't think breaking that, and, and as a result, Google can do much better image searches. I don't think breaking that out is a very easy thing to accomplish anymore. You can make Google search worse by saying remove your image searching features. Uh, can you restore Wordle to what it originally was, which was a freestanding image search engine? I kind of doubt that too. So, you know, it, it's a complicated question. It, it will work for some acquired assets. Not for others. Android is another good example. Android is an acquired asset. Android was a six person uh, firm developing uh, an operating system for digital cameras at the time Google search, uh, Google acquired it. This was back when Google was still Google. It acquired it, turned it into, it has modified the code and the, whatever patents there were, into a uh, an operating system that would work for tel telephones, and then of course it was released as open open source operating system. You know th those are those are hands you can't unclap anymore. And yeah, I was interested about uh, both uh, your comment about IBM uh, case. Uh, I know uh, it's a. Uh, I feel uh, it's an interesting case, uh, although uh, we know. Uh, Judge Borg uh, considered the finance uh, at the Vietnam of antitrust, uh, and uh, many feel okay, it was just a, a waste of money for the government. 
But I feel that the unbundling that IBM decided to perform uh, was pretty pro-competitive. I mean, unquestionably we, true. Yeah, if we look at the software industry, I feel uh, it will not look the same. So do you feel that despite uh, how it ended in the sense that it wasn't truly an antitrust decision, they abandoned because it's... Uh, no, I agree, I agree with that. As a result of litigation, IBM stepped back from some of its most extreme positions. It licensed out a lot of its technology, not under court order, but purely voluntarily. And, uh, and the result is, and of course it made the one serious mistake of uh, licensing the OS to one firm, Bill Gates' is Microsoft. Exactly. Although I, I have a different take on, on that case, uh, which is uh, the case clearly by the time it got to trial was, was a problem, but uh, I think if the IBM investigation could have been resolved very quickly, there may well have been room for a uh, and, uh, what would it have been, though? Well, some form of unbundling, probably. Uh, I just want to add, I thought about it because I talked a lot, this is an inside baseball comment, but I talked a lot to Frank Fisher, who was IBM's expert, uh, who was preaching the case, but uh, we used to debate it. And then I thought it would be great, why not hire Frank Fisher to do the case against Microsoft because he's the guy who had been defending IBM, and now he's going to say the Microsoft case is different. And we, were trying, we thought from the beginning, how can we do this case where we'll, where we'll win and find a remedy within a short enough time that we will not fall into the trap that IBM did. So it still took us five years, and, and the remedy didn't happen because there was a change of administration. When I graduated from law school, it was 1978, uh, Cravath, Swain, and Moore was hiring on two tracks. They were hiring for their general offices, and they were hiring for IBM. And, you know, getting hired to do IBM meant going into an airplane hangar and reading documents for the next X number of years. But uh, and when, and when it was dismissed, the Second Circuit judge who dismissed it, I forget his name, said it was the most expensive antitrust lawsuit uh, in U.S. history up until that time. And I fear we're getting into that again. I, I don't have good insight. Maybe Bill knows about the expense payoff on these current digital cases. But boy, I would much rather see us put more of that money into merger enforcement rather than into pursuing kind of marginal claims against big tech. No, we, we, we disagree. But I, I will tell you that uh, Frank Fisher bought a really elaborate boat, boat <laughs> which he which he called the Section Two. <laughs> so, there you go. Dan, can I jump in and say I actually sailed on that boat? Is that right? Dan told me that everyone thought it was because of the trial and what he got paid, and he laughed and said, "Ha! Huh, those folks have no idea how little this boat cost and how much I made off." <laughs> Could have called it the CRA. <laughs> <laughs> that was the HSR filing, you know, before the section two, so whatever. <laughs> and yeah, you both uh, dealt with uh, interoperability as a, a promising, a likely remedy for big tech. Have you thought about uh, the possibility that interoperability can uh, increase the power of big tech rather than, you know, Decreasing the power. If we think uh, of, uh, I when I think of interoperability, I also think of Google Android. So Google Android is super interoperable because it's open source, and this is the reason why uh, Google Android got so big. So, do you think uh, there is the risk uh, that by implementing these kind of remedies uh, to see this side effect? In a sense, I think there is a risk. I mean. Android was fabulously successful. It is also glitchier and more error prone and more virus prone than the iOS that runs Apple. And Apple has scored big time in various cases by, uh, by arguing that. I mean, interoperability has to be managed, uh, and that is a cost. Uh, but I think it's a much, much better solution 
in digital networks than anything that resembles a physical a physical breakup. And what's the best application of the interoperability that you, remedy that you have seen uh, in your non aesthetic career? Well, AT and T decree. I mean, it was it was negotiated a settlement, but uh, they AT and you know the AT and AT and T decree is frequently called the great. <laughs> title. The regional breakup of AT&T into seven baby bells did not accomplish very much. And in fact, most of what it accomplished was negative. It preserved a single network except added interconnection obligations. So the cost of managing that portion of the network went up. But segregating off long lines, long distance, and then Western Electric, those happened at different times, instruments, and then global interconnection requirements administered uh, under the decree for a dozen years or so and then transferred to the 1996 Telecommunications Act. That interconnection is what really caused competitive growth in, uh, in, uh, in the telecommunications network. And of course today it's so good, you know, you can call Aunt Mildred in North Carolina you don't even know what kind of device she's on, who her carrier is, uh, because we have created a system that has literally hundreds of participants, of suppliers, and, uh, and, 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 and usually interconnection is so seamless that uh, you don't even realize who you're, who you're talking through when you talk to someone else. Did you call Ivana? Yes. I think given our time, yeah, yeah. if I open Yeah, yeah, up. sure. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I would love to open uh, the panel for questions, so any questions? OK, yes. So, uh, I don't know who. OK. Professor Baker. Mine sort of follows a little bit on your question, Giovanna. I think I land also on interoperability remedies being the most interesting for discussion. And I'm curious about what you think the scope is for antitrust law to account for sort of unique other interests that may not be competition related in the design of remedies. Um, and so I'll use Microsoft as an example too. You know, if it threatened cybersecurity, there was exceptions in that remedy. And I think thinking about the scope for those sorts of accommodations and remedies is an important sub issue here because when we talk about IBM cases, I'll talk about another IBM case I think you mentioned in the 1950s that ended with a disclosure remedy. The company had to disclose what its technical interfaces would be so that competitors can make compatible products, but that was company information. And now when we analogize to data portability or to number portability, I don't think it is a clear analogy because we're talking about porting our own personal information between companies. And so we've seen the rise of data privacy law and I think that really changes how easy it is to implement these sorts of remedies. So I'd love to hear from, from our, our expert for antitrust up here about what scope there is to accommodate that in antitrust remedies now for digital. Well, number one, if it's an antitrust remedy, it has to be a remedy that solves some problem related to competition because the statutes authorize only that. So there has to be a restraint of trade, a threat of monopoly, or something that lessens competition under the under the antitrust laws. But those things could clearly fall within that. The rest of it is a management problem. And you know, I agree with you. A lot of interoperability creates has side effects. One of them is now instead of having one person controlling your information. In an interoperable system, you potentially have a lot of them. And those have to be managed. Uh, the people who, the customers who participate in them, have to be informed in advance that their data may be shared more widely than with a single person. I think those are problems that most of the time can be addressed, but they certainly do have to be do have to be addressed. And they will take detailed decrees if they're going to be done by decree. In order to carry the, in order to carry them out, the, 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 the regs that carried out the 1996 uh, Telecom Act were, were very very elaborate. They had to they had to be because there were so many different facets to uh, to interconnection. 
It's also true that the remedies that are available will be very different if we're process or if we're working under, say, Section Two of Sherman Act versus an acquisition where we claim to have different standards and, and rules. So the possibilities for what remedies you impose would, would differ a lot depending on what the legal context is. The other thing I, was, I would add is I've just been finished writing a, a lot about AI, and AI kind of magnifies all these issues. Uh, just sort of the, the benefits and costs of interoperability just just grow when you start thinking about AI, AI being part of the process. Uh, yeah, I have a question for for Professor Hovenkamp. The uh, um, I'm just wondering whether your um, skepticism about structural remedies is tied to the digital platforms, or whether it's a general. I think I think there's some features about digital platforms that that make pure structural remedies worse, but sharing remedies actually better. You know, so the things we need to look at are uh, things like interoperability, or in many cases, removal of exclusivity agreements. You know, I mean, Microsoft opted. DC Circuit opted for non-structural remedies, but it, what it did is it took off a whole bunch of exclusivity agreements that had required app developers and other third parties to favor uh, Internet Explorer or use it exclusively. And once those were removed, that market started started shifting. It, it doesn't happen quite as fast, but it happens. You're uh, questioning the, 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 I mean, I was thinking about like the FTC Xerox case and the you know, compulsory licensing of IP remedies that have shown up, or, and my vague recollection of Alcoa, I might be wrong about this, is, they, is that the plants that were created during World War II that were, were that sold off to create yeah. uh, Kaiser and some others, and, you know, uh, that there, aren't there, so, so um, I, mean, I take it you're going to say those aren't digital platforms, and uh, well, so those kind of remedies but, aren't. No, the, the Alcoa remedy was to was actually under the Federal Surplus Property Act. I probably got the name of that statute wrong, but at the end of the war, the government owned some big aluminum plants, and part of the decree forbade Alcoa from bidding on them when they were put up for auction. Kaiser and Reynolds were the two firms. They, they uh, ended up buying them and turned into substantial aluminum producers. But that wasn't a structural decree, really. That was just an injunction that applied to a prospective auction. Professor Furster. <clears throat> so um, Giovanna asked earlier why structural remedies? Why, why do we think about those? So actually, to step back a second, I want to agree with Dan again. Um, <laughs> I think the paper sounds a little too anti-structural remedies and then too favorable to interconnection and interoperability. So to step back to Giovanna's point, um, true there's history as you pointed out here, but I think today in sort of modern views, it's, it's the silver bullet effect and the anti-regulation uh, approach. So what, is, what do structural remedies give you? You're one and done, you know, you're finished, you walk away you separate the companies and you don't have to be Judge Green and you know the communications are and die over it, I mean, literally. So um, that's, that's part of the draw. And then I think your question is, well, will that be true of any of these? And I worry too, very much, I think this is worse than the substantive law challenge. This is a real, real challenge and I hope that current enforcers were as good as Dan and have spent a year before thinking about what they wanted in these cases, but I'm not sure, except for ad tech. So in the ad tech complaint, there are specific parts saying, you know, we want to spin this off or this off. So it's not um, sort of impossible. Um, the, struck, the, the interoperability, I think maybe the paper should say a little bit more about, you know, all of what you described, like for at and wasn't so simple um, and in fact required a regulatory response. And it was 
doable because there was an agency there, the Federal Communications Commission. And I looked to Otter Tail. You know, um, the government won the Otter Tail case, but they couldn't control all the interconnections. Eventually, uh, the Federal Power Commission and FERC actually restructured the electric power industry. Um, now, that, that, that was doable. Point, though, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't. The only make, way you can make Otter Tail competitive is by putting it under the jurisdiction of what at that point was the Federal Power Commission. Um, yes, well, so that it ties in nicely with our earlier papers about regulation and where that might fit in. Maybe we, we've got to think more about that. Even Microsoft had a continuing, there was a technical committee for 10 years yes. that supervised what, you know, what Microsoft was doing and whether they were complying, all the technical aspects. So it's a, it's a tough haul. I guess my point is, I think the paper might be, you know, more convincing if it said, um, you know, there might be times. I'm skeptical that there are going, what they're going to be. I say there and, might be times. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm okay with divesting acquired assets. Well, some it, of them. that, I mean, it is the easiest and the hardest. It's the easiest take of it. Well, to spin those off. Harder things are, are we going to really restructure companies, which would have, you know, that's part of what would have been required in Microsoft. I mean, Harry, the bottom line for me is federal courts have the power to ruin firms. Sure. You know, the real well, goal is to... That's why it's so hard to convince them to order divestiture. They don't, yeah, yeah. They don't mean, want to do it. Think of United Shoe Machinery, which was broken up and then went bankrupt. So, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to raise it. I, I would like to see your footnote suggests was it clearly the requirement that, which was consensual, they agreed to the to the breakup. The the argument in the Supreme Court for the breakup, the case was argued by Don Turner. It was not like some crazy guy standing up there. Um, and it was a unanimous Supreme Court case that said a decade was enough of um, you know of non-structural relief and we still don't have competition. So yeah, I don't really know. Part of the I would story. like to see that case. But I'll I'll give you the Wazansky decided Yeah, I know what yeah, Wazansky's wonderful, but <laughs> at, at ten years <laughs> nothing <laughs> happened. That was the thing. No, that's not true. Well that's what that's, that's what the government argued. Happen. If that's not true, I'd just like to see a little more of that. And then I'll ask you a rhetorical question. So if spirit goes out of business as a result of the merger or Ro Roomba case. as a result of the failure of the Amazon acquisition. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about the JetBlue. Yes, I know. Crash. Okay. Yeah. Would that mean the government shouldn't have brought it? No, it might mean that we need to think a little more liberally about failing company defense, uh, okay. because it sounds like Spirit was closer to meeting the requirements of that defense than we thought. I mean, the judge clearly held. And although Spirit was foundering, it was uh, what it fair. said was they had a 10-year plan or something of that nature for recovery, and obviously that was a little bit too, too optimistic. Now, should the government in its prosecutorial discretion have decided not to bring the merger because it believed the requirements for the failing company defense would defeat the challenge? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly plausible. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. So uh, thank you for moderating this. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Giovanna really wrote a book on remedies, and so it's a uh, great interest in it. So um, I, Liz, I have a, a question to, to get into both of you. And I guess the most scurrilous way for me to say is you're saying structural versus, versus you know, um, behavioral. And I want to say um, a pox on both your houses. Not so much because you got you have to do something, but um, I want to know not either or, but when do you do either? Like, you know, I want a little more structure on um, when structural remedies are a good idea and a bad idea, even if it's in digital versus it's something. But, but particularly the behavioral ones, I mean, there's a lot of weird history, and this is where the telecom stuff comes in raw, which is uh, the 96 Act is regarded as a failure, by, by and large. You know, and in fact, we have a lot of these where um, Jerry Faldhaber has a nice bit of work trying to understand 
the, the um, technical interdependencies of certain things makes certain things hard to inter make interoperable. You know, add certain things. And you can do an analysis beyond, if you will, the Cosian technology on the transaction cost towards sort of more interconnection, like thermal efficiencies we used to think about in, in, in steel, which make things much more tightly put together. We have things like, um, we have feudal remedies. You know, like the search engine remedy choice in the EU doesn't, everyone seems to be ticking Google. And we have the data portability rules in the UK, and no one seems to be using them. So yes, we have them. But we have this notion of when are they a bad idea? Um, and I keep thinking about the um, another inter interoperability remedy, AOA, well, Time Warner, and instant messaging, which seems to have been a bit of a empty exercise, you know, and was eventually done. And so I guess I'm asking both of you, uh, not just is are there heuristics we can use? When is a good time to do a structural remedy aside from digital versus non-digital? Uh, and the answer to you, why don't we do it more? I mean, is it, is there such a thing as a muck? You know, writing this too much. And in interoperability, wouldn't we benefit, even though interoperability is better, don't we need to know more about when it might work and when it might not? My rule is always try an injunction first. I mean, examine the possibility, either a mandatory or a prohibitory injunction. Uh, and only when you've decided you can't get the relief you need or you can't get it as quickly as you need it, then you need to look at quasi-structural or structural alternatives, uh, none of which are perfect. Oh, yeah, that's clearly right. None of them are perfect, but a, a bad structural remedy uh, to a digital network could be calamitous because uh, the courts have the power to ruin. They have the power to bankrupt <coughs> Facebook, right? If, if they took my advice and I mean, my hypothetical advice, and said, okay, Facebook, you can't post pictures or video anymore. You can only communicate with digital words. Facebook would be bankrupt within a month. Uh, and, but the courts would have the power to do that. That doesn't make it intelligent. Uh, if they put the boys on one side and the, on one network and the girls on another one, I suspect that would ruin it too. So you've got to think of the, the goal is to try to restore competitive conditions. So, a good remedy needs to be an output increasing, something that gets output back up to the competitive level, or towards the competitive level. And uh, that takes a lot of ingenuity. I would just say, or, or, or increases the likelihood of there to be innovative activities. Yeah, oh, of course, yeah. And, I, mean, and I would also just innovation. add that, um, of course, there are a whole range of structural remedies. I think the threat of having the possibility of structural remedy can, it do, can itself induce uh, pro-competitive behavior. Uh, and uh, well, I think and we just have to keep that in mind. It's just that having, having it as an option. Uh, and by the way, selling it your have... children into slavery is an inducement, <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's the right one. <laughs> but this, <laughs> Herb, this is an interesting collection of yes, proposals. <laughs> this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, there are, I'll just, I'll leave that a little bit. I'll just say, there are a range of structural remedies to think about. Some of them are quite modest, and some of them are natural. If you think about, again, if you think of the Clayton Act, and you think about acquisitions, a lot of what we talk about when we, when we make deals to, to make fixes, those are, in effect, structural remedies. So I think it's wrong to just think that to have a pox on structural remedies. It's more to think about what's the range of possibilities. Is it, is it innovation inducing or not? What are the potential costs? So I, I think Herb gets credit for raising those costs, but I, I think, Herb, that you just overstate. Don't you think that Microsoft nice. remedies were inducive, conducive to innovation, but not? The actual remedies imposed, I they thought, were totally useless. <laughs> they weren't useless. Uh, Internet Explorer's market share fell through the floor within a few years. Whose market share? Yeah. That, that, in my view, had nothing to do, or little to do, with the actual remedies that were imposed, but that was really Distinction. Okay, I think that's the story on IE. And IE did continue to have pretty good market share for quite a few yeah. years. That's my recollection. But you know, we're old, we don't remember things quite the same. I, I remember the past. <laughs> I remember that Dan's right. <laughs> As my colleague is supporting me. Thank you. Yeah. Herb, it was a great job. Thank you. Thank you. I do too. So, thank you so much. Thank you.
question during the break. Uh, all right, thank you all for an invigorating morning. We are now at the lunch moment, but I, my obligations are several. Uh, the last, the second uh, CLE word for the third session is unicorn, for those of you who need that. We have once again to do another CLE word, which is for the third, se the fourth session is regulation. Um, and you understand, delighted to have the flow of this conference. You probably figured out there's a certain logic to where the papers are organized. We start with market definition, harms, remedies, and now we go to institutional context and enforcement. And uh, it, it, to me, it's a very natural place to do this. We've got sort of our mission of the different things we're going to do. And as a panel of paper on how to actually do it, I hand off to my colleague, Gus Hurwitz, who will be moderating the next one. OK. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, everyone. I have the auspicious task of briefly introducing uh, uh, Bill and Hillary, and I'm going to do so by asking, show of hands, <laughs> who knows who Mervyn Kelly is? Mervyn Kelly was the longtime director of Bell Labs during most of the 20th century. He was the director, then president. He was there when uh, uh, the transistor was discovered during World War II. Really important guy. He was a great physicist. He got elevated to management and was the director. And once he was the director, he turned his scholarly lens to studying the operation of the institution. And it was his study of the institution that made Bell Labs much of what it was. In my mind, Bill Kovacic is the Mervyn Kelly of the FTC. He is a former, former commissioner and chairman, but he's also a student of the institutional design, history, operation, administrative law context of the agency. And I invented the transistor. And the inventor of, oh, you, you don't want to compare yourself to put it on the CV. Bill Shockey, different kind of guy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, right. So there's no one better uh, to be talking about adaptable platforms for platform regulation, the role of the FTC. I hand it off to you. Thank you, Gus, and uh, I'm most grateful to Christopher, your colleagues at the center, and the journal for the wonderful opportunity to participate in this program. It reminds me why I wanted to be an academic in the first place. So, so thank you very much. Here with Hillary, who is uh, my wonderful colleague for so many years at the FTC. Um, my, my presentation really focuses on who should do everything we've been talking about today. And the basic assumption is that uh, if you improve the framework for policy implementation, if you improve the infrastructure through which policy travels, you get better policy results. Uh, you can get something that looks like the bullet train going from Washington to New York instead of a fast, slow train and a slow, slow train. <laughs> <laughs> if you improve the infrastructure, you get better results. So this is about policy infrastructure. Uh, discussions about the future of the US regulatory framework for dealing with large platforms is focused on several options. Uh, one might be to create an entirely new institution. Uh, another is to take status quo institutions and use existing powers and indeed use them creatively. Uh, and last, you take the existing institutions with enhancements that may not be so dramatic as the enhancements that would be contemplated by a US DMA equivalent. And my focus here is on the Federal Trade Commission, which in so many ways has attractive features that would make it a natural home for some of the functions that one might be interested in pursuing here. Uh, just a bit about what lots of the modern literature identifies as ideal characteristics of the regulator of the future dealing with tech, but other dynamic sectors. Uh, it's got to have multidisciplinary skills, where it brings in the skills of technologists, computer scientists, people skilled in analytics, maybe perhaps too, sociologists, anthropologists who understand how the evolution of technology affects commerce and society, not simply the heavy reliance on lawyers and economists. It's going to be proficient in many policy domains because increasingly, certainly in tech, the interesting problems often involve an intersection, not simply of competition policy, but consumer policy and indeed data protection and privacy. Uh, it's got to have a research capacity, an R&D capacity to get in front of issues so that it understands the complexities of the sector, where they've been, where they're going, and how, because of that knowledge, to intervene more skillfully. 
the agencies should be agile and adaptable uh, because the sectors that are regulating are agile, very adaptable, very dynamic. The institutions have to be no less dynamic and agile themselves. And last, they're going to make policy using a variety of tools. Uh, they'll promulgate rules, they'll litigate cases, they'll issue reports, they'll convene events, they'll serve as policy advocates. So they'll have a variety of tools at their disposal. I'm going to look at the FTC as an example here. Uh, I'm going to focus on the original design and purpose of the agency, which in many respects anticipated these developments because similarly uh, remarkable developments were taking place in the late 19th century and early 20th century. To talk a bit about the evolution to the present, uh, strengths and weaknesses for the future, uh, in my point of view, I've spent almost 15 years working at the FTC. Uh, I do have a hearts and minds problem talking about this. Uh, I'm very strongly inclined to think that, of course, the agency has a long and promising future. Uh, my mind tells me, at, from times from my own experience, that the original vision hasn't been fully realized, although my heart tells me that with additional adjustments, uh, it would be just the right place to go for the future. So if you hear some schizophrenia uh, throughout the talk, your ears have not deceived you. Uh, uh, the 1914 original design is intriguing uh, because, again, What's taking place at this time, I, I think uh, in, 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 in Carl Shapiro's uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful co-authored volume, Information Rules, uh, did a nice job pointing out at the beginning of the book that the late 19th century and early 20th century were no less a source of upheaval than we see now. Uh, breakthroughs in transportation, airplane, better locomotive, steamships, uh, automobiles, uh, communications, radio, wireless, telephone, uh, moving pictures, uh, energy. Mr. Tesla, before he invented the automobile himself, uh, Mr. Tesla brings us uh, alternating current. All of these happen in a shockingly short period of time. And the effects of that combination of changes, again, was no less startling than anything we've observed, observed today. So Congress, in part, in 1914, says we need a special type of capability to address these developments and what were built in. Um, a highly scalable substantive mandate, that's Section 5 of the FTC Act, deliberately not tied to existing Sherman Act jurisprudence. Uh, a function that Dan Crane has so well called norms creation to be carried out through administrative adjudication. And very importantly, the FTC in its first decades, really not until the 1970s, has no independent litigating authority. If it's going to enforce the law and perform this function, it's going to do it almost exclusively through the litigation of administrative cases through its administrative system. And the trade-off would be you get broad power, exceptionally broad power, to declare new limitations on business behavior, but you're only going to apply it with forward-looking injunctions. No monetary relief. No suggestion that the power to issue equitable remedies would include structural relief, forward-looking remedies, relatively light-touch remedies, powerful capacity to establish substantive norms. The mechanism for applying this would be a multi-member board, which would be diversified in two key respects, not just political diversification, but substantive uh, uh, diversification. Uh, the legislative history is striking in looking at the expectations of the chief sponsors about who these board members would be. Yes, they would be lawyers, but yes, always economists. Always an economist. Footnote, how many FTC commissioners of the 100 plus have been economists since the creation of the agency in 1914? That would be five. That's not even one a decade. That's not even one every 20 years. Uh, that's not a great yet output. Uh, would they overwhelmingly be? Yes, we know. Uh, any engineers? None of those. What about business people? Only at the very beginning and not since. Uh, a couple of NBAs have stuck in uh, uh, here and there. Uh, in the modern tech era, a scientist? No. Lawyers, 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 and increasingly lawyers whose distinguishing professional characteristic is that they spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill either as a committee member or as a member of an individual, individual member, of, member of Congress. Uh, the diversification expectations have not been realized in a breathtaking way. If 
But that was supposed to be part of the expertise that would make the agency special. Uh, research and convening capability, to do studies that would inform the formulation of the norms creation process, studies that would guide Congress in deciding how to change statutes over time, and a convening capability to hold hearings that would provide a forum in which policy developments could be, could be discussed. Uh, last, the agency could very well develop as being the remedies agency. One section of the statute included a specific uh, measure that would allow courts to invite the FTC to serve as a master in chancery in shaping remedies in section Sherman Act Section 2 cases. Uh, what, would we, what would that mean? Well, Congress was concerned that district judges on their own were not necessarily in a good position to go about restructuring industries. Might feel a bit nervous about that, that the Department of Justice at the time had no dedicated antitrust division, was doing most of its work through the U.S. Attorney's offices, had a small group in the Washington headquarters of the department. The department was not well configured to perform that analytical role that the FTC would pitch in. Uh, here's a counterfactual. Uh, if you look at the remedial experience of antitrust enforcement, that is big antitrust data. Thousands of injunctions, a number of structural breakups, a number of merger enforcement matters, all sorts of experience that would be relevant in deciding what you would do in the next case by way of remedy. It's a vast amount of information that could be tapped. And you could imagine that had this remedies function been embraced and carried forward, the FTC would have become the mechanism for compiling information about past remedial experience and interpreting that experience. And it could have given very good advice to courts. Dan mentioned before one of the most grotesque unforced errors in the modern history of antitrust enforcement. That was the day, that wasn't a day, it was an hour and a half on remedies that Judge Jackson held in the trial. Judge Jackson hears the initial presentations and said, and the, one of the parties asked Microsoft said, well, when do we come back with our witnesses? He says, we're done. I contemplate no further proceedings. What should the government plaintiffs have done? Immediately, they should have been on their feet and said, can we approach the bench? And to approach them and say, you, at this moment, without a shadow of a doubt, are committing reversible error. And it's apparent in reading past cases that courts have said, if you're going to roll out the high-powered remedies, you must engage in some measure of consideration of evidence that bear on those. And that the government choked and didn't do that, afraid of making him mad, perhaps. Would he have changed his mind? Maybe not. But I think you could have gotten him by the throat, figuratively, and said, if you do this, you will have a greater chance of supporting your case. If you do not do this, it's coming back to you with a level of certainty that exceeds 100%. That could have been given as clear advice to how the remedial phase of the case was carried out. Uh, why that power was not mustered to approach the bench and say that is maybe not an awareness of how fatal an omission that would be. But that's where if you had an agency that had seen the perspective would have said, perhaps as an advisor, you've got to tell him to rethink this because otherwise reversal is a certainty. Uh, the dominant firm remedial experience that could have come from this would be better. I'm a, I'm a lot more sanguine about the history of structural relief than, than perhaps Herb was in his presentation. I think the experience is better than you might think. The standard oil experience in particular when you see the predictions of calamity that the parties offered at the time, uh, that it was going to be a complete disaster. It wasn't. Uh, the remedy works over time. Legislative breakups, such as the Public Utility Holding Company Act, the, the Killer Black Air Mail Act, and the experience in divestitures associated with mergers, reorganizations that don't implicate antitrust law, um, that experience is better than one thinks. And indeed, the patent licensing experience with AT&T in 1956, was a, which was a slow developing remedy, I, I guess the implication here is that Organizations progress by learning over time. And those that can draw on this experience and apply it in the next period, the next period, 
are going to be better off. There was a huge opportunity here to play this role. Uh, can I expect that the Department of Justice would have welcomed it? It certainly would not have. Would the federal courts have welcomed the participation of the commission? Maybe not. But this was part of the original scheme that could have been carried out. It didn't happen. It could still happen, but it would require somewhat of a repositioning of effort to make this a core of what the FTC did in the future. So historical trends when we come from 1914 uh, forward. Uh, scalability, yes. The mandate's been scalable in ways that were unexpected. Congress expected the FTC to only be an antitrust agency, but half of the FTC's cases in its first decade involved the following claim. Hillary is an honest merchant. I'm dishonest. I lie to my customers. Hillary comes to the FTC and says, he's lying. He's attracting trade by lying that imposes competitive injury on me and the rest of the economy. Tell him to stop. The FTC handled lots of those cases. That is what we would call today modern advertising regulation. The FTC becomes, in the blink of an eye, a consumer protection agency in a most unanticipated way. That becomes easily half of its work uh, over the course of its lifetime. Same thing happens with securities regulation in the, in the 20s. The privacy mandate is almost accidental as the FTC grows into the area. These are all policy domains that grow out of the original statutory grant and the addition of the unfair or deceptive acts or practices mandate in Wheeler Lee. A danger with the broad mandate is that it invites political intervention. One is the assumption you can solve every problem. Second, when you use the broad mandate in a bold ways, the unfortunate political feedback loop we have where affected companies bring money to bear on legislators to tell them to stop often results in legislators telling the agency to back off. So it's powerful in theory. It's subject to some powerful political constraints in practice. Uh, the FTC realized right away that bringing this case, the next case, the next case is inferior to having something that we would call today rulemaking authority. And the FTC tries to develop rulemaking equivalents through things like the trade practices conferences of the 20s and 30s to fit in the gap, and the realization that if you were going to be a robust consumer protection agency, you had to be able to get temporary restraining orders to freeze assets, you had to be able to disgorge ill-gotten gains, or your remedial and deterrent power would be, would be relatively weak. Um, Mentioned the expectations about, about the board's experience and, and background. Very effective application of the research function. The convening and research function, probably the largest enduring strength of the agency over time, and in so many ways, one of its greatest contributions to policy making. Um, and a diminishing importance of norms creation. Skeptical courts who never believed in Section 5 and shoved back. But the other, more important, the expansion of litigating authority to go directly to federal court, which the agency sought, which all of us who were there sought because it would make us more effective, had the consequence of moving more and more cases into federal district court. In Humphrey's executor in 1935, the Supreme Court says, well, what is the FTC? It's really a court because it does all of this administrative adjudication. It never goes to federal court except to defend appeals from administrative orders, and it gives advice to Congress. It is not a prosecutor. It doesn't prosecute. That's the executive function, and it's missing. It's easy to say that removal can only take place except for good cause. What does that litigation profile look like today? Gulp, administrative adjudication, is barely 10% of the litigation mandate of the agency. If the Supreme Court wants to come back on this in the context of the FTC, it can say, as it hinted in Seeley, you're not the Federal Trade Commission that we saw in 1935. You are fundamentally in the area of law enforcement. You're a prosecutor. So if we think of platform regulated, what's the good part? Great research and convening capability used very skillfully. It's a multi-purpose agency. You have the policy domains integrated by ownership. You don't have to contract out with other agencies. Uh, flexible mandates, still flexible and adaptable. CEG, the modern privacy function. Uh, and increasing attention in the agency to build the team that you need 
to do this multidisciplinary work well over time. All good trends. Uh, weaknesses. Uh, question mark more, how good is the policy integration across these three domains? As you know, bringing different capabilities under the same roof doesn't mean they're well integrated. I think there's been progress there, but these still tend, because of organizational historical reasons, to operate, uh, operate as independent, semi-autonomous uh, subsidiaries of the institution. Uh, the limits of administrative adjudication, uh, I suppose the greatest vulnerability is the vertical integration of functions. It's the combination of the prosecutorial function, the investigative function, the adjudication function in the same institution. Uh, we do it a lot in the United States, but I think we do it with a great deal of uneasiness. There are a lot of controls on that to diminish the possibility of confirmation bias, but generally speaking, if you ask most observers, and certainly most of our foreign observers who come to study here, do you trust this? The person who prosecutes, the body that prosecutes, ultimately will decide guilt or innocence. There's wariness about that. And that in particular might be an area where the courts are willing to bear down, not just on the FTC, but on other agencies. Uh, the limited remedies, the knockout of the equitable monetary relief decision in AMG Capital, the terrible blow. Uh, uncertain competition rulemaking power can be inferred in part from parts of the statute, uh, but the octane rating decision in 1973 is, uh, is, is a basis to argue question for all of us, will the Supreme Court take as generous a view today of the role of administrative rulemaking for competition as it did then? I'm not sure that's the way I would bet, unless I got really good odds. Um, and board diversification, it's not happening. Lawyers, 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 economists, occasional MBA, lawyers, lawyers, more lawyers, all from Capitol Hill. Okay, uh, decisions for the future. Uh, one is how much adju administrative adjudication really matters to the FTC. Uh, this is a short list of the uh, Section 2 type cases the FTC has done over the past decade. Qualcomm, Syngenta, Meta, and Amazon, what do they all have in common? Where they were not brought. They're all brought in federal court. If you go back to that original vision, why aren't you using your indigenous distinctive capability? Do you not trust it? What's wrong with it? The only question I'd say is that if a showdown ever came over the institutional design, and this used to keep us up awake, or not, awake a lot, is that where we're using this mechanism, if it seems that you are not using this vehicle, it might be taken away from you. And if you take away this function, do you need five people to decide to prosecute cases in federal district court? I doubt it. Um, where's the distinctive Section 5 agenda? Said to be very important, new policy statement. Cases that give effect to that, simply saying if you don't have an inventory of matters that is testing that authority, developing it even in humble initial ways, that's another one that's easy to take away. You start pulling these pillars out and the institutional structure starts to collapse. But compare Illumina Grail, what a fascinating case uh, in the area of sports, an upset of, of dramatic proportions. Uh, um, the defendants thought the Fifth Circuit was going to be the ideal venue to bury the Federal Trade Commission. I heard one of their advocates boast at an event in the fall about this is where the showdown was going to happen, and we proudly hold them to account. Um, I've rooted for the FTC in this case just to prove this person wrong, and it happened. Uh, uh, we see in the case uh, that the Fifth Circuit, this is the Jarkasi case, the Fifth Circuit dismisses all four of the constitutional objectives in a paragraph apiece in a very dismissive way that says, here's the argument, no, 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 no. Let's get to the substance. On the substance, very favorable view of the FTC, supported view of its assessment of the evidence, a supportive view of the use of the administrative adjudication process. The only glitch is the treatment of the fix on remedy, and this isn't good for the government agencies. This is the bad doctrine for the government that's kind of out of modern merger cases, which is that the fix goes into the assessment of competitive effects. Issues ahead, uh, can you get real integration? If there's a new privacy bill by the end of this century, and there might be, 
to supplement our existing privacy bill, which is called the GDPR, if we have one, uh, is, are we going to get to the point where there's a basic discussion about should that go in the FTC, should it keep the competition mandate? If a Humphreys executor dies, uh, what does that do just to the FTC or other administrative bodies? Will Congress expand the remedies, at least put part of what AMG took away back? Um, are there good justifications for the existing administrative process and the vertical integration? Uh, what about expanded DOJ and FTC joint policy making? Mm. New merger guidelines would be a good place to do that. To keep talking about this, not just go off in separate directions and do your own applications. Advisory role to the courts, the remedies agency. Is Chevron going to matter to the FTC uh, in the future? Will Congress rethink the board composition to give a different body there to the process? Some of these things, I think, could be, uh, could be, could be answered favorably. But it is faintly a moment of peril uh, for this framework of, of decision making. Although Illumina, quite fascinating way, shows that it's not destined necessarily to come out in a grim way for the agency. Because you wouldn't have bet that way when that case ended up in Texas. Thank you. Thank you. In a moment, I will ask uh, Professor Hillary Green to Illumina us a little bit with some comments about uh, your remarks. I want to, <laughs> I want to uh, briefly note, when it comes time for Q&A, we have many students in the room who are on the journal. I'm going to expect one of you to get the first question. No pressure, except for the pressure I just put on you. Uh, to comment, uh, we have Professor Hillary Green, uh, who is a longtime professor at the University of Connecticut. Uh, you did a stint at the FTC before you became an academic, and you are now back at the FTC in the Bureau of Competition as a, a policy advisor, or special counsel, I guess. Um, so to offer some uh, commentary, Professor Hillary Green. So it's a real pleasure to be here. In particular, I want to thank um, uh, Gus, Christopher, you, and to all the students for arranging such an amazing uh, symposium. It's an honor to be a part of it. Um, I begin with the disclaimer that the remarks are my own. I do not speak for the commission, the commissioner, or anybody who's important over there. Okay. Um, to quote former uh, Chairman Tim Muris, but I do think my dog might agree with me. So, <laughs> so I got someone on my side here. Um, but it's a particular pleasure for me to be commenting on paper written about the FTC, written by none other than Bill Kovacic. Um, as was mentioned, he was a chairman and a commissioner. Um, I would also harken back to his more humble beginnings. Um, when I was there, he was um, the general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission, and before that, he was a staff attorney, and I don't think he'd mind me saying so. Yep. Um, I think his encyclopedic um, insight into the agency, and I dare say love of the agency, stems from having seen it literally from top to bottom. Um, with that said, he describes it faintly as a moment of peril. And I had to keep craning my head to see not one, but two entire lists of issues ahead. So, okay, great, thanks, Bill. Um, good times. Um, in his usual encyclopedic, authoritative, and insightful way, Bill provides a narrative that brings to light the tensions and, of course, the hot button issues by grounding them in the agency's rich history. Given that Bill has laid out the broad sweep of the agency's creation, or the agency's history from creation through the modern era, what I'm gonna do in my time is to revisit some of the key themes that he brought up with an emphasis on some of the most recent activities the agency is currently engaging in, and also add perhaps some collective questions to the hopper, um, in addition to those that the students will be introduced. And are we allowed to cold call them? Is it <laughs> okay. I think, Noel, you're on tap. You're an award-winning paper writer person. Yeah. Um, so before we turn to the question of what additional authority the FTC might need, um, I would have began by emphasizing what we're already doing with platforms. And then you, know, you might think of something like this little old thing called the merger guideline. Um, um, we had a great session with Aviv, the uh, um, 
the head of the Bureau of Economics. Um, they contain a section on platforms. Um, briefly, when a merger involves a multi-sided platform, the agencies consider competition between platforms, competition on a platform, and competition to displace the platform. Period, footnote, with further questions, please see a B. Okay, moving right in long. Um, in terms of agency authority, the questions um, becomes, do the existing set of laws, antitrust and other laws relevant to platforms, do they provide enough authority for the regulators to effectively deal with the potential ills associated with big and perhaps even small platforms? These would include not only traditional competition concerns, data security, privacy, and consumer protection. Bill was focused on the foundational question. What will the agency be able to do with its bedrock competition mandate? Stated alternatively, will the FTC be scalable, to use Bill's term, to meet the potential competition challenges posed by digital platforms? So Bill reminds us that in the past, the FTC has what he called scalability realized. Okay? And that's in taking competition law and scaling it to deal with consumer protection and privacy. And then under the moniker of scalability constrained, he says that the courts are skeptical regarding this expansion of authority beyond the Sherman and Clayton Acts, and he also mentioned Congress pushing back against rulemaking, act rulemaking activities. Okay? I think we need a third category, which we might call scalability under construction. Okay, um, and this would encompass the efforts that are of more recent vintage. Those currently being engaged in where we might consider what is their long-term fate. Okay, it's arguably less certain. Will they stick? While not specifically addressed to platforms, I want to flag some important developments over just the last year and a half. First, we have the withdrawal and then the replacement of the unfair methods of competition statement, the Section 5 statement. Okay. The commission, present commission, withdrew the 2015 statement that limited the application of unfair methods of competition authority under Section 5 to the Sherman Act Rule of Reason test. Okay. In 2022, the commission issued a new policy statement that interpreted it in the provision in a way that it provided flexible and open-ended power to prevent unfair methods of competition. The two questions it asks are, is the, method, is the conduct a method of competition? And if so, is it unfair? The policy statement emphasized the Supreme Court's recognition of the agency's unique Section 5 authority and the deference that should be accorded to the commission determinations of UMC. I think Bill might broadly agree with that statement regarding Supreme Court precedent, but at the same time, he obviously emphasizes quite rightly um, when he makes his point about judicial skepticism, that there are also relatively few litigated cases in which the FTC has won that rely solely on the use of this additional reach of Section 5. The second um, activity is the agency has then received, um, entered into consents regarding employee non-compete um, non agreements that's based on its Section 5 authority. And thirdly, the FTC has a proposed rule to ban employers from imposing non-compete clauses on their workers. This rule is, is still in uh, the sort of the interim phase. There's a notice of public rulemaking that is ongoing. Um, Non-competes were preliminarily found to be unfair <coughs> methods of competition that can harm workers, pose burdens on the economy, have adverse effects on innovation, entrepreneurship, and business formation. Given that 20% of the American employees work under these non-competes, addressing this problem with a rule rather than through individual cases appeared to make sense in terms of clarity, predictability, administration, and efficiency of enforcement. In pursuing this approach, the agency sought to reclaim its full authority. What kind of reactions are to be had, particularly when the non-compete rule is finalized? I will leave that to others uh, to opine on. The scalability issue of Section 5 is not just a legal but also a political issue. At a time of shifting sentiment with regard to competition policy, political reactions may vary. Um, Bill talked about, among other things, the political feedback group generally. He also sensibly stressed the legislative branch. And what I want to do is to just briefly fl uh, flag for everybody the executive branch and how they fit in here. Specifically, the Biden administration's um, 2021 executive order 
on promoting competition in the American economy, two aspects are particularly noteworthy. First, the EO tackled various aspects of big tech platforms in which the dominant firms were undermining competition and reducing innovation. They wanted focus on that. And those included big tech platforms purchasing would-be competitors and big tech platforms gathering too much personal information. And second, the executive order also encouraged the FTC to establish rules barring uh, unfair methods of competition on internet marketplaces. The premise of the executive order is what they call that whole of government approach to promoting competition. Well, the FTC brings a whole of commission approach to its own mandate by incorporating competition, consumer protection, privacy, and data security missions all in-house. And because of that, the agency is well situated to be a primary in this agency dealing with platform problems. One of the ways that the FTC is navigating this complex role is through the creation of a new office that touches upon all those dimensions. And this, I think, goes to Bill's um, important discussion about the uh, need for multi multidisciplinary skills. Okay? While usually no one except those working in the agency, and Bill Kovacic, um, uh, really cares about organizational change, this should be an exception. Uh, the Office of Technology is an important advance that bears directly on the integration issues and challenges associated with digital platforms. As Chair Khan observed, the FTC has perennially worked to keep pace with new markets and ever-changing technologies by building internal expertise. Our Office of Technology is a natural next step. And if you'll excuse me for digressing, I'm thinking when I was at the FTC um, uh, when you were at GC, we had one exceptional account attorney, Suzanne Michelle, and there would be a line out of her office to go and chat with her about things. And, and there was I think it was one too. <laughs> it was, we 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 would taste Suzanne's food before she ate and escort her across the street. Uh, she was uh, she was our our patent person. She was, yeah. and um, I would actually my trick was I would bring Cammy with me when yes. I to ask her, yeah. you know, all of the tough questions. Yeah. Um, but with that said, this Office of Technology, which has recently been created, has already hired about a dozen technologists with substantive expertise across security, software engineering, data science, AI, and relevant social science research, um, other social science areas. The organization fits within Kovacic's notion of agency capacity. Whether the agency has the resources, including the human resources, to fulfill its responsibilities. But taking a step back into the social science can be understood from an organizational learning angle as increasing what Wes Cohen and Dan Leventhal call absorptive capacity. This refers to the idea that an organization's internal routines and expertise allow it to better absorb knowledge from the outside, from outside the organization. So if we apply that here, the technologists enable the agency to better identify and use outside knowledge. Now, another important advantage of the FTC is its unique study function, which Bill also referred to as R&D capacity. The study function is of enormous importance, especially when you're looking forward to new and emerging marketplaces and technologies. It allows the agency to learn in a self-directed, reflective way, doing spade work about an area. The study function is an organizational capacity that also feeds back and improves the FTC's absorptive capacity. Okay? The agency, as Bill said, has a long history of using this to understand key areas of interest. With respect to digital platforms, the FTC has previously conducted a 6B study on tech platforms. This summer, they had an, FT they had an RFI encompassing competition, security, single points of failure. And um, in cloud computing, just last month, there were AI hearings, and we embarked on a 6B study on generative AI investments and partnerships. And so let me close with a couple questions and a couple observations. As an independent agency, the FTC is a creature of Congress, and it has a very broad mandate to do many things, most of which, hopefully, Congress likes. But what institutional guardrails are in place so that if the FTC were to assert its authority under Section 5 to tackle some of these issues, it can act with confidence that it's moving in the right direction? Also, a strong potential argument as discussed for giving FTC primary responsibilities with regard to digital platforms, 
as Bill obviously mentioned, is that you have lots of capacities, uh, capabilities under one roof, the competition, privacy, consumer protection, et cetera. Um, Bill's recounting of the history of successful policy intervention or integration between different domains of the FTC is, how shall I put it, not entirely reassuring. Okay, if policy integration is comparatively rare, as Bill seems to indicate, does this reflect a problem with the organization? What about the structure of the FTC has not been conducive to effective organization? Or perhaps the explanation lies in the policy issues themselves. That is, the vast majority of the problems faced by the FTC in the consumer protection competition areas have limited scope for valuable integration, and therefore, we have not seen it. Maybe to answer that last question, it would be good to have examples of where policy integration would have been happened, would have been valuable, but it did not occur. If, it, if um, it is the nature of the past policy issues and not some organizational impediments, then one can expect to reap the benefits of policy integration if it becomes a policy regulator of digital platforms. What organizational innovation is needed? And just in terms of observations, I'm going to throw out a grab bag of random things that I've, I've, I've heard during the exceptional panels earlier today. Um, I've seen this movie before. Footnote, Mr. Yu. Um, radical uncertainty. Um, that comes from many folks. I think today's sessions have been a veritable thesaurus for the use of what it is when it comes to uncertainty. Um, how do we balance this notion of we've sort of been there and seen certain aspects of these things over before, but then we have these new things, including technologies thrown into the mix. We've seen calls for caution from Hovenkamp, among others. But then there's also some intensity of need to um, focus on things that are, are happening now that are important to address. Um, and last but not least, I want to um, uh, reference Dan comment that AI magnifies all of these issues. Okay, What we're talking about here is taking AI and stir it into the, the, the discussion about everything. Um, what are the practical consequences of AI? What are the political consequences of AI? How does AI interact with digital platforms given the importance of data and compute power as foundational aspects of AI? Those are all things that I, I hope we can collectively think about going forward. Um, it looks, it will be great to hear your questions, including the students. Thank you. My sincere thanks to both of you. That was such a rich discussion. I'm going to shut up so that we can turn to your questions. As I said before, do we have any questions from students to kick things off? This is the Phil Weiser Silicon Flatirons trick. Yes. And I also will do the professorial, I'll sit here quietly, awkwardly, <laughs> until someone puts their hand up for it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, um, I guess you touched a little bit about Chevron, but I was curious how important or how, how much do you think that the FTC is going to rely on Skidmore deference and the power to persuade case by case deference after if Chevron's taken off? Uh, my advice when I was general counsel and uh, worked with Hillary in the, in the GC's office was to the board was never assume that Chevron is going to help you. Uh, I, 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 my view is that the difference comes from doing a good job in the first place. That is focusing foremost on having a good theory of harm, assembling good evidence and presenting it in a skillful way. That if you do those things, the difference will come your way. The uh, courts will recite the favorable formulas and bless what you've done. If you don't do those things, they'll start by reciting the deference formula, but then say that deference is not unbounded, uh, and then you then you lose. Uh, so I, I I've, I've always thought it was a, a bit of a, a distraction. Uh, maybe maybe the discussion of Chevron masks the extent to which agencies did in the past get deference when they did good work in that manner and showed that work in a, in a, in a convincing way. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, Chevron may not matter. One footnote, if Chevron means a fundamental uh, distrust of broad grants of discretion and agency discretion, then the flexible, scalable mandates uh, that we've been talking about perhaps are endangered under a non-delegation theory later on. Uh, if Chevron goes, how far our journey is it? 
to look at unfair methods of competition and say, Congress can't delegate to you the authority basically to change the law. I, I see that as a potential trap, but uh, for the commission, I always, I always thought that the essence of deference is convincing the court in the first case that you have done good work and you've supported your theories well. Uh, then the love falls out of the sky and, uh, and, and you win. Uh, if you don't do that, no amount of mandated deference by doctrine is going to help you. So I always told the board, act as though it's not there. That's why I was only general counsel for three and a half years. <laughs> I'll briefly note, um, we started a couple minutes late for this panel, so I think we can go till five after. So we have just under 15 minutes. I saw a question in the back. Yeah. So one proposal I've heard related to the more modern need for digital, for the FTC to look at the digital enforcement is to have a self-regulatory board that's kind of maybe overseen by the FTC but might, come up, might try to overcome the diversification problem you're referring to, where you have people from both the private sector and the public sector as part of this regulatory board working together uh, to try to try to have some kind of response to the dynamic markets uh, that are going to be a factor in the digital space. Is that something that you consider as a potential alternative uh, to the, I think, office technology that we've heard today, or would that be a viable uh, option? It, it would, the Office of Technology, as Hillary was describing, I think it's indispensable for the agency to do good work in this area, and that's an enormously positive development. That will help inform the agency's judgments. Um, I think the agency can usefully take account of its own experience and that of other countries using advisory, self-regulatory mechanisms of this kind. The Better, bureau, the be, the better Business Bureau non-government organization mechanism for advertising regulation is indispensable to the execution of the advertising regime and the commission's collaboration with the BBB in developing the application of advertising principles has been enormously successful. That's a model we're studying. Uh, I, think, I, think it, I think it can, um, it can be effective. Framing the advisory committee and forming it can run into a federal advisory committee act problem in how you constitute the organization and define what its role is. Uh, but uh, I think that's, that's worth pursuing. I, uh, in my nine years as an outside director with the Competition and Markets Authority, I was struck at how much it was using these kinds of techniques experimentally to find better ways to identify uh, uh, through the use of uh, the privacy sandbox mechanism to, uh, to come up with uh, alternatives to regulation. Testing prototypes to see what might be rolled out on a larger scale uh, uh, in, in other settings. And it, and, it, and it helps very much in exactly the respect you said. It helps you bring in the expertise uh, from the outside, draw upon it to understand what's taking place in the sector. That's a long way of saying yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for the presentation and the uh, thoughtful comments. My question is, OK, if you can snap uh, your fingers and create the perfect antitrust agency, what uh, it uh, would look like? Like the FTC, the DOJ, or do you have uh, a role model of agency in another country, another country? Yeah, whatever it is, I think I'd be the chair. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the starting point, and all kinds of good things would follow from that. Um, I, I think a board, uh, along the lines of the board framework that regulators use in the United Kingdom, would be, would be very attractive. That is a board of directors in the true sense of a board as an advisory strategy setting body. They don't vote on individual matters, but they provide guidance on the overall direction of the agency. And in doing it, they have academics, they have people with business backgrounds, they have consumer advocates. They, God forbid, will bring in citizens from outside the United Kingdom to sit uh, in those deliberations. So I, that, that uh, though a single board meeting at the CMA, given the quality of the discussion, was worth a year's worth of board meetings uh, at the Federal Trade Commission in terms of in terms of the the board performing a function that was truly deliberative and informative going ahead. So I would use that mechanism. 
I would probably also, uh, I would abandon the controls or mitigate the controls in the Government of the Sunshine Act, which keeps U.S. boards from collaborating more spontaneously on individual policy matters. If you have a quorum of the board meeting, you have to notice the meeting, you can close some of those meetings, but, but imagine a system in which uh, the FTC board, in effect, cannot meet weekly to discuss what they've learned the week before and, and, and where policy should be going ahead in the future. Uh, if you wanted to disable the U.S. administrative process, I'd create something like the Government of the Sunshine Act. Um, uh, I, I, see, I see real possibilities for the continuation of the administrative mechanism, but I'm struck at how every other major jurisdiction I know around the world disaggregates the functions by not allowing all of them to reside in the same, in the, in the same group. And I think the pursuit of some form of unbundling in that way, which may mean separate appointment and confirmation of bureau directors or, an, an, or a or a, a, a chief executive who'd be responsible for that function might be essential to get out from underneath the cloud of concern about confirmation bias when you put all of them in the same uh, in the same basket. I'll, I'll ask a, provo a provocation follow-up. What about removing merger enforcement and other enforcement authority to the DOJ and letting the FTC retain its investigation and rulemaking? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting swap. I mean, uh, I, I, I do think I do, there's going to be a showdown on the merger review framework. The ICFIA case that, uh, that, uh, that Aviv mentioned before, in many ways, is great for the FTC. There's an awkward element where the court says the 13B provision really means something for the FTC. It means the FTC gets a somewhat less demanding burden to get the preliminary injunction for the sake of sending the matter back to the commission for administrative adjudication. It makes clear that it counts for something and that it is a lesser burden. How sustainable is it in a country to have a single overarching mer merger review process where you can get notably different results depending upon which agency you go to? I don't think that's sustainable. You can cure that by telling the FTC you either go to federal court and stay there or you go to the administrative process and stay there. I'd, I'd rather, rather continue, continue that framework, but um, I, could, I could consider, um, um, I guess the basic question is, do you want to revert to the Dan Crane norms creation function, first and foremost, which means that you don't get the big remedies, you don't get some of the other immediate visible events, but you shape doctrine over time because you think you can do that? Uh, do you want to enhance uh, the Section 5 mechanism to have a markets regime of the kind the United Kingdom has that allows the imposition of remedies without regard to a violation of the existing antitrust laws upon proof that the behavior in question, the, uh, the market structure in question, suppresses competition. So you'd, you'd swap out something like Section 5 and you'd take this markets regime. Um, these are other, these are other options, uh, options as well. Okay. Um, so uh, I just want to remind people, sort of preview the end of the, um, the session. You can take away merger authority from the FTC, but there are still the states, just to remind you. Okay. So, um, uh, this is sort of a variant on your question, which is uh, what I, I actually don't understand. It seems to me um, there's an obvious train wreck coming for the FTC. I mean, the Lumina Grail was wonderful, but, you know, the FTC said until the Supreme Court overrules Humphrey's executor, we can't. And so they could rely that way. But um, if, if the Supreme Court's really coming for the administrative state, the FTC is in big trouble. And my question really is, um, is Congress, is anybody thinking about fixing this now? You had the template of you know, how the CMA is organized. Um, it seems to me a lot of their problems are fixable by statute. <laughs> of course, it assumes that Congress can move to do anything. But I don't even see proposals. And, and this sort of... And Harry, I think the proposals are things like the Smarter Act, which uh, 
Well, travel in reverse in some ways. Yes. Well, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a good name for it. Uh, but um, but do you see any uh, any movement from um, people who think the FTC could take on and should have more of a role over platforms or should continue its role to try to fix some of these institutional problems so that it can do them? I see interest in piecemeal measures like repairing the AMG hole on remedies, right. interest in uh, perhaps uh, making the administrative process more robust by perhaps changing the ALJ framework to perhaps use panels of the kind that you have in the United Kingdom where you have part-time members, you'll have, a, you'll have a panel of three, an economist, a lawyer, and a, another, another professional on the panel. Uh, but I, I, I don't see a great deal of interest in the, in the larger structural questions going ahead about deciding exactly what the, what the platform of regulation should look like, because I think that scene is just so completely boring and uninteresting. That is, that's dull. Uh, and, and who cares? Uh, though, and, and in our U.S. style, they will wait until the train derails. <laughs> then we'll look. Uh, that's... That's the event that will provide the exhaustion and shock to, to come back on the institutional issues uh, about what to do and what to do and how to how to do them. I I'm struck at how often uh, you know in the you, you recall the debates before that came up where people like John Conyers uh, were starting to climb up on the barricades to go after the the dual enforcement structure um, that uh, there are there are moments where you get impulses left and right. That, that look at the framework. And, and in a showdown over dual enforcement, um, it, it's going to go to the department. Because of the criminal function, I mean, they've got, they have a, an assembly line there that can't be moved. Uh, uh, that's where things go. And if it does, these research functions that I, that I love and that Hillary describes so well, that, that policy analysis function, that will disappear. You won't have 6B studies, that will be gone. Uh, you won't have the convening function. It won't happen. Uh, that'll go away. That would be a real loss, uh, I think, in our system if that disappeared. Time for one final question. If there is no final question, we have Christopher. First of all, is the intractable problem solving? This, the, in all the commissions I know, the advent of hill types has been one of the most distinctive changes. We used to have a lot of them no litigation experience in the space at all. It's just, and of all the things, we could hire you know, different experts, but at the commission level, that's political. You've identified the problem, any fix? <laughs> and there was, a, the, I guess, the, the biggest effort to grab Congress by the lapels and shake them on this was a study that Congress convened in the 1970s. Uh, um, uh, Kramer is one of the lead articles. It looked at the major economic regulatory commissions with a big chapter, and it was a damning assessment. Uh, and the, the recurring theme was you've had no professional diversification, very little, and you've, uh, you've become uh, a, a, a painfully predictable outlet for political patronage, where, where appointments go to failed seekers of higher office, uh, to committee aides, to committee staffers, um, and I guess from the point of view of legislators, they say, these are people we trust. And I think it was during our, you know, Hillary used the right word, um, independent agency in English. Independent is such an ill-suited term. We need, we need a better one. Uh, because independence in the eyes of Congress is not from them. It's from the other end of the avenue. It's not from them. And you're, and you're asked when you sit at the table for your confirmation, uh, hey, Kovacic, do you realize that you are a creature of Congress? Or arm, creature or arm, creature or arm. Uh, the wrong answer is to say, I'm independent. The reason you set this up is that I wouldn't be subject to political interference or pressure from people like you. So I'm absolutely not an arm of Congress. I'm an independent decision maker. If that's your answer, they'll say, we're going to take a pause in the hearing. Why don't you go outside and think about this for a while? And I'm going to ask you the same question in 10 minutes. Uh, and the right answer is, with great clarity, sir, I am a creature of Congress. Uh, uh, and, and that is, you go through 
all of the legislative confirmation proceedings, that question will be asked. And nobody who's answered anything other than yes, I get it, has been able to go through the process. So uh, they want mechanisms that ensure that fidelity. They want the flow of information that makes it really hard to look outside the field of vision. But uh, you can stack up all of the Blue Ribbon commission and Commissions and Panels that have looked at those appointment patterns and you've asked FTC, how about one economist all the time? Just one, not five, but I want one. Uh, I'd like to have in the modern era on digital, I'd like one computer scientist. How about an engineer? Just one. You can pack the lawyers on as you want. That's great, but how about one? Let's expand the field of vision. And I think, I think another way to do it is to, I mean, you, could, you can say, go back and read all of this, and it's all painful. But the other is to say, here are other jurisdictions that do this well. And I look at the board of the CMA, I look at the outside directors, which is the real, real measure, six of them. Uh, that felt invigorating every single month when you went to those meetings and you sat there and you thought to yourself, I'm learning a lot and I'd really better be prepared at the top of the game to engage in that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an exceptional experience. And there were lucid intervals in my time at the FTC. Uh, but, but so often I thought that five commissioners was four too many. And uh, <laughs> I'm just not, uh, because, because the discussions were not, the discussions, Yes, when I was chairman. <laughs> um, it's not the accounting where you are. <laughs> I was, I, 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 I had a legacy appointment, so I was there for good. It was just a question of how, when the others would leave. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the real, I think the real, the real sober-minded test is how, how, and why is that so important? It's crucial in going into court, I think, where you say, here's the expert body. It's crucial in giving them the sense that you do have this expertise brought to bear. Everything the agency does and the way it's organized, its appointments, the documents it issues, that hedgehog paper that probably Aviv might be writing at some point later on to lay out. Every speech, document, report, study that you point out issue is a way that you build the brand. You're either going to increase reputational capital or you're going to diminish it. Uh, so. The way to think of this is how is this appointment, how is this action going to put us in the position so that when you stand at the podium in front of ultimately the nine or the three and say, I represent the Federal Trade Commission, that's going to make them nod and say, these guys know what they're talking about. Or legislatures say, well, this is kind of edgy, but these are the experts, they know what they're doing. Uh, if you're not doing that all the time, you're traveling in reverse. On that note, Bill, you might be a swamp preacher, but we believe that you know what you're talking about. Thank you for sharing you. your time with us. Market. The word for this, the second word for this uh, CLE session is market. We are done with this session. We will be back five minutes. in five minutes. So we will be starting at the quarter hour. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, being with us on such a fantastic day. Um, as joking, yeah, the states always seem to go last. That's not because they're not important. And as we find out the discussions, depending on how the legislative space goes on the federal line, they may be the, as we found out in privacy, they may be the most important actors. Uh, and, and Lord knows that we know that it's not like the states are going to give up on any trust anytime soon. It's quite the opposite. They're getting more and more active and more interested. Anyway. Um, my job is then to say that our last, first, the first word for our last session for CLE is professor. <laughs> and with that, I turn it over to a, a great person to moderate this panel, Michael Kerr. Well, thank you, Christopher. This is the final panel on a fascinating day. What a wonderful way to bring everything together. So we talked about five things today. And the first was institutions. When we think about the FTC, that is certainly relevant to states when we think about institutions. The second and third digital competition and curation, that dealt with substance. That's certainly on the table here. Fourth, how do we prove it? That's markets. And fifth, remedy. So a lot of the stuff that we talked about all day long, we can take this state lens and look at it. And so we are fortunate 
to have a wonderful paper from Professor Babat Foliet, who introduces so much of what is going on with the states today. Uh, Babette talks about different types of divergence, procedural divergence between the states and federal government, venue divergence, which is a new development, and substantive divergence, which could even become more. And she also talks about new state competition law proposals, which could bring about changes, like maybe even abuse of dominance standard that we haven't really seen in the US. So in this really interesting time of antitrust today, it's worthwhile to take a step back and think about what the states can do from a procedural, substantive, and venue level. And without further ado, Professor Bolia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christopher, for the invitation, and thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, yes, uh, we often forget that states are a participant in our antitrust uh, world. Uh, even people like myself, who didn't really think about it until I was invited to be on the California Law Revision Commission, and. Uh, because I was the only one who did not step back fast enough, uh, became the leader of the tech uh, platforms uh, inquiry of that commission. Uh, so it's that revved up my interest once again. That's right, states are part of this. Uh, very much contemplated, in fact, by our antitrust laws of, as part of the great um, uh, work of the Sherman Act and then later the Clayton Act, to make sure that whatever policies that we have at that federal level are enforced, whether it be by the DOJ or the FTC, uh, or if they fall flat or don't have enough funding, et cetera, that there will be someone else, uh, maybe closer to the ground evidentiary-wise, maybe with greater resources, the attorney generals. They can come in and they have statutory standing to bring and enforce those federal antitrust laws. And then as you who have studied antitrust know, famously, uh, US law allows private plaintiffs to also bring a case, uh, withstanding, uh, again, given by the Clayton Act, that they can bring and enforce the federal laws. So the policies in that sort of world are indeed set sort of federal level. It uh, goes through the federal district courts, et cetera, and then we set precedent, but the plaintiffs are from the states. The plaintiffs could be the attorney generals. The plaintiffs could be residents of one state, maybe combining with other states. I think that's an interesting mix, uh, and it's a, been a very much part of our enforcement story, and in fact, uh, as you might imagine, Plaintiff's Bar has been very active, and that's been important in, in the design of remedies that the Sh but Sherman Act and uh, Clayton Act enforcement, we can have trouble damages for our private plaintiffs, giving them that huge carrot to come and get it, uh, to, uh, to bear the costs of antitrust litigation, which can be quite high, as we know. So that's been very much part of instituting and bringing forward whatever we decide at the federal level. So we have these great discussions about policy, and we have these great discussions about where we should go, and we're revamping mer merger guidelines and spending two years on that, et cetera. And all of that can be enforced, of course, by the attorney generals and private plaintiffs, as so too can state antitrust law. So that makes it very interesting as well. Because what happens is, of course, states can write their own law. So states are not just mere enforcers of the federal decision-making process. They are independent innovators in the antitrust space. And it's easy for that to have great force. And that can come about two ways is remember where we are in a litigation. What you have already is you can have the attorney generals come forward and they can bring their case. But what do they bring along with them? Well, I like to always cite as much as possible the best movie ever made. 
Galaxy Quest. And then, you, yeah, thank you. Pretty thank choice. you. So, right? So, sorry. Never right give time. up, never so, stop. Amen, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So in Galaxy Quest, you know, they get really close and they have the meteors falling right by them because they're that close to it. That's exactly what all the state uh, claims are. I, uh, uh, so you have these state antitrust laws, but you have the state AGs who can bring the claims of the federal laws. So what does a good state attorney do? Brings them both. What does a private plaintiff do? Brings them both. Of course they do. It would be foolish not to. So uh, in looking at where we have um, I, um, uh, sort of this ecosystem of both state and federal laws, uh, it's really interesting to think about sort of the jurisprudence that's being built up there and whether or not those state claims could somehow you know, move antitrust policy in such a way to disrupt whatever this federal uh, um, balancing act that we've been doing. When could state laws actually have greater impact? Um, and that is where they're going to diverge. Well, think about it again. You got your state AG, they're going out there and they got their state claims. Now the state claims from the same conduct, remember that's what's going on. I'm bringing this claim because I am saying that this is anti-competitive conduct. So if the federal law and the state law are harmonized, they're the same, then we're not going to see much difference. It just might give a different angle or, or capture at the margin something that uh, could not be had, or if uh, other state claims might be lost, and uh, et cetera, but others, um, uh, again, you have multi-state, so one state claim might go out, another state claim might stay in. Uh, so an interesting mix there. But where it really gets interesting is when it's divergent, right? When, when again, another great movie series. Uh, so when you have this divergence, whether it's procedurally or uh, substantively, then we're starting to get maybe some, some interesting uh, movement in antitrust law that we're not talking about at the federal level. And so that started to intrigue me. And uh, going through um, uh, all the data bases, which have their own flaws, uh, just looking at cases, I, just, I didn't want to really delve too much into the literature, but really just see what cases were. What are AGs doing? I, I hadn't seen that. And AGs always do exactly this. They bring the case with the state claims. And that was interesting to me because who's winning on that state claims? Usually what's happening is what's moving forward is the federal claim. So even though it's brought on the state claim, uh, the, as well as federal claim, uh, the federal claim and the state claim are so linked, so harmonized, that the state claim rises and falls with the federal claim. And so that's what we get in the district court. Uh, but interesting things have already arisen uh, with the AGs and private plaintiffs, especially with private plaintiffs, is that you'll have even procedural differences which are permitted. Now, if you've been in antitrust for about 10 minutes, you know there, there's differences in standing claims often between uh, the uh, federal laws, which famously is Illinois BRIC, uh, only allows uh, direct purchasers uh, to have standing to bring private plaintiff claims. Uh, but as the court left open under another case, Arkansas America, that you could have indirect purchasers come and bring a claim if you so wish. 26 states so wish. So we have quite a few states who allow indirect purchaser claims. Well, in a, so we have a lot of divergence already. So what happens in a multi district litigation when you might have these state claims with this indirect purchasers, and, but you only have uh, federal claims with the direct purchasers? Already what happens, you have this mix of plaintiffs that would not be the same if it was without uh, those state claims. So already you're having this mix and uh, that deals with how you're going to deal with those um, 
concerns, whether certain things have to go back to the states, et cetera. And that has exhausted my civil procedure uh, knowledge for the moment. <laughs> I actually talked about some of these procedure moments with my fellow professor who teaches CIPRO. And uh, he said, oh, no, that's advanced civil procedure. I don't teach that. Uh, <laughs> so so it's, the, it's, the, it's the mix of this multi-district um, um, uh, cacophony, if you will, when you already have something that is a distinction among the plaintiffs uh, being uh, charging a defendant based on the same conduct. So again, remember, it's the same defendant, same conduct, but different plaintiff makes all the difference. Uh, so already we have sort of that mix, and we have different procedural elements. Now, the, one of the rationales of the Supreme Court in Illinois Brick that was for, further articulated in Associates uh, General Contractors, did I say that one right? Let's get that because I'm wrong. So it's, um, uh, that has come to be known as AGC, um, AGC standing. So that's what the court is looking for. And they're often finding that no, uh, some of the state claims don't need that kind of standing, and, uh, but will still remain in the case because of the development of supplemental uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so you still have a mix of different plaintiffs in the same case looking at the same conduct. So we, in a way, we have figured it out uh, because Illinois Brick was very concerned, Associate General Contractors, very concerned that we be efficient about this, that we get uh, antitrust enforcement um, maximized in the most efficient way possible, that you get the right defendant to bring it, who's going to be able to prove that they had an injury, who's going to be able to uh, uh, get the remedy of the threefold um, uh, injury. And so that, that was one, some of the rationales of why the Supreme Court wanted Illinois for a direct purchaser. But the states have made different decisions. They've made different decisions. And the concern, too, was that would be inefficient. I'm an economist. I love efficiency. Uh, because it would uh, uh, add to pretrial costs. But, but they've already worked that out. They've done it with a lot of contracting. Uh, pre-trial contracting, et cetera. So it doesn't seem to be crazy um, uh, as far as uh, having been managed. So, so already we have procedural distinction. We've, we've kind of dealt it and seen it for a while. And in the case law, it was interesting. It's messy. It's horrifically messy. Uh, but it seems to have worked in many places. We also now have a new entrant with, uh, it's called the Venue Act. Um, and the Venue Act allows uh, attorney generals for the first time to resist uh, the judicial panel on multi-district litigation deciding for them where their case is going to be consolidated or removed. So for example, if the AG of California wants to bring a case in the Northern District of California where most of the tech you know, platform cases seem to have been uh, uh, heard, that they can, and uh, he or she can keep it there. They will not, uh, defendant will not be able to remove it and consolidate it. Uh, so it gives the power to the state AGs, uh, the same power that the DOJ and FTC have had for many years. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see. Uh, that might add to a little more efficiency on the state claim because you can take your uh, case with your California state claims to that California uh, district court and have it heard there. Uh, it also just might be faster because you're not dealing with all the complexities. Uh, so that's an interesting development that um, uh, might still help with efficiency, but it also might help with encouraging state claims uh, because it will be more efficient and the court arguably will be able to exercise uh, their supplemental jurisdiction with greater knowledge. Uh, so those are a couple things on the enforcement side I just wanted to, to bring to light. Uh, what, what is perhaps most intriguing right now is it seems we're starting to have divergence in the substance of the antitrust laws. And I am jet, I'm going to use any, the term antitrust laws very generally. I'm going to use it to mean those types of laws that you bring for the same kind of conduct. 
so that sometimes uh, under the state uh, unfair competition laws, uh, sort of equivalents of section, um, uh, FTC Act Section 5, et cetera. Uh, so I, I'm, I know I'm being overly broad by saying antitrust laws, but this is how a lawyer would bring them. They bring them because it's the same, same concerns, uh, same uh, conducts that often would be captured by the Sherman Act Section 1, Section 2. So first of all, divergent in substance is interesting because we've actually had quite a bit of harmonization of the laws by statute or state common law. They want the, uh, the laws to be harmonized with the federal laws. Uh, that gives some power, obviously, is that you have a sense of what will be uh, prohibited uh, behavior or not. There's a lot of efficiency with that. Uh, but we're starting to see a divergence in this moment and some more experimentation for many of the same reasons that we've been hearing that there's a movement to change federal policy and law. Uh, so for example, already we have some divergence. California actually has the Cartwright um, Act, which is our Sherman Act. And it is uh, interesting because it's Sherman Act Section 1 only. So it doesn't even have a Sherman Act Section 2. Uh, so that's an example of a state antitrust law which is um, uh, more restrictive than the federal law. So obviously, attorney general, uh, private plaintiff, uh, would use the Sherman Act in that case. Another example is Pennsylvania, shout out, uh, that they have uh, unfair competition law and theirs, unlike the FTC Act, requires a showing of deception and fraudulent uh, behavior. Um, uh, so a little more restrictive than you would get at the federal level. But what's really interesting for us, I think, is something which is more expansive than federal law and what that impact would be. Um, and so there are two states that are actively considering uh, some changes, and uh, that would be New York and California, which are two very interesting states to consider antitrust uh, changes, especially in the world of tech. Now, one, one more thing I got to do, uh, I, I do want to mention that California, um, its laws, they're very proud that Cartwright Act has been, uh, the, the courts have been a little schizophrenic in that they all say Cartwright Act is only section one and has to be like section one, or sometimes no, the Cartwright Act is more expansive than the federal laws and can capture everything else. Well, I'll tell you one thing, which is arguably more expansive than the federal laws, at least to the level of proof that will be needed, and that is arguably um, California's unfair competition law, which in our um, in a recent case you may have heard of, which is Epic Games v. Apple. Um, the only man left standing, as far as a uh, law which found uh, Apple's behavior. Um, uh, violative was California Uniform uh, Unfair Competition Law. And under that law, even after the Sherman Act claims were dismissed, uh, under that law, the court ordered a nationwide uh, injunction against uh, prohibiting Apple from enforcing its anti-steering provision in its developer's uh, contract. Remember, that's the, you can't, um, uh, Epic, you can't notify your consumers that there's another place to buy cheaper in-app purchases. Uh, so that uh, is known as a steering, and there's an anti-steering provision that was knocked down under California law. You're welcome. Uh, so, uh, but that's a sign that already the law that exists, there are, there are moments of divergence that can have nationwide impact. Then, what we're talking about now in uh, New York, uh, New York has a very interesting uh, proposal. Now, it hasn't succeeded, it hasn't gone through, but I see it as sort of maybe writing in the sand of where states might be going. Um, so the legislative concerns of New York were growing accumulation of power in the hands of dominant uh, corporations, unilateral conduct which seeks to create a monopoly or monopsony, and contracts or agreements to do the same. So pretty much the same standards of the Sherman Act, quite frankly. 
Uh, but in addition, they saw a need to alleviate procedural and proof hurdles of modern antitrust uh, jurisprudence, expand, and the need to expand definitions for monopolies and monopolization. So the proposal itself, the bill itself, uh, to address these concerns would create a, quote, abuse of dominus regime. Uh, in other words, a EU model for uh, looking at monopolies. Further, the bill says that direct evidence of abuse of dominance um, is unilateral power to set prices, terms, conditions, or standards, the unilateral power to dictate non-price contractual terms without compensation, or other evidence that a person is constrained by meaningful competitive pressures. So if there's sufficient direct evidence of defendant's dominant position in one of the listed categories, no court can require a definition of relevant market in order to evaluate uh, the evidence, find liability, or find the claim has been stated. So as a contracts professor, as well as an uh, interest professor, uh, showing the abuse of dominance to mean that you can uh, exert unilateral power to dictate non-price contractual terms without compensation makes me cringe, right? Because uh, uh, a compensation is part of the full totality of the terms, right? So, so when you think of consideration, remember contracts one, I know it's a flashback, it's too soon, Bullock, it's the bar's not yet. Uh, but, but in that flashback, what, what do we mean that, that you're demanding something without compensation? Um, do we mean that each provision, like a non-compete, would have to have some exact amount next to it? Um, so it seems like it could open up a very big can of worms. Uh, strikingly, New York law also would not, um, evidence of pro-competitive effects would not be a defense to abuse of dominance. So California, for its part, is just engaging in a beginning process of investigating whether it should revise its antitrust laws, but it speaks with interest to know more about the proposals set forward in New York. Uh, it also uh, looks at some of the uh, asks to have um, some consideration and advice on other laws at the federal level. Uh, it also looks at whether the, in the context of technology companies uh, in particular, whether antitrust injury should be um, redefined to include the personal freedom of individuals to start own businesses. When you break that down, that reflects a concern for inputs, essential facilities, et cetera, being deplatformed. Uh, so other concerns that have been voiced at, at the federal level as well, but particularly uh, focusing on technology platforms. And then also looking, and this is where I think we might see a great deal of mo movement, um, any other approvals for mergers and acquisitions and any limits uh, to antitrust exemptions. So I think there might be a move to mergers and acquisition uh, reviews by states uh, and under state law. Other states have gone sort of more pinpointed. They're looking at particular concerns. Uh, so for example, Arizona, North Dakota, uh, they have uh, tried to, or had proposals on the DAG that would do away with uh, exactly what Apple is doing um, for the uh, restraining in-app purchases just to their platform, uh, that it just by statute would uh, make that illegal. Uh, Texas and Florida, as you may have heard, they also have some uh, social media concerns uh, that they um, have put into statutes and currently in front of the Supreme Court for some, uh, you know, First Amendment concerns, et cetera. So that pinpointed uh, uh, way of dealing with especially these not, uh, shall I say, non-economic antitrust concerns or, or non uh, um, uh, economic concerns uh, is arguably a better way for the states to deal with um, um, some of these more uh, pinpoint concerns because the concern is that you will have the uh, the tail wagging the proverbial dog. Uh, now, uh, Christopher alluded to California and uh, California's 
uh, move in privacy. Now, if they did that separately, not under their competition laws and not under their, um, even their existing, uh, uh, some of their uh, existing um, frameworks. It was an interesting, it was an interesting way that it came into being, but now it's here and it was refined and we have the full act now uh, just um, enacted January 2023, uh, but start the process started in 2018. We were one of the first movers. Now we, we have privacy in our constitution. We've had it for 50 years, uh, but this, we were one of the first movers in sort of this uh, area. We have quickly seen that snowball. Uh, it, we're up to about 22 states who are, are fairly uh, close to copying California. Uh, so you already see this movement. Now arguably that's because, again, that there's this sense of concern among the states that is not being reacted to at the federal level, even though it arguably might be better done at the federal level. Uh, so I do think that there is movements that we should be paying attention to because if there are these um, uh, citizenship sort of needs, uh, you might see that same sort of uh, bubble up, if you will, and uh, cascading across uh, the entire country. Now, I'm a fan of competition, so I think competition in the states is interesting. I think that the Sherman Act was uh, uh, extremely creative, and Clayton Act especially, uh, it's extremely creative bringing in uh, many enforcers to make sure that we have might have a brief antitrust law, but gosh darn it all, we're going to try and enforce it. Uh, so um, I'm a big fan of that. But it is interesting because uh, uh, certain things do better on the national scale than they do at the state level. So having these different substance changes is definitely something to watch. So uh, thank you and look forward to questions. Well, thank you so much, Professor Bullock. You've certainly given us a lot to think about. Uh, if there were a dictionary of antitrust law, then there might be an entry for state antitrust law. And according or next to that entry would be a big picture of Harry first. <laughs> so, when you think of state antitrust law, you think of Professor First. He has been writing about this area for decades, go back to the Microsoft case 25 years ago. And so without further ado, Professor First. I like the big picture idea. I like to do the big picture. Um, that's a good picture right there. Uh, let me see. There we go. Ta da! Okay. Um, so, thank you for that nice introduction. <coughs> um, Christopher, thank you for the wonderful. Um, conference for the invitation to the conference. Um, thanks to the editors of the journal for all the work you've done and you apparently have yet to do uh, <laughs> in making this into a journal. So uh, thanks. And um, uh, speaking of pictures, um, I do want to thank Christopher for putting this conference in the room ah. that has the painting of my antitrust professor, <laughs> Louis B. Schwartz. Um, and uh, when, I, when I came into school, I thought, I've got to find this picture. Where could it be? <laughs> and there it is. Um, and, uh, um, well, it's one thing that I'm watching what I'm doing. But uh, the other thing is, Louis was a great populist. And um, he wrote that justice was an important value in antitrust. And, uh, I think we all should try to keep that in mind. This picture is a little bigger than the one in your entry point. Okay, so um, let's see how this works. There we go. Okay, so uh, Professor Bullock's paper, well, um, raised many points. Um, I've done what she already did, uh, which is uh, sort of summarize some of the major points that she covered, and there's a, a lot of information 
in the paper. If you haven't read it, I urge you to do it. Um, plaintiff standing and the recognition of indirect purchaser standing under state law. Um, this was an important development for antitrust, allowing um, plaintiffs to skirt the limits of federal law and for indirect purchasers, otherwise known as us, consumers, to obtain relief under the antitrust laws for damages. Um, treatment of state parents cases filed in federal court under the State Antitrust uh, Venue Act of 2022, um, recent statute. I'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, potential for nationwide enforcement of state law related to competition is seen, as you mentioned, in Epic against Apple. I'll talk about that as well in a second. And proposals to enact state competition laws that diverge from federal antitrust law. So I have, what, what I decided to do for my comments um, was to sort of pull out three areas um, uh, from the paper and raise questions, since who has answers? I, I teach antitrust law, I do not have answers. Um, so the first question, um, which may strike you as a little odd, but is not actually, who are the states? So how do we think about them in antitrust? Um, and I, um, I want to call your attention to um, actually a very important case, uh, which, which um, tries to decide this issue. It's New York against Facebook. Um, <clears throat> we all know that the Federal Trade Commission has filed, and it's in litigation, um, uh, a, basically a Section 2 case against Facebook involving um, in part, their acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp, but a broader case. The states filed at the same time, a group of states led by New York, um, a case um, filed under Section 7 of the Clayton Act, her public camp raised earlier in the day, um, wondering why the FTC didn't file under Section 7. I can't, I have my ideas, but interestingly enough, the states filed their case under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. So, now, bear in mind, Section 7 of the Clayton Act is, of course, a federal antitrust statute. It's a group of states um, arguing that um, in their representative capacity, it really, as sovereign antitrust enforcers, um, they could proceed with a case against Facebook and presumably at some time ask in relief that Instagram and WhatsApp be uh, divested from Facebook. Structural relief, um, as Professor Hovenkamp sort of indicated as well. Um, so uh, the quote at the beginning is from the panel's opinion, um, and it's a nice pithy quote. The state's lawsuit is not only <laughs> odd but old. Uh, well, you you know you figure uh, you really don't have to read anything more in that opinion to know it's not going well for the states. Um, so. I'll, I'll put the odd, the odd is, um, the court then goes on to say, why are you suing Facebook, which is a great company that everyone likes? <laughs> the judge who wrote the opinion was one of the judges in the Microsoft opinion, the en banc opinion of 2001, that unanimously decided that Microsoft had monopolized um, the operating <clears throat> system market. Um, and. Um, now, seems to say, mm, I don't know, why are you going after this company? This is a question that was raised earlier. These are great companies, these tech companies. Um, what are you doing? Go after, go after something else. Not exactly the question under discussion. So the question for decision was, latches. Uh, you remember latches? Yes, people are shaking their heads. It's not the thing on your doors. Um, it's, you know, you've waited too long, you're going and asking for an injunction, you've waited too long as a suitor, um, you should be out of court. Now, the federal trade, the federal government as sovereign does not, you can't um, assert latches against the federal government. There may be some sort of estoppel sometime, but you can't assert latches. So the FTC avoided this in their case. So who are the states? Are the states sovereigns? No latches. Are the states private parties, just like us, latches? And the Supreme Court said, well, when they said it's 
old. Um, it's old because the two acquisitions were in 2011 and 2013, I think, 2014, uh, way long ago. And they said, you know, let's read the statute. We can read the statute. Section 16 of the Clayton Act, the states are persons. Section 16 of the Clayton Act allows you to bring an injunction, for sue for injunction, for any person, firm, corporation, or association. So what do you states? Not an association, I cover other you you can only be a person. And guess what? Um, if you're a person, you can sue, but then you're subject to latches. The state said, look, we're really not, we're not ordinary people. We're different. We're, we're state sovereigns. We have been suing as sovereigns for many years. 1945, Georgia against Pennsylvania Railroad. Supreme Court said, you can come in, Georgia, and bring suit actually originally in the Supreme Court, for a cartel of railroads that's disadvantaging the economy of Georgia. Supreme Court case. D.C. Circuit panel says, hey, let's forget about that case. We don't like that one. We're just going to read Section 16. You're an ordinary person. No different. Oh, you remember that venue statute that treats you? Congress just passed in 2002. Treats you just like the FTC and the Justice Department. They don't mention it. They should have mentioned it because it was in a great amicus brief that was filed in this case. I will not say by whom, but um, okay. So, um, interestingly enough, um, in the old Microsoft litigation, Microsoft raised similar issues almost at the end of the case when the state's request for remedy diverged from what the federal government was asking. Microsoft all of a sudden woke up and said, Wait a minute, how can they come in and ask for more relief than the federal government can ask for? Who the hell are they? They're just people. And the district court judge said, no, 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 we're, we're, we're really not going to decide this now. It's sort of too late. You really didn't raise it. We treated, they, we've treated them like sovereign enforcers all along. And she went past the question. The Justice Department <laughs> um, said, um, well, actually, they filed a separate paper and said, you know what, the states don't stand on equal footing with the United States. Guess what? Um, not a surprising position from the Department of Justice, um, I hate to say. But um, so this has been sort of a lingering question. Um, how do we think of the states? Are they really sovereign forces, a role that they've really been playing on a national stage since the mid-1980s? Uh, on a consistent basis, but doesn't quite fit fully comfortably within the statutory language. So we see how it played out in this case. It's a 2023 DC Circuit case, so that's one take on this question. Um, so, oops, touch to return to the controls. Yes, okay. So, second set of questions. Um, what roles are the states performing now? What, what do they do? So I've identified um, several different roles that the states are now playing. One is independent national uh, enforcers. So the states in this round of tech litigation are filing their own set um, of national cases against the tech platforms. And this is all being done under federal law, under federal antitrust law. <coughs> Um, generally under Section 2 law, um, as they originally did in the Microsoft case. So you have the Google Colorado search case, um, and um, which involves 38 states and territories. And it's a little different from the Justice Department's case in a couple of important ways. Um, one is the states attacked how Google was dealing with the specialized vertical providers, Yelp and so forth. Um, the district court judge dismissed that on summary judgment. Uh, so that's out of the case, but that was different. And also um, the way Google was using one of its advertising tools, one of its advertising marketplaces, allegedly to disadvantage um, one of its poor rivals, Microsoft. Um, so um, the 
district court judge allowed that to go to trial, and that's been part of the trial, and we'll see yet how that works out. But um, the cases have been sort of tried together, the Colorado case and the um, Justice Department search case, um, and um, you know, are now up for the judge to make a decision. Um, so that's one important case. Uh, second, interesting case, the District of Columbia itself, um, the Corporation Council, filed suit against Amazon over its most favored nation uh, clause. Um, and this was filed in 2022, I believe. Um, and um, the uh, DC, 2021, sorry. And DC lost a trial. Very strange opinion, I have to say. Um, and it's now on appeal before the DC, not the DC Circuit. This is done under state law. DC, you know, DC is a state, but it's not really a state. But it's a state for our purposes. So uh, done under DC law, and it's now before the DC Court of Appeals. It was just argued quite recently. Um, and judging from what you read about the oral argument, may very well be reversed and remanded for trial. So this is the District of Columbia itself attacking, um, you know, a, a clause that Amazon uses nationally. Uh, so that's the second. Third, um, uh, well, which I mentioned, state Facebook case brought under Section 7. So independent um, national enforcer role. Second, co-plaintiff with federal enforcers. So in many of these cases, the federal government will file a complaint in which a number of states join. So they litigate the case together. Um, the DC, um, in the DOJ's Google search, it's hard to keep track of all There's so many tech cases. What would Louis Schwartz have thought? I don't know. Um, so, uh, the Google search case, and there's a case involving ad tech that's now being litigated in uh, Virginia, um, Eastern District of Virginia, uh, and um, the states are co-plaintiffs in those cases. Um, FTC against Amazon, as I'm sure you know, the FTC recently filed suit against Amazon. 17 states um, are on that complaint filed in 20, September of 2023, um, and um, the as sort of comparison to as a reminder, the Microsoft case itself, Microsoft, the Justice Department filed suit, the states filed suit, they tried the case together, and then they split apart on relief, on remedy. If you want more information about that, there's a great book out, uh, which I urge you to read if you can still find it. Uh, but if you can't, just ask me a lot of copies. Okay. Um, Multi-state parents' cases for damages. This is another area that they've spent a lot of time on. And then there are some individual state cases. Um, the one I mentioned, New York against activists, is brought under federal law. It involved a, um, something called product hopping, where a pharmaceutical firm pulls a, a particular uh, drug right before the patent expires puts in another drug um, before uh, these can, uh, you know, a generic can come to substitute, and New York State successfully attacked that under the antitrust laws, just all by itself. Um, so, I keep pressing the wrong button here. Um, there, okay. Um, so, Mike's telling me to read through this very quickly, which I can. Okay, what is the scope of state power? Um, we've already mentioned Epic against Apple, uh, and this was a case, this is a private case, not brought by the states, but the question that this raises is what's the scope of state power? Can you have, can a state um, issue an injunction that's um, US-wide? Interestingly, the injunction itself um, says nothing about its geographic scope. Um, for all you could read the injunction, it could be worldwide. Um, but the parties treated it as if it applied to U.S., what, what Amazon calls, um, Apple calls its U.S. storefront. 
Um, and interestingly, again, when Apple uh, moved, uh, filed his petition for certiorari, which it did, or which, which was unsuccessful, it did not assert that this was um, uh, unconstitutional under the Dormant Commerce Clause because it affects commerce outside of the state of California. So I think that's something yet to be seen. The second that I mentioned, Washington against Kroger, is a state, is a case that was just filed by uh, the Attorney General of Washington <coughs> to stop the Kroger Albertsons merger. Filed under state antitrust law, very interesting. I don't actually know of another state antitrust merger case that I could think of. Um, and uh, the injunction that uh, is requested in the complaint is to enjoin the proposed transaction, but it's not clear whether it could enjoin the merger throughout the country, like here, um, under state law. Could Washington do this? Um, so his press release said that's what he was asking for, but his papers did not quite say that. So that's something to watch in terms of state law. Um, a quick mention of the New York Abuse of Dominance um, uh, proposal, rest easy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's never going to pass now. Um, that was a proposal that looked like it might pass uh, when Andrew Cuomo was governor. We won't go into why he's not governor, but uh, Governor Hochul has different politics. So I don't expect it to pass, but it did. people did raise the question, corporate groups raised the question of the Dormant Commerce Clause because it would clearly have affected what businesses around the country did um, and a different standard, obviously, abuse of dominance is a different standard than Section 2 and how that would affect commerce throughout the United States. So that's a lingering question and my question is should major states try to control big tech or big supermarket? And Let's see if we can get to this. So, uh, conclusion, you have to have a concluding slide. Um, I don't like, I, Neobrandis is okay, but I like Oldo Brandeis. Um, <laughs> it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. In case you don't know the origin of this idea, it is New State Ice Company against Liebman, a famous dissenting opinion by Justice Brandeis. So, questions, are the states more democratic antitrust enforcers? The AGs are actually elected. The last time I looked, either the head of the Federal Trade Commission or the head of the Antitrust Commission, Antitrust Division, have been elected. Um, states not legislatively paralyzed, maybe. Congress seems to be, but the states seem to be still busy. Uh, but People have argued maybe the states are more easily captured and more cheaply. After all, their legislatures are not that, you know, they're often not in session the whole time. They don't have the expertise of Congress. Um, maybe state legislation, let's say for app stores and so forth, uh, may be more easily defeated because um, state legislators are cheaper. I don't mean, it didn't sound right, did it? State <laughs> legislators. <laughs> are easier to convince. How <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the Well, thank you so much, Professor First. We only have 11 minutes left. And as fascinating as this issue is, it's not worth staying past 534. And so I have two quick thoughts and no need to respond right now, but just to put them on the table. One is the level of divergence that we're seeing now. So focus on the abuse of dominance standard in New York. There's always been a difference between state and federal enforcement and rules and all that stuff, but nothing as extreme as this. I mean, this is a completely different way of doing antitrust. And so what do we think about that? The fact that this is not just some little standing rule, this is a whole different way of doing antitrust. And then second, just a big picture point, how do we feel about state enforcement? My guess is we feel about it, how we feel is derivative of our views on antitrust. If we believe in a robust antitrust system, maybe we're willing to put up with some of this messiness. 
if we believe that the system generally has it right, then we're not. And even those who make arguments sometimes have a certain position where they sit. So for example, go back 25 years, Judge Posner really had it in for the states. And he said the states don't have resources, they don't have good attorneys, and states just go away. So that's pretty harsh. But then you think, well, he's mediating the Microsoft dispute. And when you have all the states involved, then maybe it makes his job a little harder. And so that's just something worth keeping in mind. How we feel about all this is related to how we feel about antitrust. And so I see Bill and then Gus. So, uh, thanks again for uh, two wonderful talks. Uh, uh, really, really interesting. I, I, two questions. Do, do either of you have a, an interpretation of why the Washington State AG would bring the challenge in Washington under Washington law. Uh, just your thoughts about the strategic purpose of doing that in the shadow of the FTC investigation, which would certainly seem to be pretty intensive. All the news accounts say this one, this one could certainly end up in a PI action. So what are your thoughts about why, what the strategy is? Would other states do the same, do you see? That is, are, are we likely to see in the future in merger litigation, not taking the path of joining the federal case, which happens in many instances, but will we see a series of state cases brought under state law? So, so your, your thoughts about that. And the other is, you know, Harry, on, on this slide, I mean, the last, the last few words of the, of the famous quote, um, without risk to the rest of the country, does this anticipate some limitation that takes a look at uh, interstate spillovers of the activity. I mean, I think of, uh, if Dan were still here, your, your colleague, uh, his famous paper on state action with Inman about when state action scrutiny uh, is appropriate and the observation that, uh, indeed, if you, you do what you want in your own borders, uh, but where you had spillovers, Dan's suggestion, then maybe you bear down more on state action immunity in a world where purely intrastate effects with a digital world are more and more unusual, that markets are integrated. Is, is there the germ in this observation of limitations in the jurisprudence or otherwise to say that uh, it's, not just, uh, it's not just your state experiment. This is a multi-state experiment, and the people in these other states aren't voting. Well. Um let, let me, I'll answer it this way. When I put the slide together, I decided not to use ellipsis at that point in the quote because I knew someone would say, you know, you did leave out that last part. Um, so I'm not quite certain whether this is just Brandeis is a careful lawyer, Brandeis as having thought of the spillovers, or what it seems to me most likely is, so he's dealing with state regulation of ice markets. <coughs> Price regulation, uh, ice, wasn't it? It was price and entry. And entry. Uh, and entry regulation of ice, manufacture and distribution of ice. So the markets were pretty local, but there was regulation of ice in a lot of the states in the South at the time uh, of, of ice markets. And, um, you know, my guess is that he, he didn't think he was making a limiting case, but he thought he had a limiting case front of him. That's just sort of a, an instinct about it. My second part is that, you know, we can't quite, you know, we, we can't be indifferent to the spillover effects, certainly from a constitutional point of view. Dormant Commerce Clause cases are, I think, becoming really quite important today. So on a constitutional level, we can't. But I think Brandeis was just seeing, a, was seeing localized regulation at the time. Um, the second part on the um, state of Washington. On the state of Washington. I don't really. I'm. I'm not really quite sure. Other state AGs apparently. I think um, maybe Arizona uh, were threatening to do the same thing. I don't see this as a general movement in part because most states don't have specialized anti-merger statutes. So New York does not, for example. So you have to fit into a weird thing, and then. 
you've got to go it alone because you can't do, you know, most of these merger cases you litigate with other states, you've got more resources. Um, so, um, you know, now whether there's a good court that he's, you know, he can file in, I don't know, or whether it was just another prod to the FTC, which the states were trying to do, to get them to finally bring the hammer down on this merger, which I don't really know why they haven't exactly, but, um, I, I, so I can't, it's, it's really all speculative. Yeah. I think about this a lot with, um, again, the California Privacy Act. Isn't it interesting to, when you, to, first of all, you know, you talk about Dermot Commerce Clause, and I, <laughs> I basically panic. Um, <laughs> it's just such a, such a open hole. Uh, but uh, it's interesting how we could just recharacterize something uh, in something that is clearly, you know, state right, like privacy, which is, or health and uh, welfare of, of your um, population. And uh, maybe that is not going to bring uh, Dormant Commerce Clause attention. Uh, no one that I know has challenged California Privacy Act, which is the most extensive of all the state's acts uh, with dormant commerce clause, maybe you know Christopher, but it includes the right to deletion. Uh, so, and that costs about uh, $600,000 per million customers per year, things like this, and it's on the rise. Um, we're gonna have more and more people asking that. I mean, that's a, that's a huge spillover effect. That has real economic considerations. So isn't it interesting that the state can reposition certain, you know, at least pinpointed legislation, if you will. Um, I counter that too, and I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but I, I, it's sort of the opposite, is now the FTC is trying to do a rule, uh, I would argue tenuous, on tenuous uh, um, grounds, to get rid of all non-competes in, in the country. Well, California, we haven't done non-competes forever. So we don't enforce non-competes, but we have a robust other area of law which protects trade secrets, et cetera, in our non-disclosure agreement. So we've already made that adjustment to liberalize our labor markets. Some even, there's some literature that shows that Silicon Valley was in San Francisco, not just because UC Berkeley was there, that's a good reason, uh, but it's also because our labor markets are so fluid. So tech people could get tech people into in the door, um, uh, antitrust helps enforce that through not letting, um, <laughs> not enforcing anti-poaching um, uh, uh, conditions. But it is interesting. You can have spill over both ways. Where the state is, like state of California, is now sort of a model for non-competes. But state of California is putting great price on on other other people who don't have the privacy protections Californians do. So, do, do you see a compromise that allows? A national omnibus privacy statute to be adopted, or is the preemption debate going to be a, a showstopper in uh, the in the foreseeable future? Well, given that it's California um, and uh, both population and economic size and importance in the tech industry, if you don't get California, I don't think you get uh, any any. Um, preemption rights into a, in, into a federal statute. I just don't see it happening. The good news about the California, <laughs> the California privacy ban is that uh, one of the reasons we might not see a dormant commerce clause claim is because the companies were already doing GDPR. So it, it, the Europeans have already sort of set the way, you know, so maybe that's. So we have a very, very short time left. One final quick question from Gus. And uh, feel free to not respond to this, to take it as a comment for the paper. There are two things uh, uh, that I think could be more in the paper. Um, the first, uh, the recent state attention to antitrust. Uh, there's long been state attention to antitrust, but the recent attention to it, emphasis, recent attention to it, is a recent phenomenon. And when I talk to state attorneys general, they're not uh, uh, reluctant to talk about why they have stepped in so aggressively in some cases. I think the paper could have some more emphasis and attention to why has this exploded in recent years in the way that it has. 
And the other thing with great apologies for uh, the paper and editors who might need to work on it, and uh, Babette for suggesting this is a element that uh, is missing from the paper. Um, the paper could use some comparative institutional analysis to other statutory regimes or areas of law, um, how they play out in the state setting. Um, this, uh, I, I think, is antitrust is not unique. It is in many ways unique, but it's not the only area of law where we have federal and state issues and uh, some comparative uh, law would, I think, be really important to really identifying how antitrust is or should be operated here. Well, please join me in thanking the panel. This is fantastic. Well, thank you both, and thank you, Michael. Um, the, my last uh, administrative obligation is to say the last word. Harry, you get you out your pen. Uh, yeah. is, is Friday appropriately for the other? <laughs> so um, uh, we are now have uh, uh, some closing remarks, which will keep mercifully brief. So first, thank all to all the speakers for doing a fantastic and commentators for making this a fantastic event. Um, whenever you organize conferences, you have great hopes. You invite great people, and you, you, but it's a bit of alchemy. And what I can tell you is that you, uh, your hope is to make gold, and we have, we've done that today. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I would be remiss in, in, uh, if I didn't thank uh, Carlin Miller, our event coordinator, who makes all this possible in terms of the race. And I should also thank um, Eileen Kenny, who's our communications person, and Caroline Olson, who aren't in the room. So uh, please, if you see them, uh, thank them for us, because they're also instrumental in making all this happen. And I, I should also thank all the, the staff of the journal, who have been fantastic, but in particular, Jasmine and Adam, Jasmine Sue and Adam Dillial, who've done Yeoman's work and Queen uh, serving as conference coordinators for all these functions. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, just a couple of very short announcements. Right after this, uh, we'd love to take a group picture for everyone's here, um, as well as a second group picture with just the JLI members as well. So if you could just stick around for a little bit, that'd be great. Um, we'd just like to thank you all for coming, contributing, um, sticking with us from 9 to 530. I know it's not easy. Um, it's very hard. It. <laughs> and we hope you all look forward to going finalized and fingers crossed um, to our authors as much as possible. We'd love to finish this volume by the end of the year. So end of the school year. Yeah, school year, not not the actual year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no. Yep. No. Thank you. I just want to echo the thank you to all uh, speakers, participants, uh, students. Uh, to make this event uh, a success. So thank you very much. Uh, and I, I think uh, it was uh, an insightful and thought-provoking discussion. And you made it. So thank you. <laughs>